the guy is yeah, yeah. So, so, so you're mostly administrative. Yeah. 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 In Detroit or in Boston? Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't board me, right? So I had to, I had to check me. So I to go to see right. this guy. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming to this celebration of Godfort's starred career. Um, it's a real pleasure to everybody here. Just a few housekeeping uh, things to start off with. So. Um, if you speak loudly, you won't need to wear this because we've got microphones that will pick up. But if you're if you're a low talker, then please wear the microphone. All right. Is that fair? What would you say? Yeah. As long as you speak. As long as you talk like this, you're going to be fine. If you don't mind, just Okay. Thank Rob. Here is our IT guy for today, so thank you, Rob. Back there has made all of this possible. So, um, so uh, we're going to have obviously we've got uh, four sessions. Uh, we're going to have pretty strict timings, I guess. So I'm going to be trying to keep people uh, very strictly to the time so we get through. And of course, we've got Zoom speakers coming in. Um, Young Boom is our next speaker of the country. So. Um, I think one of the things we're all going to enjoy today is hearing stories about Rod, <coughs> and I'm looking forward to hearing all of your anecdotes about that. Pretty much everyone you meet has an anecdote about Rod, one way or the other, so um, uh, that's going to be a big part of today's celebration. I, I first met Rod back in, I think it was 1997, at a conference organized by uh, FIFA in Zurich to talk about um, the Bosman ruling and the impact that this would have on the organization of sports. And they'd invited uh, a lot of Americans to come over and um, talk about the contrast with American sports. So there was Rod, there was um, Andy Zimbalist, the, the late Gerald Scully, Roger Knoll, and, and a few others. And um, that was my first encounter with Rod talking about and explaining um, how he saw the whole um, sports uh, economics world. And in that talk, really, uh, that, that meeting, I think, was the produced one of uh, Rod's um, most well-known papers, this paper, European and North American Sports Differences, um, question mark. And I wanted to take that as my theme to you today to talk about um, uh, think about a little bit about this, um, uh, you know, a quarter, a quarter century, nearly a quarter century on, or nearly a quarter century on from both that original meeting. Um, so in that paper, what Paul, uh, what Rod said was there are basically um, three ways in you might think that um, uh, there would be differences between North American sports and European sports could be the fans, could be the sports organizations, or it could be the team objectives. And what I want, and what Rod said was that in the paper, it basically says, should I start again? No. <laughs> you'll be, over, you'll again. be over time if you start again. <laughs> yeah, well, but um, organizers exemption, right? You're gonna be that. <laughs> So what Rod argued was in the paper that these, these differences were more apparent than real. And what I want to focus on is the team objectives um, line of argument. And it's something that Rod and I, and one of the real joys of, of having Rod as a colleague is getting to talk to him over lunch on a fairly regular basis about this. And we were having a lunchtime discussion only relatively recently that, that made me want to think about this and revisit this idea. So it's certainly the case that Europeans have tended to argue that, that um, the ownership objective, the objectives of owners in uh, professional sports teams is very different in Europe than it is in North America. So this argument, and this argument usually comes down, boils down to saying that Americans are profit maximized, American owners are profit maximized, European owners are win maximizers. And again, Rod said, that's not very plausible. Uh, in his paper, 
But when, whatever you say about the what the objectives are, it's certainly not really. It's hard to deny that there is there are fundamental differences under in ownership structures, and particularly um, particularly the the prevalence of association private uh, uh, club organizational structures in Europe. But what's also true is that since Rod wrote that paper, the organizational structures in Europe have changed quite dramatically. And I want to give you some evidence on some of these changes. But first, as a benchmark, let's look at the NFL. And this is, this is a list of owners of, of NFL franchises. And on the left, you can see all the owners who were there up to 2000, who are still there today. And on the right, you can see who the new owners are. So there's been some turnover here. There's some new owners uh, in the NFL, but roughly what about uh, three quarters of the owners today were there when Rod published his paper. That's very different in the world of European software. It's not like that at all. So here is, I went through the financial statements of the clubs, and here is a list of the owners back in 2000. And I added a couple of things here. So firstly, what was the ownership? This is this list, the ownership stake of the largest shareholder. And what was that ownership stake back in 2000? And what you can see here is that there are only uh, what is it, five clubs out of the 20 which have uh, a greater than, uh, uh, that have majority control. All the others, there was no single individual or group that controlled the club. And indeed, in many of these clubs, the ownership was really very diverse. Another, another thing to notice about this, so on the last column, I put in an estimate of the net worth of the largest shareholder. And if you average this, there, are, there were already two or three billionaires back then, but mostly the, the, the largest shareholder had, an, had a net worth that was really numbered in the millions, maybe the tens of millions, but in, even then some below 10 million pounds. So uh, you, get this, you get the general dimension here. Um, and the other thing to say is, the other thing you might notice is there are a lot of <laughs> corporate finance and business owners in this list or a number. So things like HSBC Holdings, uh, Swan Management, SC Warburg. These are basically financial institutions, investment institutions that took a stake in the, in the clubs, usually a, a relatively small stake, not a controlling stake, but seeing this as a potentially profitable <coughs> investment. So fast forward to today, and you see a completely different landscape. So firstly, all but about uh, three clubs have a, a single majority owner, either a family or an individual that controls the club. Um, so there's been a huge concentration and a huge shift towards individual control of these teams. And then if you look at the net worth, <laughs> the average net worth is now 35 billion pounds. So from 288 billion to 35 billion. And that, of course, that's a little bit biased by the Saudi Arabian takeover of Newcastle United with a net worth of 580 billion. Um, but nonetheless, you can see that there are almost, there are, I think there are three investors in the three owners in this whose net worth is only in the billions. Um, all the others are billionaires one way or the other. Um, so we've seen this, this very large age. And the other thing about this is no one, there is no crossover here. No one on that list in uh, 2000 is on the list today. So we've seen a very dramatic shift. And this will go for large parts of European soccer. So we've seen this very big change. And one of the things you've also seen, one of the things that's kind of noticeable is that there are almost no corporate investors anymore. None of the SC Warburgs or asset management, Mercury asset management companies, they're all gone. So we've seen this quite dramatic shift. And what, what the debate about ownership in 
comparing North America and Europe has often been about has been what is different about the objectives of the owners in North America and uh, Europe. But the question I think that's more actually interesting is why have we seen this shift in the type of ownership? So why has the ownership uh, structure changed so dramatically? And that's actually the question um, we should be interested in. And <clears throat> part of this story has to do with fundamental changes that were already in place by the time Rod's paper was written. So there was a revolution really in soccer in Europe starting in the 1990s. Maybe you could date it to the end of the 1980s. Um, and this was really the rise in popularity of the game. So it was always a popular game, but it was poorly, um, poorly marketed and, and limited in its uh, uh, broad uh, coverage, particularly in broadcasting. There was limited broadcasting coverage of soccer in Europe in the 1980s. And that's what changed in the 1990s, which brought in a huge influx of revenue, but also provoked a huge influx in uh, uh, increase in investment by clubs as the potential gains from selling your product increased, there was a lot of investment, investment both in stadiums, development, and also in uh, players. We see huge increases in player salaries. Um, and this competition for more investment resources was actually seen as a profit opportunity in much of um, uh, in, the, in the business world. And so we saw a lot of clubs move to the stock exchange in order to uh, uh, take advantage of um, uh, that potential. And that was a disaster. It was a complete catastrophe. Um, and you can see here this chart, which shows the gain in share price appreciation of, of uh, soccer clubs relative to other investments. And I want to suggest to you there's a very simple reason for this. Whether the question is, other people running the clubs win maximizers or profit maximizers, or if that's the question, how do you tell? If the answer is that's you can really only tell when you fail. When somebody takes all the money that the club has and puts it into buying players in order to win titles without taking care of profits, that's when you know that they're a win maximizer. And the investors back then in the 19 uh, in, the 19, in, the, uh, in the 1990s could only realize their mistake once all the money had been lost, which is what reflected the share price performance. So what I want to suggest to you is that in some ways, the shift in ownership we've seen is a solution to an agency problem. If you're a private external investor, you can't really trust the managers to pursue profits on your behalf as opposed to a, pu a, 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 a pursuing sporting success. And that's where the billionaire owners come in. They really solve this agency problem by internalizing. Um, they're risking their own fortunes so that you can be sure that they're working out their trade-off between profits and uh, uh, winning in, in the way that's most efficient for, for their interests. But of course, that then raises sort of a final question. If the ship to billionaire owners was the solution to a problem that existed, if that solved a problem, it means that you also have to think whether there are new problems that this generates. And for sure everyone here is familiar with the European Super League story from last, uh, last year. Um, which, uh, <coughs> where billionaire owners decided that they thought there's a better way to organize European soccer. And they set about creating that, um, which was completely different, it turned out, from what the fans wanted and led to this fan rebellion, uh, which is not over yet. Although it's sort of subsided and everybody says the Super League's over, actually, it's still rumbling on behind there. And it's unlikely to go away in a world of billionaire owners who see who are pursuing their own interests. And that Rod's, uh, well, Rod's quote here from 2000 seems rather, rather prescient to me. Uh, 
um, basically boils down to say, owners will pursue their interests and you can be sure that they'll do it in ways it's, or you, it's pretty likely that they'll do it in ways that are similar to the ways that have been done in North America, which would suggest that the super league concept is not one of the way to do it. All right, so oops, that's my, oh, look at that. Well, I've modeled the behavior that I'm expecting you all to follow. <laughs> <today. laughs> Um, so now we have uh, Young Hoon, who is going to make a presentation to us from uh, Seoul. And so I'm um, particularly grateful to Young Hoon for giving a presentation today. It really, you realize it is 11.15 in the evening in Seoul now. So um, it's, a, it's a late night commitment. Um, what is the best way for us to... Uh, just let him share a screen. Okay, Young Hoon, are you ready there to share your screen? Yes, I am. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, Your 15 minutes starts now. <laughs> <Jesus>. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this paper is co-worked with my former student, uh, Haley Jan. Before I present this, uh, this paper. Uh, I would like to say, you know, thanks, Stefan, for organizing this symposium in honor of Professor Ford. You know, I'm happy to be a part of it. And I also like to introduce uh, uh, my story with Rod. Uh, we met, uh, uh, I think we met in 2001, first time at Western meeting. It was the uh, first time I went there and I presented uh, one paper and the uh, uh, road came up to me after my presentation and showed his interest in my paper. He, and he gave me a business card. Since then, we had uh, a lot of correspondence and wrote uh, many paper. Actually, I counted yesterday how many paper did we made and it was uh, 13 papers and we edited uh, a book about uh, together uh, about the uh, Asian sports business. And I think we are, we have been quite uh, productive and in my side, I think uh, we sort of have a, a a good fit on the working bio rhythm. I don't know how does Rod think of me, but I, I think that. Anyway, uh, through those uh, all the collaboration, and we we had uh, uh, several papers about uh, Korean, uh, you know, baseball sports business, and uh, Rod landed uh, uh, his understanding of sports economics applied to you know, uh, Korean sports and uh, suggested some policy implications, which I didn't thought of. So, and uh, he, I think he's uh, one of uh, a very few Western sports economists who, who show their, his interest in Asian sports. Uh, so he had uh, some work on that and we collaborated each other. So I think uh, all of you know in this room um, about his contribution to uh, various topics in sports economics, but I would like to add, he also had done some contributions to our understanding of uh, our uh, Asian sports business. Okay, uh, let me get into this paper. Uh, and this paper is, uh, his motivation is that uh, uh, it's about MBA. We apply our some uh, recent development of CB and OU estimation technology to MBA. Okay. MBA sets a league schedule to accomplish uh, two goals. One is competitive balance. The other is, is a reduction of cost. And I, 
I like to point out that uh, competitive balance, the first one, and in terminology wise, it's not precisely correct because it should be replaced by outcome uncertainty because schedule does not change competitive balance, but it can change outcome uncertainty. Okay. And so, and this paper focuses, focuses on the first goal, which is outcome uncertainty. We like to measure the impact of MBA schedule on OU quantitatively. And it is possible we can do that by utilizing uh, recent development of CB and OU estimation, okay? And recently there are, you know, some new, you know, uh, measures of competitive balance, and I have been part of that. And Lee, Kim, and Kim wrote a couple of papers, and we introduced bias corrected estimation of competitive balance. What does it do is first to define competitive balance first, and I mean, parameter of competitive balance, and consider a plugged in estimator and derive expected value of that and found that it is biased and just the correct bias and it will give us some biased estimate, estimation, estimator, okay? And it, it was about the competitive balance. And recently, and Fort and Lee and Lee Fort, uh, we follow the same spirit of bias correction and apply it to OU, est OU estimation. And uh, we analyzed the impact of scheduling balance on OU in Scottish Football League and Major League Baseball. Think of that, you know, we have just one individual game. And I showed that the first formula here and PIJ, which is the win probability of team I against team J and its deviation from 0.5 should be the a measure of complete balance as well as outcome uncertainty, right? However, if we extend this, def uh, this definition to whole season, and you know, you have a you know, second formula show that CB, but uh, OU is, is different because, because of uh, unbalanced schedule. Sometimes we have, uh, uh, we said more games with the, I mean, more, more tight games. Sometimes we said more loose games. Then it, you know, it's OU is the same as uh, uh, CB. So uh, in summary, OU is uh, determined mostly by competitive balance, but the uh, Lee Fort found that and there are other factors schedule imbalance and division strengths and number of divisions uh, also determinant of OU. Now, and we can, you know, do the same thing, you know, uh, the consider, you know, plug-in estimator of OU and uh, derive, you know, bias and we can have a bias corrected estimator. Okay, let's look at the schedule in the MBA. And I looked at the uh, last 20 years. As you can see here, uh, Eastern, we have a Eastern Conference and Western Conference and intra-conference game, conference game, number of intra-conference game is about four. I mean, if you think it's two individual team, okay? And a few teams play three, but mostly four. On the other hand, uh, interconference game, um, uh, number of uh, interconference game is only two, so it's unbalanced. Okay. And, and next, let's look at the division strength. You know, think of that uh, if uh, playing strength are homogeneous within division, then unbalanced schedule, which is set more intra state game, uh, intra division game then it is set up more tight game because you know they are homogeneous. So it increases OU. On the other hand, if playing strength are very heterogeneous within division, then unbalanced schedule set many lose game. 
so it decreases oil. So, and in summary, the direction of the effect of schedule imbalance on OU depending on division strength. How can you measure division strength? Uh, well, we can do the same thing as we do in, in, about the league competitive balance. We can calculate the competitive balance of each individual division and average of that. That is, uh, I would call within division you know, competitive balance. So actually Rod and uh, Lee and Rod paper called that division strengths are equal if within the division um, competitive balance, I mean variation is about close or larger than league-wide competitive balance. But if uh, it is if it is smaller than sigma C B, then it is unequal. Okay. So we can measure that. And I actually I measured here. Uh, look at the table two. And it showed that uh, and, and Western you know, conference has been much better than Eastern conference, uh, you know, less than 20 years, uh, 20 years, right? So, you know, and it implies that uh, within Western and within Eastern, there is some homogeneity. Okay, so we estimated the CB double within competitive balance and league wide competitive balance. And you show that, uh, I mean, the, the ratio is below, you know, one. That means, you know, within division, and there is some homogeneity, okay? So that means, and we set a more intra-conference game. So uh, mixed, uh, mixed, mixed them together, uh, uh, we can expect that there is gain of outcome uncertainty because of, unbalanced schedule, okay. So, and let me show just, you know, the result. This is a uh, top line is CB and bottom line is OU. You know, remember that this is, you know, standard deviation of that. So lower means better, right? And OU outcome uncertainty is better than CB, right? But their movement are very similar, right? In temporal pattern. And, because you know, the major determinant of OU is CB, and you know it's quite sure. However, you know you can see that uh, in in case of MBA for last twenty years, OU have been um, always better than CB. This is not the case in MLB. In MLB, and uh, in some some season. Uh, and this uh, OU numbers was greater than CB and sometimes less than CB. So it's, it's a, there is a big difference in MBA and OU. I mean, uh, MBA and MLB. Okay. And, you know, this is all the estimate and you can see the OU over CB. And you can see this is uh, uh, below one, which means at any given certain level of competitive balance. In, for, for example, in 2000 and 2004, uh, actually I would say you save the outcome uncertainty by 6% and 5% in next five years and 7% and 5%. Okay, it's a conclusion. And we look at the uh, MBA had an unbalanced schedule and accidentally conference strength have been unequal. And, and, and these two factors together have allowed more tight games uh, comparing with a um, uh, balanced schedule. And so resulted in an outcome uncertainty enhancement. So, you know, MBA have been successful to accomplish the first aim of the schedule. And what is policy implications? Well, league adopt various regulations that restrict, restrict uh, you know, players labor market. And, and, and their eventual purpose is that, uh, is to enhance OU uh, through the enhancement of competitive balance, right? But they are, 
they have been sort of core issues of dispute in in and with the uh, uh, players labor union for example in the last uh, uh, mlb uh, collective bargaining you know agreement i think the uh, luxury tax is one of the issue uh, with the conflict right on the other hand you know manipulation of schedule imbalance is also has the ability to you know enhance the outcome uncertainty you know without imposing any any restrictions on you know labor market and even though this mechanism is uh, very complex because of uh, you know direction of impact changes upon you know division strengths so in summary and uh, uh, stru divisional structure, design of divisional structure and design of schedule imbalance, uh, I think we have to look at those two factors because uh, in more detail because uh, uh, they, are, uh, they, they are also determinant of OU. I will stop here, uh, it's time is up, thank you. Thank you, Young Hu, for um, maintaining the social norm. <laughs> Extremely well, efficient. Well established. So well established, yes, but you need people to continue social norms. So that's, thank you very much. That's exactly on time. So now, Joel, I'm up. you're up. You're at the slides. Are, if you send your slides, they're on the desk. I did send them, so I hope they're there. So, wow. So it's, I think it's been just about 30 years when I came to WSU. And uh, I went there planning on being environmental or natural resource economics. And uh, I never had really given, I like sports obviously, but never thought that that was something you could put those two things together. And, and as it turned out, Gerardo was a young, I, I mean, maybe one of the younger professors at WSU at the time was working on sports stuff and it kind of uh, struck a note with me and we did a few things. Uh, but I was going to my, my baseball story is this, though, and, and Kyle would remember this, too. Uh, Rod took over as the commissioner of Pullman Little League, I think, after my first, I had completed one year there. And it turned out there were more kids than there were teams. And so they had to make an additional team. And, and I was probably bouncing around the hallway or something. And John said, Paul, and Rod said, you, you know about baseball, right? You know, you've ever coached baseball before? And I said, well, a little bit. I do know. And he said, uh, how would you like to coach a little bit? I thought about it and said, oh, okay. Uh, and uh, it was uh, the team. So we had kind of leftovers. Uh, they, they, they had put all the teams there, and then there were too many kids, so we had leftovers. So I, I had a group that were the younger kids, and I think we almost won a game. <laughs> it, was a, it was a little bit of a jump. It was a good time, and I, but I think a lot of those, and then Kyle can probably tell me because he, he was a classmate of most of those through, through school. I think they ended up being a very successful high school football team in Poland later on. So, 
Uh, I don't know if I had any anything to do with that with trying to teach them how to play baseball. At any rate, um, so I, I'd also like to say that, I mean, besides being uh, my uh, dissertation advisor, professor, uh, I, I, I would just say, I mean, Rod's been a tremendous friend to me over the years. He's been a, just an outstanding, I, I couldn't ask for a better person to be an academic, uh, and, you know, and I think in, in a lot of ways he's, responsible for introducing me to this, you know, Westerns way back in 25 years ago or more uh, when I met at least a few of you. I mean, I think I predate a lot of people at those as well. But, um, at, at, uh, any, at any rate, I mean, we've worked together since and it's been uh, uh, a, an excellent relationship that I hope to, I'm sure will continue and I hope continues. And, and Rod, I wish you all the best in your retirement travels. Um, so move ahead. Uh, I, I guess my talk's a little bit more historical labor relations than, than economics in some ways, but what was go? I mean, so it kind of bookends here. So when I was in graduate school near the end, but I think about the time I was decided to you know, maybe work on baseball as an economic dissertation, we had the uh, uh, strike that canceled the World Series. So it was a pretty significant event and, 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 and kind of, uh, interesting to me uh, at the time, because I think, you know, maybe there's a career in doing some of this stuff, consulting on these sorts of things. And I don't know if that exactly worked out, but it was interesting. Um, a, a couple things, uh, I, I always have to say this to students and sometimes media people and others, that, that this was a strike and it's an, it was an interesting strike because almost everything since then has been a lockout. Um, and that in itself is somewhat important. Uh, so, so lockouts are stopped just at, at owners initiate strikes that players initiate. Um, baseball had had a real uh, tumultuous uh, history up to that time. So they'd had a lot of strikes and lockouts. So Marvin Miller uh, was an aggressive union leader for, for the MLBPA. And so they struck and canceled games a, a couple different seasons, uh, 72 and 81. Uh, the owners had locked out the players, but they never were very aggressive about it. There were never any games lost. There were early spring training type lockouts uh, up until this point. And, and that's kind of interesting because since that, until this, until this uh, winter, there were no further stoppages in Major League Baseball. Um, a couple things that were critical in that 94, 95 strike. The owners really wanted a salary cap to impose a salary cap. The NFL had just imposed theirs uh, that uh, to take effect that same fall. And I think there was envy around that. So they wanted a, uh, uh, to impose a salary cap. Uh, and Selig was a small market owner, was, had, had become the commissioner replacing Dave Vincent. And so they, they were really pr pr pushing for a more uh, balanced revenue sharing. Baseball shared very little gay revenue up, up before that time. And both of those things were, those ideas were brought up during the strike. Definitely, it took a couple more years, the 1997 collective bargaining agreement um, established what ended up being a competitive balance tax instead of a salary cap, which I'll show later has probably had a really similar effect, although most people don't believe that. And this progressive revenue sharing, I guess that's my word for it, but bigger shares go to the, to, to the uh, smaller revenue clubs. And those two issues, I think, led to the issue, the problems that we had finally this spring. So in particular, that uh, players' uh, compensation or share of revenues was, was dwindling over time. But these, these two issues both play into that uh, little argument. Um, a little bit of the hit, I mean, I, I don't want to get too deep into this, so I probably spent too much time when I was, uh, in some ways I was thinking back on this because I'd forgotten a lot of things of this, as important as it was, but um, in the summer of 1994, uh, there was a, uh, in, in, in Congress, uh, the discussion, this comes up a lot, uh, to take antitrust, the ta antitrust exemption away from baseball, and they didn't do it. Uh, Steve Ross probably knows more about these things on service than I do, but they, but they didn't do it at the time. Uh, again, that's up in Congress, uh, Bernie Sanders has been recommending it again, but, um, and uh, the owners, um, the CB was expiring and the owners recommended that they wanted a salary cap and they wanted to get rid of salary arbitration. Um, the players reject that proposal. They didn't want anything to do with the salary cap. Uh, and uh, they announced their intention to strike if they didn't go their way. Um, 
in a lot of ways to me, this was a strike, but it was initiated by the owner. So it's more like a, the situation we had now. So the owners had were unhappy with the system, but they were able to, with the antitrust exemption, or felt they were able to impose their will anyway. So the CBA was expiring. We're going to do what we want. That's going to be no more arbitration in the South. You know? um, so the, the players rejected that, and they decide, so they're in the middle of the season when they could uh, game theory-wise hurt the owners more. So they went on strike in August. And uh, it canceled the all of the playoffs, the World Series. Uh, first, up to that point, uh, followed by the NHL 10 years later, to cancel uh, a postseason. Uh, and it was the longest, longest work stoppage up until the um, NHL strike to cancel the whole year. Um, Going through that off season, uh, there were some things that have, they tried to do third party mediation and, and that failed. Uh, Clinton got involved, uh, was the president at the time and uh, that didn't work out either. Uh, ultimately, the, um, it went to court um, in the Southern District in New York and there was an injunction filed uh, that um, said that the, the basically the, the current CBA would hold through as it was. Uh, and so that put the, I mean, that sucks, sort of pulled the rug out from what the owners were trying to do and impose a new CBA or impose new rules and exception to the CBA. So they settled it and, this, and went back to uh, playing baseball in the, after a little bit of a delay in the spring of, uh, of 1995. Um, it took, so, so then that, that CBA, the original CBA held a couple more years. So even though the, the terms had been thrown out there, uh, the idea of a luxury tax, what we all called it then, uh, and this revenue sharing plan that, that uh, the commissioner really wanted were thrown out there, but it took a couple more years before that was actually implemented. And the first implementation of it is, is somewhat different than we see now. So there was um, all, the top five teams in payroll had to pay a luxury tax. The um, luxury, the uh, progressive revenue sharing was called a split pool, and that's changed somewhat. It's been modified, but basically those two factors have, have still held. Um, a, a couple things. I, I think I already mentioned these before. I just put for consideration. So that same year, the NFL and Players Association had gone through uh, a decertification of the union. So the players had some leverage, but they were the NFL owners were still able to negotiate and get the players to agree in exchange for, for true free agency uh, in the McNeil plays a hard salary cap. Uh, and that was really, I mean, I think baseball owners were very envious of that. That's, that's what they wanted. Uh, and again, with their antitrust exemption, they believed that they could impose that unilaterally without really negotiating. It turned out that, that was not the case their legs out from them. Uh, and the other thing that I think is, is important is this, uh, and, and it's not that this isn't true in every sport, but there is a large small market division that's always been uh, fairly uh, prominent in baseball. I think for a lot of the 70s and 80s, Marvin Miller was able to, uh, in a sense, team up with the large market owners to get uh, collective bargaining agreements that were favorable to the players or more favorable to the players. So the free agency and those sorts of rules worked out. Um, but small market owners were never happy with that. And the, with the switch in the commissioner's office to uh, Bud Selig in, in the 92-93 uh, kind of gave the small market owners more leverage. Uh, and that led to the um, revenue sharing things that we, we have. So, so Selig was certainly a, a good representative for the small ownership group, better than they had before. Um, I mentioned this, but just so, so this, this was the last strike by a major sports league or sport unions, uh, and it came about in, in, in a way it was more owner initiated, but it was, was the last strike and everything that we've seen since, uh, so two times for the NHL, two times for the N NBA in the, in the century, in the two thousands were lockouts. And in both cases, uh, a lot of games. Uh, canceled. I think the NHL really with 1997 uh, took the list. Like we can, I, I, the, the thought is that ownership was um, timid about locking out because of the public relations. So, so if we're, if strike, if the players go on strike, they always look bad to the public. If we lock out, we might look bad, but I think the NHL first in 97 showed that that wouldn't be the case. And then the NBA followed 
sue with a lockout in 98, 99. And um, what's happened with all these owner-initiated lockouts, so these are all cap leagues besides baseball, is that they negotiate a lower player share of revenue each and every time. So uh, in around the turn of the century, players were getting, depending on how you count it, but roughly 60% of revenues went to player salaries and benefits. And that's gone to a little bit less than 50 in every league. Baseball, even without a direct uh, written in share of those revenues has seen the same pattern. It's fallen from 60% to players to 48, 49. As, as well, even though it's not uh, officially or, or statute, you know, or it's not a, a term in the collective bargaining agreement. Um, there's some, uh, I, I remember writing a blog post 10 years ago, probably, that uh, there's some lo uh, loss of union power in broader industry, true, and there had been more lockouts in broader industry. That's sort of, flip, that's, that's not as true now, and I looked it up before, uh, I guess, it, couple of weeks ago to see if that was true. And mostly, I mean, far and away, most work stoppages are strikes and broader industries. So lockouts are unusual. They were somewhat more common uh, in the first part of the 21st century. But again, that's sort of flipped around. Workers have had more since the pandemic, had a little bit more power. So um, so it's it's very unique to sports to have owners locking out on, on a regular basis. And, you know, and because they're able to do this, they've, they've rolled back some of the benefits to go to pet players. Um, again, uh, I mean, I think the things that affected players, shares in baseball, the luxury tax, uh, which has really acted like a de facto salary cap. And no one in the media ever believes that. They always like, you have to have a salary cap. Baseball's got a competitive balance problem. We hear that over and over, but uh, I'll show on the next slide, but one team that it really always affected was the Yankees, Dodgers recently, but, and everybody else paid fairly close attention to it. And then the split pool revenue sharing uh, incentivizes low revenue teams to earn less revenue. So the less your revenue, the bigger your share. And so that's been a, a problem. So you have a lot of teams that probably aren't really participating aggressively in the, in the players' labor market. Um, and again, so that, I mean, they, they started in 1997 and they were amended to some degree in 2002, but, but the basics of them hold. Um, salary negotiation, uh, six years to free agency, uh, two to five to get arbitration. That, that has never really changed since uh, Marvin Miller negotiated that uh, after the McNally Messersmith in, in 76, 75, 76. Uh, I mentioned already uh, competitive balance, de facto salary cap, uh, high revenue clubs are restrained and low revenue clubs, unlike the ca actual cap leagues <laughs> where they have a floor, there's no floor in, in with the competitive balance tax, there's no tax floor that penalizes you. Um, and um, I found by analyzing this, and I think some others have too, that talent tends to flow away from those low revenue teams. Uh, that term tanking um, is, was used, thrown around, uh, this fall in, in the last couple of years, uh, challenging those things. Uh, the, the tax just quit. So the Yankees paid it every year, almost until the last couple of years. The Dodgers have paid it recently. And then these other teams have gone over like once or twice. And there's a, it, it's a penalty. The more times you go over consecutively, the bigger the tax. Um, but this has largely applied. So the Yankees have paid far, far more than anybody else. And they're the one team that's ignored it. Uh, consistently, and I would argue that that shows that it, that it works. It has been a de facto salary cap, uh, with one exception, that was the rule, I think. Um, the union concerns uh, this fall, so I don't have that much on this, this year's labor strike, and in, in the interest of time, I'll speed through this, but uh, the player share of revenue had gone down by um, you know, from 60 to less than 50. I said that already. Uh, it was not too much different than what's gone in the hard cap leagues, the NFL and the NHL. Uh, free agent market has been somewhat suppressed. Low revenue teams aren't participating. Um, you could take a look. I mean, so it, um, Alex Rodriguez's contract with the Yankees when he adjusted for inflation is still higher than any current contract value. So at the top end too, and there's not that much sympathy for those players there, but their, their um, rate of pay has fallen. Uh, 
arbitrator, the players wanted uh, more flexibility on arbitration it's between two, it's two or three years, and they wanted it two years. And uh, games around service time, so so you have to get to six years to be a free agent, and or two years or three years to be a uh, arbitration eligible. And there's a lot of uh, concern that management was sitting down players so they missed their service time and um, getting the signal. Uh, owners uh, wanted more money going to them. I think they're uh, um, and, and so they're more want to be more firm on the competitive balance tax. And just to wrap it up, uh, nothing really changed. I mean, ultimately they went back to play. Nothing really changed that was that was substantive. Uh, they it, as soon as I knew they were going to just argue about where the tax rate was going to be, it was done. And and sure enough, it was just a few days later that that happened. Uh, there's now. I mean, now we have a DH in both legs, which I think probably everybody would agree is the right thing to do. It's more more playoffs, which um, could be good for everyone. And with that, um, I'll wrap it up. Fire bomb. Thank you. Sure. Well, thanks, Joe. <laughs> the rebel who refuses to follow social norms. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Dennis does not I'm just not a proud name. Yeah, right. So, can you find yours or take it? Yeah, yeah. 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 I think uh, through me on my first slide. I'm not really sure. We're, 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 we're going to get some guardians here. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 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 We're the best. We're the best. We're the best. We can get up with them here. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I can't believe it. Yeah, yeah, it's already started. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's your six minutes in already. <laughs> well, I want to thank Stephen for organizing this, and I want to just express that I really feel honored to have been invited to participate. Um, Ron has been so influential in the discipline, and to think that my meager contributions warrant me being here, I, I really appreciate that. And so um, I hope that I can say something useful here um, about the invariance proposition. And this is one of the areas where Rod has done an enormous amount of work um, related to the invariance proposition. I don't really have any great stories to tell about Rod. We've known each other maybe 15 or 20 years, but I've known of Rod for much longer. We have a similar sort of background story, and that is we both started as something else. Uh, we both did uh, published papers on legislative voting and voting models. And then to quote one of my former co-authors, it seems we both went off to work with those smelly jocks as opposed to continue to do public finance and public choice. So uh, my motivation here, everybody knows um, about the invariance proposition in Rottenberg. If you don't know about that and you're here, it's pretty astounding. So what I wanna do is try to reflect a little bit on Rod's contributions and then I wanna offer a new diagrammatic model. And new is in parentheses there because some of you will have seen this diagrammatic model in 2007 when I developed it to discuss a paper of Rods with Jason and one with Stefan at the Western meetings in 2007. Um, hopefully it's a little better than it was then, but it's uh, what I'm gonna show you. So here's Rottenberg's original statement. Uh, the position of organized baseball at a free Free market, given the unequal distribution of revenue, the engrossment of the most competent players by the wealthy teams is open to some question. It seems indeed to be true that a market in which freedom is limited by a reserve rule, such as that which now governs the baseball labor market, distributes players about as the free market would. So I think there's really three key elements to this statement. The first is competitive balance seems to be a league goal. One could debate whether that really is a goal or not, but at least they state that it's a goal. There's two policies towards achieving this goal. One is a free agent or a free market in labor, and the other is the reserve clause. And then, so we have the free mobility and the reserve clause, and then there's no difference in outcome, whichever one you choose to do. 
the early literature, I argue, um, focused on the last of these three. Is there a difference in the outcome? So I'm gonna say a little bit about the early literature. I think that that early literature had a couple of different hallmarks to it. The first was formalizing or generalizing the result. And here's the, the key papers, I think, in doing that, al Hadiri and Quirk, and then um, Rod and Quirk, where they developed this two-team league model and have this wonderful diagram that I think probably everybody in here has used in class, except maybe Stefan. And then John Broman's work. Then the literature focused on alternative club objectives. And so um, Peter Sloan with his stuff on, on uh, European football, particularly the English Premier League, Dan Rasher, and then uh, Rod again with James Quirk, all thinking about um, profit maximization, utility maximization, and win maximization. And Stefan's paper, uh, our discussion earlier was very, very nice with regard to these objectives. Later concerns, I think, were alternative policies. So there's a whole bunch on revenue sharing. But what does revenue sharing do? So we had the reserve clause and we had free markets. Now let's see, what does revenue sharing do? And so you've got a series of papers there. Um, again, Rod with James Quirk, uh, the Stefan Squared, so to speak. Um, and Stefan uh, Kassan by himself. And then salary caps. And what are the influence of salary caps? And then what I'm gonna call modeling nuances. And this may not give um, sufficient deference to either uh, camps in this, but it seems to me that a lot of this debate was inside baseball to, to coin a term. So what kind of assumptions do you make about um, the contest success function? What kind of assumptions do you make about the relationship between team success and playing talent? What kind of assumptions do you make about um, conjectural variations? And do you use uh, Nash uh, a Nash bargaining model or um, Nash equilibrium model or whatever? So <clears throat> a lot of literature that. Then, a lot of work related to what is the optimal competitive balance. So if you think that the leagues are trying to achieve some competitive balance, what is the optimal level of that balance that they're after? And um, Rod again, and then Rod and James Quirk with two papers in 2010 and 2011, Stefan Kassan, and again, John Broman, all focused on what is optimal competitive balance. And if I omitted papers there, um, you can be duly insulted, and I'm sorry. <laughs> so basic results from all of this literature, it seems to me, are that club objectives matter. What is it the clubs are trying to do? What are the policies that we're thinking about? And what are the details of those policies? So for example, is it gate revenue sharing or is it pool revenue sharing or is it split pool revenue sharing? All of these different kinds of details, how do they influence the outcome? So an important one, are revenues that are shared actually spent? And we've already seen from Joel's talk that that's an important question if those revenues are spent or not or if you're actually trying to maximize your revenues, if it's in your best interest to maximize your revenues. So if they're not spent, is it, or if you don't share revenues, do the clubs have enough money to spend up to the cap or not? So these are all things that are important sort of issues. So here's, here's what I'm gonna call my diagrammatic model. And it's different from any model, I think, um, that I've seen diagrams of in the past. I'm gonna assume profit maximizing behavior. So I've already pitched out all of Europe, or maybe not. Depends on what <laughs> Stefan, whether you agree with Stefan or not. The profit function is concave and one winning percentage. That's the only thing that I'm going to assume. Winning percentage must add up to 100. These I'm gonna to use to produce something called that I'm calling the profit opportunity curve. 
there's going to be two upward sloping segments to this profit opportunity curve. And the names, names for these uh, segments come from the papers that Stefan uh, wrote and has not published in 2007. One is called the paradox of power and the other is called the competitive balance defense. So I'm using those names. I don't know if I'll get this in print before Stefan does his paper or not. Um, but those are the names I'm gonna go with. Uh, the paradox of power is absolutely intuitive. The competitive balance defense, not so much, but it is also there. Then there's gonna be a downward sloping segment of this profit opportunity frontier, and that's going to be the efficient frontier. The problem is that just like we can develop the production possibility frontier or the utility possibility frontier, this doesn't give us any way of choosing where we are on that frontier. So we don't know where we are. It's kind of a problem. So I'm going to suggest that there are ways to think about selecting the optimal outcome, and this is these are really coming from, in some sense, the literature on what is the optimal competitive balance. So we could just have joint profit maximization. So what we're going to do is have this frontier and move a line out until it's just tangent. That's going to tell us what the joint profit maximum is. Oops. Um, and I don't know how I have to do that, but optimal is in parentheses because in none of what I talk about here do I include consumer welfare. So this is all really club and team oriented. We could have just a straight utility function or you might call it a social welfare function that depends on the individual club profits. So what I'm really doing here is saying it doesn't have to be a trade-off of one club's profits for the others at the rate of one. It could change depending on what their profits are. A generalization of that, or rather a specific example of that, is to have something like a Nash social welfare function where we've said each club has to have a certain minimum number of profits, and then from there we maximize. So here's the model, and what I want you to think about is the bottom. What? Nice. That's very busy. <laughs> wow. Spiffy, yes. I'm going to do it again. You should animate it. So the bottom, the bottom. Quadrant, quadrant number uh, three down here is just the adding up constraint that says that um, winning shares have to add up 100. We have the profit of club one, depending on its uh, win percentage, the profit of club two, depending on its win percentage. And then what we're going to do is take those combinations of winning percentage, go up to the profit frontier or you know, the profit curve of each of the clubs and find a point. And do that for all of the possible combinations of winning percentage. And if you do that, you get something that looks like that. This is a situation that is the um, paradox of power, because this is a situation where the winning club wins, the, the bigger club wins too much. Down here is a situation where the, the smaller of the clubs wins too much. And then out here is the frontier that would be the efficient um, choices, the choices where uh, neither club is winning too much, but you are trading off winning percentage of one for winning percentage of the other. So how does this all relate to the invariance proposition? And the answer is, what does the invariance proposition say? Well, it says we have two circumstances. One is free agency. The other is the reserve clause. How does go, how do those things, what's the difference in that profit frontier between those two things? The answer is there isn't one. Because all that the difference between those two circumstances do is change where rents go. If our cost function that determines the profit function is based on opportunity cost, all of those rents are already accounted for in that cost function. And so the curve doesn't move at all. Consequently, invariance. Okay, so this is just restating what I've just said. Only a policy, so the implication of this is the only thing that can lead to violation of invariance is something that shifts that profit opportunity set. 
Unfortunately, just because it changes the profit opportunity set doesn't mean we know that it violates the invariance proposition. Why is that? Well, basically, here's a situation where what I've got is um, uh, revenue sharing. So one club's profits goes down, the other club's profits goes up. And so it shifts the curve. But since we don't know where we were to begin with, we don't know if we could stay in the same place. And what much of the literature has basically done is said, here's the circumstances where we know we're going to stay in the same place. Here's the circumstances where we probably aren't going to stay in the same place. This encompasses all of that. Says so we don't know, which isn't a very satisfying answer, right? It depends. <laughs> That's not very helpful in some way, but it tells us that precise sort of answer that it, we don't know. It could, but it doesn't have to, except if we're out on the frontier, if we're out here on the efficient frontier, then we can say something. Because if we're out on the efficient frontier, that means there's some sort of a tangency out there. One of those welfare functions has got a tangency there and then the curve moves, then you can no longer be at the same spot. So here's revenue sharing, just the, the words that go with the picture that I just showed you. Doesn't need to hold. Location on the frontier needs to be determined. Or in, if we're inside the frontier, which certainly is a possibility, but if we're on the frontier, optimal competitive balance changes when that frontier changes, and that would mean that the policy has, has violated the invariance proposition. So conclusion, Rod, along with James Clerk and Jason Winfrey, made significant contributions to our understanding, understanding of the policies with debates um, in print with Stefan and with uh, Others, Paul Madden comes to mind. Um, here's a simple diagrammatic model that shows uh, some relationship to those results. With that, I will stop. Well, so time for coffee, everybody. Uh, they should all be there. <clears throat>
four months in advance. Part of it. I think I've been to those games in Philadelphia. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, he was well. 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 He was yeah, but that, that was your work. Oh, really? Cool. Yeah. 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 That was going to be. Yes, that was. Euros Rogers. Right. Yeah. Whatever they call Yeah. 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 I just have a lot of people played in Yes, hello. I can see you. I can hear you. Did you have a, did you have a presentation you want to share? Or, or what did you say? Did you uh, have a PowerPoint that you wanted to share through the through Zoom? No, I'm not going to use PowerPoint. I, I think PowerPoint on Zoom is a catastrophe. <laughs> Roger, then the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. I wish I could be there it, uh, celebrating the uh, retirement of one of your graduate students is not exactly uh, me, something to make you feel young. But nonetheless, it's been it's been great. I've known Rod for over 40 years and uh, uh, I can I can recall uh, when he entered the graduate program as uh, bringing terrific athletic skills to the program. Uh, as well as being um, an interesting person to know and, and fun to hang out with. Um, graduate school at Caltech in the 1980s was not like graduate school anywhere else. Um, my, uh, the, the, on average, the faculty wanted to punish the graduate students as much as possible. And uh, Rod survived it completely. And uh, indeed, uh, he, he apparently liked it because he ended up spending the rest of his career interacting with the people that he met in graduate school. So that's, that's cool. What I'm going to talk about today is motivated by what I regard as the best chapter of uh, Jason and Rod's book, 15 Myths, uh, which is the one on Title IX. 
And title, the Title IX chapter is one that I assign to my undergraduates all the time. In fact, I have, a, I have some athletes uh, at Stanford who are taking a reading course in the economics of sports from me uh, this quarter, and they will be reading this uh, as well. The, the chapter is cool in that it, in, in the sense it, it ends with a, the parable of the, uh, the kingdom of sports, which is in this context written as universities, uh, where a bunch of essentially white males uh, run sports and the parable is all about the ways in which they are completely clueless and lacking of self-awareness in the way they think about uh, the, uh, what, what the Title IX requirements are. Now, of course, none of this applies to professional women's professional soccer, which is a completely different domain. But that's because um, the, the, the parable uh, uh, in in uh, 15 sports myth pretty much says it all <laughs> about mm -hmm. college sports, about the complete idiocy and uh, circular reasoning of, of the people who ran college sports at the time Title IX was adopted and implemented. Uh, and indeed, uh, until fairly recently, in many in most universities, and indeed we can see it in the dis disparate treatment of the women's and men's final fours in the NCAA tournament, uh, which this year for the first time, at least some semblance of equality of treatment was required of them. But even then, uh, according to my uh, participant students, <laughs> it was by far, by far from being equal this year, although it was much better than it was last year. So what I wanted to do is to talk a bit about what the issue is in women's professional soccer. And in reality, from, from, the, from a purely economist point of view, um, it's very, very interesting how the issue developed, all right? And the women's national soccer team uh, had, in my view, a much more sophisticated understanding of the principal agent problem in organizing a sports team than the people who, A, run the U.S. Soccer Federation, which is the governing body that sponsors the national team, uh, the, or the people who run the men's national team. The men's national team learned a lot from the women about how to organize a professional sports enterprise. Uh, so that's, that's the basic story uh, that I, I want to convey to you and what will be the topic of this paper. So what it, the, the, you may know, so I'll just briefly summarize what the history here is. Um, in very, only two years ago, the uh, U.S. women's national team, uh, led by Alex Morgan and Megan Rubino, um, filed a discrimination suit against U.S. soccer, uh, the governing body. It's, it's actually the United States Soccer Foundation and Federation. Foundation is a nonprofit entity. Feder Federation is the governing body. Uh, they filed a suit against them for for wage discrimination and conditions discrimination uh, between uh, the men's and women's national team. And of course, the interesting feature of this is the men's national team was supportive of the women's national team. And in the, in the sense that uh, the, the men's union, the collective bargaining unit for the men supported the women's claim that they were discriminated against. Uh, so it was, it was all the players on both sides uh, against the soccer fe federation. The, 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 the nature of the charge is, is really interesting because of the complexity of the compensation system that is used for the men's and women's national team. And brief, just briefly to summarize, uh, the way that people get paid to play on the, on, the, on the national teams differs between the men and the women. 
they have one commonality. And the one commonality is that every time the national team plays a game, the amount that the players are paid depends on whether they win or lose. And it depends on the quality of the opposition. And it depends on the importance of the match. All right. So to, for example, you are paid more if you beat a top four team or Canada. It's cute that Canada doesn't have to be in the top four to be a top paying win. Um, so part one is if you beat a top four team, you're paid more. Part two, if it's if the game is part of one of the prestigious international tournaments, like the World Cup, like the Olympics, uh, like the She Believes tournament, like the Four Nations tournament, if you if you win a game in that tournament, you're paid more than if the game is quote a friendly, which is just an exhibition game that's scheduled between two teams. Uh, it's not clear why they're called friendlies. Maybe uh, Stefan can tell us that from the deep, dark bowels of 19th century history of, of soccer, why they're called friendlies, because they don't look friendly to me. But uh, so and then the, the third part is that you are paid an additional bonus if you actually win one of these important tournaments with the magnitude of the bonus being highest uh, if you win the World Cup. So that's the commonality, but we're not done yet, all right? Because the women's team, but not the men's team, uh, has a certain number of players, which are called contract players. And they are paid an annual salary uh, to be on the team. Now, contract is a euphemism because it's not really a contract. It's uh, if you if there the USSF is required to have a certain number of women employed as members of the national team, um, this number is declining through time because USSF doesn't actually want to do this. They they are they do they do it as a result of the collective bargaining process. The collective bargaining process says that there at, currently the number is 16 women have to be under contract as members of the team. But what that means is that there's a guarantee that there'll be 16 such positions and they pay $100,000 a year. Uh, and this is independent of whether you're actually playing in the next women's national team game. That is to say uh, the contract players form the core of the women's national team. But there's a different proviso here, which is the contract can be terminated unilaterally by USSF at any point in time. That is to say, if they decide that game N plus one in the season is going to have a different team than game N in the regular season, um, you know, two exhibitions, say you're going to play an exhibition match against Uzbekistan, <laughs> and then a week later, you're going to play an exhibition match against Ecuador, uh, then you can actually change the team between those two games unilaterally by USSF. So you're not really under contract. What it really is, is a guarantee that there are 16 women earning pay at the annual rate of $100,000, which is prorated on a daily basis, depending on whether you're one of the contract players. The men's team does not have this. On the other hand, the men's team has something else, which is unlike the women, the men get paid uh, a game bonus just for showing up. They don't have to win. All right. So if and it, the, the numbers roughly are as follows. It, for the men, if they just show up to a friendly against a team ranked between five and nine, they get a show up bonus of $5,000. And if they win, they get a bonus of $12,000. But they're not paid a salary. There's no contract players. By comparison, the women are paid nothing for just showing up. And they're, if they actually win against exactly the same rank of team on the women's side, 
their bonus for winning the game, depending on the quality of the team and depending on the circumstances, the tournament and all the rest is somewhere in the range of five to $7,000. So that is the nature of the facts underlying the dispute uh, in the lawsuit, um, which was that the women are discriminated against because the formula, even though they differ between the men and the women, the formula favors the men. Now, what is the evidence? Now, I, I, let me also say, uh, this case no longer exists. It was just settled. The, um, the men won, uh, the, excuse me, the USSF won uh, in the district court. The case was dismissed by the judge on the grounds that um, their women were not discriminated against because they were paid more. And that's true. The U.S. women's national team is the dominant women's national team in the world. It wins almost everything. It has been ranked the number one women's soccer team in all but one year for the last 15 years. Uh, it, it, has, uh, it has finished in the top four in every tournament it's entered in that period, and it's won more than half of them. So it is it, the, the women's national team, uh, when it comes to the important tournament championships, has more wins than all the rest of the world put together. So it is the dominant team. And because the formulas pay you based on whether you win or lose and pay you based on the quality of the opposition, the U.S. women's national team is constantly winning games against top 10 teams, which pay them more per game than when the U.S. men's national team plays uh, an international friendly against uh, a not very good team. So the question then is the legal question, uh, which is not what I'm going to talk about. The legal question is whether a formula like this that rewards the men more for victories, but on the other hand is, is, is moot because the men don't win, uh, whether that, that possibility to earn more uh, constitutes discrimination because the, the undisputed facts in the case were that if the men won as much as the women, they would be paid uh, a lot more than they are. But on the other hand, if the women had the men's formula where they dropped the $100,000 salaries for 16 players and added in the extra bonuses for winning all the time and winning all the championships, then the women would be paid a lot more than they currently are. Okay, now I said I wasn't good. That, that's, that sort of descriptive thing is the thing that's going to be fun about uh, an economist getting into this because the reason the women's formula looks the way it does is part of the collective bargaining process. And what the women came forth with was the object of a compensation system for the, the women's national team or for any national team ought to be to encourage the team to perform well as a team, as opposed to reward people for being individual stars. And the whole reason for the, the uh, differences in the compensation schemes where there's, you know, if we forget the actual numbers, but the greater reliance on a salary and the lesser reliance on, on the individual game performances was to create a system of greater team play, that to generate incentives for the women to engage in teamwork. And if you just think about it, the idea is if you enter a soccer game, with the idea, I want to maximize the number of my expected number of goals or any other performance, maybe, you know, whatever it is you want to use as a performance indicator to be a star, to be the person on the team who is the star. That you may, that the, the strategy for maximizing the probability you are going to score a goal is not the same as the strategy for your team will score the most goals. And the idea was, let's try to figure out a way of managing the team 
to maximize the probability we're actually going to be the dominant team in the world. Uh, now, obviously, you have to have the players to support that, and it's almost certain that the U.S. men's team does not have a player pool that would allow it to be the dominant team in the world like the women are. Uh, the, the U.S. women's national team is, you know, the women on that team are, in fact, the best soccer players in the world. And uh, the, the men in the US do not have that pool. The origin, however, of the US dominance comes from the fact of Title IX, which is uh, American colleges, uh, when faced with Title IX, decided to have a lot, I'll put a lot of emphasis on women's soccer. And the number of women's soccer team players in college uh, during the 70s and 80s, went up by a factor of 10. And the, the, so Title IX created the NCAA soccer tournament and uh, the emphasis in colleges on producing soccer, women's soccer players. And almost all of the players on the U.S. national women's soccer team came up through this college system uh, first of all, in high school and then in college, they were given the opportunity through Title IX to play competitive soccer. The U.S. was the, essentially the only country in the world that had such an extensive women's soccer program for high school and college students, and that's why it's dominant. So that's the, the, the intriguing part, why it all hinges back to 15 myths, is that Title IX by the 1980s had caused the US to have by far the best women's soccer players. That in turn caused soccer in the US, women's soccer in the US to become uh, dominant on a world stage. The women themselves decided that the right way to organize soccer was not to have professional players playing in leagues who occasionally spent a week off and played on the national team, but were primarily national team members and only secondarily playing in other things, uh, playing professionally. And that's the way, that, and that pretty much explains the dominance of the women's soccer team. And their argument then is, well, we should be paid uh, in proportion to our success. And if the men, despite the fact that their primary source of employment is playing in soccer leagues, not playing on the national team, they still are paid more than we are holding quality constant. Um, the, the interesting question, of course, is we can't really unpack the separate effects of all these historical reasons why women's soccer in the U.S. has become dominant. What we can say, however, is that whatever is going on, uh, it really is true that the women's team is a better performing team by far than the men's team. And how much of that is due to this history and how much of it is due to uh, something else is, is impossible to answer from my perspective. But it's nonetheless raises an interesting question. Now, I, the, the last point that I want, I want to make and then we'll kill it um, is that throughout this process, the USSF um, essentially admitted that they discriminated against women. And the reason they, that they, they first attempted to offer as their, they, they did not offer the defense that the women's game is less popular. Because, you know, one of the explanations you can imagine coming up with, well, of course the men are paid more because their games get generate more money. That was true historically. But it hasn't been true for the last 10 years. The, uh, and and the, the reason, of course, is the dominance of the women's team. Uh, their games have higher television audiences. They generate more revenue. The women's soccer team, the women's national team is profitable. It, in last year, the profitability of the women's national soccer team was about plus six million. That it, that's how much revenue it transferred back to the foundation in excess of its costs by comparison the men's team lost 12 million um the uh, total revenue generated by the women is higher than the total revenue generated by the men um we don't know 
how to allocate an important component of revenue, which is television income, because the USSF has insisted that it sell the rights to both national teams as part of a package. And it sells sponsorships for the teams as package. In other words, if you want to be a sponsor, you have to be a sponsor of both teams. Um, part of what came up in the, in the uh, case was that there are several large corporations out there who uh, make products primarily for women who only wanted to be sponsors of the women's team. They did not want to be sponsors of the men's team, but the USSF has refused to let them be sponsors of just one team. Um, the, the, the last point here uh, is that because the women's team makes more money and generates more revenue and has dissatisfied potential customers that would give it still more revenue, and because we can't unpack the television, there is uncertainty about which is the most profitable team, but almost certainly, given the audience rating differential and given the existence of sponsors who are disappointed because they can't sponsor just one team, given that, it's almost certainly the case that USSF is leaving money on the table. They would be more profitable. Their entire soccer, soccer operation for both men and women would be more profitable if they, in fact, separated the two national teams and let each generate its own revenue. Having said that, then how do they defend themselves? They defend themselves exactly the way that's characterized in the, the chapter in 15 this, that men's soccer is a more difficult game, that being a, a top soccer team is harder for the men than being the women. And hence, it makes sense to pay them more if they do well. That constitutes in the law an admission of guilt. Now, why this was dismissed at the lower court level, God only knows. It was pending on appeal in the Court of Appeals when the settlement arose. And indeed, the settlement, arose, the settlement was to increase the formula for the women so that it looks more like the formula for the men. So in, es in essence, they won their case. But one of the reasons they ran, they won their case is because the presidential election for USS soccer had this as its major issue. And given that both the men's team and the women's team are the most important components of, uh, of US soccer, uh, the, the uh, presidential election was won by the person who says, I'm gonna fix this. And that's why the settlement came about. So it's, it's an interesting story and it fits into the 15 sports myths. And I'd like to congratulate Rod on providing something that still is relevant to a completely different domain, which is nation, the, the national teams in professional soccer uh, have essentially the same thing going on as the history of Title IX for high school and college athletes. Very much Roger for that, and um, I think we all agree that uh, having Roger speak is absolute um, essential uh, part of making this event uh, success. And really happy to have it. So you may also have noticed I didn't time him. And all I will say to you is I dare any of you to tell Roger to shut up. <laughs> In my place, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it either. That said. We're now continuing, so we are returning to the same rules as we had. <laughs> Steve Ross is speaking next. I have no problem at all for <laughs> Steve to show up. <laughs> so, Steve, we need to find your presentation, which is. I believe that. So thank you for having the 
uh, one, uh, the person here who has no PhD and math stuff at trigonometry, uh, so there won't be any convex curves or discussion of, of, of this in, in my talk. I cannot remember when I first met uh, Rod, but I can vividly remember the first real benefit. Um, Dennis cited this paper by John Vrooman, and I read it when I, this is pre-email, I read it in print and tracked him down by phone and called him because I found some of his conclusions counterintuitive. I gave him what we might call a word problem, and he cited me the fact that the derivative was positive in equation eight, which I then tried to explain to him I didn't understand. He then cited the fact that the coefficient of A was negative in some other equation, and I gave up. And sometime later, I already well, I already knew Rod really well. Rod actually explained to me in English the point Bruman was making in whatever this paper is and how it sort of made sense and what the problems were uh, with it. And uh, I have continued to benefit by Rod's extraordinary ability to explain complex economic concepts to people who do not have uh, doctoral degrees. Um, and, um, and it's just part of my uh, honoring him today. Um, so how do I change the pages? Uh, just click on it. Okay. So, um, so this paper is actually inspired by some work that uh, Rod is, uh, claims he's going to continue to do in retirement, and I certainly hope uh, it is uh, about the Negro Leagues. Uh, for those of you who may be unaware, prior to 1947, uh, baseball practiced uh, strict um, racial discrimination, and there developed a separate, unequal Negro Leagues of, of baseball, of extremely high quality. They've now been recognized statistically as a major league. Um, in 1955, eight years after um, integration, I think half the players at the All-Star team were African-American players. So you could, you could see the, the, the quality. Uh, after integration, however, uh, Negro League clubs received no compensation for players under contract, despite rigid rules that protected other leagues uh, for white players in so-called organized baseball. Uh, to stay afloat, the Negro Leagues asked for official status as a minor league club. They would continue to develop players. They had a huge informal and formal infrastructure in African-American communities all around the nation. And the major league owners uh, rejected it. And this is inspired by Rod's at least preliminary hypothesis that the major league owners uh, rejected it as an anti-competitive strategy to maintain their monopoly status. So when we look at the development of players, I start with uh, the Williamsonian make or buy analysis. As all you know, an essential concept of bioeconomics is that firms selling products will vertically integrate or contract based on efficiency. And among the factors that you would consider is the cost of acquiring the talent to develop the services at a desired level of quality, uh, the actual cost of the services, and the bargaining costs if you're going to contract uh, out. Uh, and applied to sports, uh, this raises the question because major league clubs need someone to develop the younger players. Now, we can look to see what does a free market look like when we have, um, when we have a, um, uh, a system of integration. And we see in global soccer that some clubs spend millions on deep youth academies with many of their players being homegrown. Perhaps the best example is FC Barcelona. Some clubs rely principally on smaller clubs to develop players. They don't really invest that much in their own academies. And uh, uh, players sign multi-year contracts when they're very young, um, and that the, therefore uh, they are acquired during those contracts by other clubs, and significant transfer fees provide income for many clubs. Uh, in separate work and in years of debates with Stefan Schmeinsky, um, the, we, uh, we discussed these transfer fees, and uh, it's clear that the FIFA rules provide higher transfer fees than there should be, but uh, the system uh, of ordinary contract law would provide for some transfer fees. 
Major clubs, if you look at major clubs today in global soccer, they have players under contract involving a mix of strategies. So a typical roster will involve some homegrown players, some where their contracts have been purchased, some players who come on free transfers, and some teams have players on loans from other clubs to further develop the players because the players wouldn't get a lot of playing time at their employed club. A less restrained but the market, but one where there is still a fair amount of open competition was minor league baseball in the 1950s. <clears throat> the professional baseball agreement uh, included a wide number of affiliated and unaffiliated teams. Some major league clubs had over 20 affiliates, others had less than 10. The 1955 Pacific Coast League, for example, featured six independent teams very profitable, very successful, competing against two teams that had affiliate relationships. Like global soccer today, the unaffiliated clubs had a very profitable business model. Uh, they earned money from revenues from live gate sponsorships and fees from selling player contracts to Major League Baseball. And these revenues allowed minor league baseball owners to cover player and coaches expenses um, uh, even though uh, competing against affiliate teams where these expenses were covered by uh, the major league clubs in an affiliate agreement. Uh, that for the past decades, however, there's been a professional baseball agreement with affiliated teams guaranteed that each major league club would feature a fixed affiliate agreement with at least six clubs and a de facto agreement for no more than six clubs. The 180 minor league baseball clubs pursuant to this agreement occupied over 95% of the market. So this basically dominated the market for player development. Given the diversity of team needs, resources, and management skills, it is highly implausible that having precisely six affiliate teams is the optimal Williamsonian make or buy decision for every major league baseball team. But my argument is that the monopoly benefit of the scheme outweighs any inefficiencies from a suboptimal make or buy regime. First, I'm going to talk about the adverse social effects of this Major League Baseball scheme. When it is combined with the, the rule for draft, something I talk about uh, in a 2015 piece in the Columbia Law Review, the effect is to preclude a business model to develop elite skills for poor inner city or rural kids. Because they're, they're, uh, there's no, if you, you, if you are an independent entrepreneur and you wanted to create a network of inner city clubs, you could spend all this money, but then uh, you're, 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 you wouldn't have an opportunity to um, get any return on your investment uh, uh, for, for that skill. Major league clubs won't develop domestic academies like you soccer players do, because any if the Detroit Tigers created a domestic academy and they spent a lot of money finding great players and really playing them along, as soon as they turn 18, they go into the draft and the Pittsburgh Pirates could just draft them for no compensation and no return on investment. Independent minor leagues can't profitably train major league players because the major league rules have fixed the fee for signing such a player. As a result, in the United States, player development is almost exclusively self-funded by uh, parents. And the result is racially discriminatory. And we've seen a sharp decline of African-American Puerto Rican participation. There are more, uh, this is about seven years old, but there are more, uh, when I last looked, there were more Mexican than Mexican-American players um, because uh, an infrastructure for player development remains in Mexico. So if you look at the slide, you can see Jackie Robinson playing for the UCLA Bruins. His mom could not have afforded to pay for him to pay for a traveling team, and he would not have played baseball if he were 15 years old today. And next we see Roberto Clemente, uh, and uh, who could play in a Puerto Rican league where he got his start. He played two years. He was a star. And then, the Mon and then because there was no draft, the Brooklyn Dodgers signed him. He played for Montreal for a year before going to the Pittsburgh Pirates. In contrast, Fernando Valenzuela uh, started in a small town because they have appropriate infrastructure uh, in Mexico, which is more like global soccer. And then uh, his contract was purchased by uh, Yucatan. And then his contract was in turn purchased by the Los Angeles Dodgers. And he went uh, on. And the result is a huge inequality of opportunity to participate in baseball. 
Um, so being an antitrust lawyer, uh, I look to uh, antitrust solutions and uh, there's an actual relatively straightforward solution to this problem. You bar the Major League Baseball anti-competitive agreement. Um, uh, under my proposal, each Major League Baseball team would have to be able to choose for themselves how many or few affiliate teams it wishes, subject perhaps to some roster limits to avoid overstocking problem. Each team would be able to choose whether to have their own farm teams or whether it to uh, take signed players and then loan them to independent minor leagues uh, or operate however they want. Uh, Major League Baseball could operate its own minor league system if it wanted, as long as the, the effect was not exclusionary toward independent competitions. And I can imagine that if, if you are, um, but the key is that if a player is under contract to an independent minor league club, who happens to be valuable to more than one Major League Baseball club, the Major League Baseball clubs would have to bid for the right to those player services. And I think if you had uh, that second to the last bullet point, you really wouldn't even be worried about the middle bullet point because I think independent leagues would be able to develop on their own uh, and, and thrive. And to the extent that Major League Baseball was significantly concerned about the competitive base, uh, balance effects, they're free to modify the Rule 5 draft, which is the rule that talks about players under contract. So if a club really is signing up too many players, you can only have so many players on your major league team and on your AAA team, et cetera. And then the weaker teams can just, uh, can just uh, draft them away. And it's a very straightforward solution. It would provide uh, a more efficient make or buy analysis for clubs. So it, it would improve player development from an efficiency perspective. And I would predict that it would have strongly positive social um, benefits because it would create economic incentives to basically restore what was the Negro League infrastructure in inner city communities where people would then have an incentive to develop uh, inner city teams, to develop players, um, uh, to move on uh, further and to minimize the huge inequality of opportunity. Now, there is one reality to this uh, from a social perspective um, that I just want to add. And that is that it is true that a player who would be trained by an inner city uh, Detroit team <clears throat> and then sold will receive less compensation, at least initially, than uh, a player whose parents paid for him to uh, go to these traveling teams and then they get drafted in the rule four draft as and they can negotiate or they get drafted after college or something like that. And there's a superficial sense that, well, gee, that's really bad that some black players will be receiving less money than rich white players. And my answer to that is, what do you think about the student loan program? So it is true right now that there are lots of successful professionals out there whose real income is much lower because they have to pay off student debt because we have a student loan program so they can actually go to college. Whereas I had no student debt because my parents paid for my education. So one thing you could say is, oh, gee, it looks really bad to have these lawyers in a law firm and all the poor lawyers, they're all paying off their student debt. And then all these rich white lawyers, they have no student debt. But the solution is not ban the program so now poor people can't go to school so we don't have to look at these people anomalously. And so it seems to me that this would really uh, be uh, justice uh, promoted. So uh, I'm under my thing. Stefan doesn't have to tell me to show up, shut up. And uh, thank you again, Rob. That's real self propulsion. Um, so we can have Jason up next. Uh, 
Thanks for having me. Um, I've known Rod for a long time. I think I was 19 or 20 when I, when I first knew Rod. Uh, he was a professor in my undergrad days, so uh, it's been a while. Rod has taught my wife in class. Uh, <laughs> we were when we were dating. She said, "Look, I need an econ class. It's either money or banking or econ sports." I said, "If you take money and banking, we're through." <laughs> uh, she thought about it for a while and uh, she said, well, I'm <laughs> she enjoyed the course. Um, I had the good fortune of teaching uh, sports econ at WSU and Rod did teach it. I think that helped me get the job here. Uh, three or four years later, I said, hey, we need another econ guy and uh, we hired Rod. Uh, I think that was the apex. It went downhill from there. By the time we hired Steph, uh, <laughs> we get out of here. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Uh, <laughs> regretting it already. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you knew you would. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the, the first paper I ever wrote, uh, I, I think was about fan loyalty is with, with Rod and a couple other people. And we looked at, uh, you know, baseball teams and, and fan substitution. I think that's uh, another way of looking at fan loyalty. Uh, we've written a few papers on that. I'm still kind of stuck on that. I guess everybody else has moved on, but uh, this is more about, you know, what, what do we think about when, when fans are loyal? And, and I'll try to explain why I think uh, fan loyalty is kind of a weird thing. I do have a model in the paper. I'm not going to talk about it. Uh, I had a more extensive model. I kind of pared it down. I thought it kind of took away from the story a little bit. So I'll just try to give the main idea. And I don't really have any solutions, but I, I'm just trying to figure out uh, fan behavior with this. So uh, hopefully it makes some sense. So before I really start anything, you might be wondering, well, what's, what's the paradox? And uh, hopefully nobody nails me too bad on the uh, definition of a paradox. But I think it's a paradox. So what I'm saying is that there's an association between fan loyalty and a desire for long-term success for the team. Now, this might seem straightforward and obvious, but actually, when you think about loyalty, it's almost like you're not changing your behavior based on how the team does. I mean, if you're loyal, you're a fan when the team does bad. So this actually is, I'm, I'm uh, being a little cute here, but, but I do think like if you're a huge fan, right? You think, okay, I really want the team to win. I think associated with that is, is typically some fan loyalty, right? Um, and, and so that's, that's one thing. What's the paradox? Uh, it's the loyalty that's a detriment to long-term team success. And, and so it's like saying the more you want the team to win, the more they're not going to win. And I'll go through that a bit more systematically uh, in a minute. Okay, so how do we think about loyalty? I mean, I thought a lot about this, right? And so I, I got the picture of the, the Bengals fan. He's, he's, I don't know if you want to call that dignified or not, but, you know, they finally got back to the Super Bowl. And I, I really like this quote from Cicero. He's a big fan of loyalty, I guess. Like nothing is more noble uh, than loyalty. And so I think if, if most of us think about loyalty, you might think about you know a loyal dog or something. We think that is as virtuous. And I'll talk about Akerlof in a minute. He talks about uh, uh, you know like military academies try to drill in loyalty. I think for obvious reasons, right? They don't want their soldiers going fighting on the on the other side. Um, you know, we think about you know, families or spouses and then, and I think most of the time we think loyalty is a good thing, at least to a point, right? Uh, we might disagree where that point is, uh, but, but all I'm trying to say is I think most people think, think of loyalty as, as a virtue. And so when we think about sports fans, I think that's certainly true. I think people like to brag about how loyal of a sports fan they are. Uh, so it kind of fits this model. Now, from an economic standpoint, this is really weird. I think as an industrial organization economist, this sort of flies in the face uh, of, of competition, right? Economic competition. Uh, so it's, it's like you're granting a monopoly uh, for yourself through loyalty, right? And so uh, I don't know if you know Arthur Lewis. So here's the, the brow pick on the brown, I guess. Uh, the, the fan's a little, a little more sad. Uh, so W. Arthur Lewis. Uh, isn't that well known, but he's a Nobel Prize winning economist. Uh, he was writing about loyalty like 80 years ago. Um, and, and from his point of view, it was, it was like, you know, he noticed that 
the stores wanted the same customers over and over again. They didn't want to switch around. So he was looking at this as a supply chain issue, but I, I really like this quote, loyalty and innocence are twin virtues. If one is lucky enough to have customers who are prone to either virtue, one may be able to exploit them. And so, yeah, if you're on the business side, you know, if you have a loyal customer, you have a monopoly. Right? They're not going anywhere else. And so, you know, marketing and branding, they're trying to generate this loyalty. Well, they're trying to generate some market power, right? And so when I think about sports, it's, it's kind of weird, I think, that we've, you know, we've, we've built in this huge virtue of, of market power, right? And, and I guess that's what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is, is why do we do that? Now, you might think it's kind of obvious. I'm not, I'm not quite, I'm not sure it is obvious, but anyway, these are the two kinds of things. I think loyalty from, a, from an economic standpoint, uh, you know, economists, they, they question everything, right? Why do people do this? Why? I don't know why they, they, uh, uh, they don't understand why people are loyal necessarily. Okay, so what's, what's really the, the puzzle here that I'm, I'm trying to put together? Okay, uh, so virtually all fans like to root for a winner. I think that's true. I don't think there's too many people out there rooting for a team to lose. I mean, it, except for when it's a team you don't like, right? I mean, I, I think this is pretty straightforward. Um, the problem is team quality investments and in winning depend on the marginal benefits of winning, right? So this is the standard sports economics model, right? Uh, if there's no benefit of winning, they're not going to invest in winning, okay? Uh, so fans want to win, they want teams to invest. Well, the point here is that disloyal fans, by definition, are the ones responding. If you're disloyal, that means you only show up when you're winning, right? So it's the disloyal fans giving the incentive for the team to win. It's the loyal fans who are just rabid and really want their team to win. They're not helping at all. It's the fairweather fans. It's the bandwagon fans uh, that, are, that are doing that. Yet, many fans choose to be loyal. And, and this is this is my puzzle. Now, it's not just that, uh, you know, you might say, well, I just really like going to games. So I'm, I'm loyal. I want to go. I, I can't help it. Right. Or maybe uh, most fans aren't thinking about the model of a sports league. And, that, you know, if I don't show up when they lose, that, that gives them an incentive. But the, the really weird thing in this case is that they don't like disloyal fans. I think this is true. When you talk about a bandwagon fan, a fair weather fan, like they're looked down upon. Right? But they're the ones causing your team to win. They're the ones giving an incentive for your team to get better players and win. And, and this is kind of the weirdness. Now, you might think, okay, if loyalty is a virtue, maybe I'm just trying to signal my virtue. But I don't think we do this, you know, at the grocery store. Like, I like some brand and, you know, somebody else kind of hedges and you don't look down on them for doing that. Some, in some instances, we, uh, I think, appreciate the competition aspect and then trying to buy whatever you think is there, right? But but here in sports, we, we literally look at what well, I, I think we look down on disloyal fans. Hopefully that's clear. Okay, I have a picture here of the Godfather. Uh, a lot of times when you look at loyalty, it, there's some sort of relationship, right? So I put this picture here, uh, you know, uh, the opening scene of the Godfather, if you haven't seen it, I don't know what's wrong with you, you should watch it, but uh, you know, it's all about loyalty, right? So this guy walks in and he says, look, uh, I need a favor. And Godfather says, no, you need a favor. Well, you haven't called me in years. You've never invited me to your house. You don't want to know me. You know, you come to me on my daughter's wedding day. Uh, and, and he's kind of annoyed, right? He's like, I, you know, you need a favor. And he says, okay, look, I'll do you a favor, but I'm going to need a favor in return, Right. Uh, and so that's, you know, the whole movie, like if, if you Google quotes about loyalty, uh, Mario Puzo, yeah, comes up a lot. <laughs> so all these Godfathers, it kind of came out, I thought, well, that's interesting, right? So you think of this as a relationship and, and this makes some sense, right? That you have a relationship and you just kind of help each other out. And, you know, I don't want to get too far in the weeds in that, but I don't think that describes sports at all. Right, so I would say in sports, if it's a relationship, it's an abusive relationship. It's one way. Like I don't go to the team and say, "Hey, I've been a fan for thirty years now. What do I get?" I don't get anything. Uh, they're not going to invest in players. So my point is, they're they're hurting you. They're taking advantage of your loyalty. 
And this isn't necessarily new or unique to sports, uh, but I do think it's interesting that we, uh, you know, we sort of hold up loyalty so much in sports, and, and yet I think this relationship is completely one way um, in, in, this, in this sense. So, so that's, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Okay, so what's, what's the answer uh, after reading you know, a few papers, uh, you know, why aren't loyal fans thankful for fair weather fans, even if they want to be loyal? Why aren't they thankful for people showing up, right? Why do they say, look, you're just here because the team's winning and, you know, it's, it's uh, what's going on. What's the story there? I think it's because fair weather fans hurt the group identity. And again, Akalov kind of unlocked this for me. He's got a couple of really great papers about this. One is well, cited a jillion times. Uh, the other is not, and it's older, uh, but I have it in the paper. I'm happy to send the paper to anybody. But, uh, you know, he talks about all the crazy things people do because they want to identify in a particular group. And to me, this explains sports. I want to be in that group. And Fairweather fans, bandwagon fans, they're not part of the group. And people get annoyed when they start coming into that group, you know, especially when they weren't there in the bad times. They just come in the good times. That's frustrating, um, I think, for a couple of years. Let me give you a, another example. So I know somebody who uh, only buys Fords, right? If any other automobile, they only buy a Ford. And I thought, well, that seems weird. You know, it's not just that they buy a Ford. I have a Ford, but they won't even look at anything else, right? And for years, I thought, why are they doing this, right? And it finally dawned on me because uh, he's a Ford guy. Now, it might sound tautological, but I don't think it is. He is a Ford guy. He wants to be in that group. So he doesn't even look at other types of automobiles, right? So if, if that's where his loyal step, loyalty stems from. I think it's the same thing with a sports fan. You know, I'm a, uh, you know, if I'm a Tigers fan, I want to be in that group. And then when the Tigers start winning, other people come into that group. It kind of distorts the group identity. Right, and it's frustrating to other people in that group. And, and I think if you read Akerlof, he can explain it better than I can, but uh, there's a lot of different things that people do. I, I think this matters, okay? So clearly, the, I'm not saying that the, the model of you know, sports league is incorrect. I think it's very correct because we see revenues go up as winning goes up. All of that is correct, but there is this group of people um, that, that I think is, is sort of in that model that we don't think about quite as much. And there's some interesting, interesting things to think about. Um, I won't go into all the implications. Like I said, I don't have all the answers to these things. I mean, I talk about it a little bit in the paper, but uh, this has huge implications, I think, for consumer utility. Right? If I'm a loyal fan, you can even think of an extreme case where I prefer my team to lose, right? Because it weeds out all the fair weather fans. I mean, if, that, if I care more about that than the actual winning, I mean, I, I guess that's possible. And I'm sure there are fans, they might not admit it, but maybe they're happier when there's just a core fan base, right? Um, the team profitability, uh, teams want loyalty, right? You want a monopoly. Now, I think if you look at the model of the sports league, that's actually not always the case under some parameter values. And I'm, I'm trying to look into that, but uh, that's another interesting thing. Player salaries, um, you know, they don't, want, they don't want loyalty. Players, right? They want to be paid. They want a high... Uh, margin revenue product, and so that's bigger if fans go where, whoever's winning, right? So they should care a lot about this. Uh, it has implications for competitive balance um, and marketing strategies. And, and so, you know, one of the things I was thinking about uh, doing this project was like, usually we think of like geographic loyalties, and I think that's slowly eroding. I don't know, but uh, there might be other measures that, that teams care about and uh, I'm kind of waiting for some team to try to generate more loyalty in a fan base on some other metric, like taking up some controversial position, which maybe they do that to some degree right now, but um, you know, they could think about that. Like I could get maybe a smaller fan base, but a really loyal fan base if I do this. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think it implications for, you know, you think about college sports. I mean, we already have a group. And so we're at the University of Michigan, that's our group, and it's sort of the, the teams are a reflection of that. It's not completely different how, you know, I've always thought about college athletics, but it's a little bit different, right? So it, it's, you, you want to think about, you know, how does this influence the, the group as a whole? And I think that's true with, with uh, pro sports teams as well. Anyway, thank you.
is more perfect timing. So um, we now, yeah, Paiso is now going to talk. Now we are running a little late, and we do want to. So we've got to got to put an hour for lunch, and lunch is there. So I say, if you want to grab some lunch anytime. Go for it. <coughs> There's no reason because I think we can listen to Plasco. I don't think that's rude. I don't know. That's not rude. No. I don't think he's going to notice. Oh, he's not even there. <laughs> <laughs> he might even there. He, he probably knows that. So if that's okay, so feel free to do this <laughs> as you like. But uh, yes. So with that said, Plasco will tell you. And Plasco, are you there? It's like you're muted for a second. You're yeah. muted at the moment, I think, Pastor. Yeah. Hi, Pastor, can you hear us? Hang on. Let's go into Roger. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's going only to Roger. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, there, Plasto. But I think at least there's something there. There we go. It looks like he's there. Yeah. He was emailing me earlier. Let me see if he sent me an email. There is my you're right. It's, it's, it's probably maybe he's having trouble with the mic. Oh, oh, I just if you want to unmute, share your screen. <laughs> Hi, Placido. Can you speak? Yes, I I can hear you, but it was impossible to connect. I don't know what happened. Oh. I try to go again. Mm. Okay, so can you share your screen? I don't know what. It's impossible to connect. You want to click on that green button at the middle of the bottom of the screen there. You can share your PowerPoint if you have one. I try. I try to to hear again, but it was impossible. You can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? But I I cannot select now my presentation. Can you see the room? I don't know why. Can you see the room? I try. Let me see one at one. We do, we do. We have it. We have it on the. I'll try. No, don't worry. Mm -hmm. You want us to show it locally? I don't know why I come lost. It's dropped off. I always come back in. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Hi, Pastor. 
We can see you now. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear now. I try to. Yeah, very good. Okay. Mm. Leave it at that. Just okay. That's mm. so all we need to know. You <laughs> are. <laughs> Finally, at the end, I can I can get it. <laughs> okay. Uh, first, first of my presentation, I want to to give some comments about the Roger Nall presentation, and I can give you for for him and for everybody several notices in, in Spain about uh, women women sport. If you can see in, in my table, this is the pages devoted to uh, women's sport in Spain from the 1st of January of uh, 2021 till now. If probably you can see the pages this year, maybe 2000 or even more, you can, if you compare this one to the 2020, maybe, there are no more than 50. The reason is that uh, in that moment, Barcelona Football Club won the um, champions of uh, the European champions for women. Uh, and now Alexia Putellas that uh, won the um, golden ball last year, and now Alessia Putellas is almost, is more famous than the, the majority of top model in Spain. So the possibility of um, improving the, the, the salary, the revenues of, of uh, women's sport probably is about the success in this small sport at the moment, because in tennis, there are the salaries almost the same from uh, with women and, and men. There is no so difference between Rafa Nadal and Serena Williams, for instance, or even Serena Williams who want more money. So this is only the comment, but probably for the future, uh, Royer uh, said mm, mm, that is the, the way, oh, but in my opinion, it's only for a uh, success of particular thing or particular women, single, single uh, sport women, right? okay? This is only a comment, okay? Bye. Well, <laughs> now uh, I want to present, uh, I don't know if it's possible to see this one. No. Yes. yes. I share this one or not? Can me? Yes, we can see it, Pasco. You can see? Yes. Ah, yes, you can see it. <laughs> okay. Mm. Okay, I, I want to, to present not a, a particular paper, but uh, my idea, in my opinion, about the, the men, that is Romney Ford in that case. And I appreciate very much that Stefan. Uh, thought uh, on me about the possibility of participating in this important symposium <laughs> in honor of Romney Ford, okay? Uh, Romney Ford um, um, has a very important influence on me as a teacher on sport economics at the U Oviedo University. In fact, probably for, for me, the most important paper uh, they wrote, Rodney and Jay Square, was the paper published on the Journal of Economic Literature in 1995, because uh, this paper um, gave me the possibility of including several chapters in my uh, course that I teach at the University of Oviedo. In fact, several of these uh, slides are writing in Spain because I translated this paper for the student and I translated many other things from him for our students. 
the, the, the paper that I wrote about a competitive balance that is the guide for, for my case is uh, that say that the first model of competitive balance was realized by El Jodiri Quira in 1971. But uh, um, Romney Ford and James Quir in 1995 uh, simplified the, the cost function, giving the possibility of representing uh, this equilibrium in only one particular uh, picture, like this. In this case, uh, as you see, but competitive balance without and with a salary cap individual give this possibility that the students can say that with salary cap probably competitive balance didn't change uh, anything or, or a little, but the, th the important thing is that the revenue sharing is the real important that I know reported that now in that, in that presentation. Another books that I comment several chapters or several like that, is the, the books that I received some of them from, from him and another one that I, uh, we have in, in our observatory in Gijón. So this is the books that I use usually for complementing uh, our studies to other books that we use usually. Now, uh, in the second part, I want to, to, to present my relationship with Romney Four. And the first one was in 2006, when uh, he was professor at Washington State University in Alaska. We have many, many problems to organize, to organize his travel to, to Gijón to participate in the conference, 15 years on sport economics, Rottenberg Golden Anniversary, that was celebrated in this year. Uh, he is the aspect that Rodney has at, at that time, okay? Uh, he presented the paper, the use model versus the European model. <coughs> and what's a, a discussion that was the professor of my university, Juan, Juan Prieto. And this is the, the guys that participated uh, in this first conference uh, from the left to the right in, in in the the height the height is there, Rodney Four, Ro, <coughs> Roger No, Robert Bade, two Stefans, Stefan Kesen, Stefan Simansky, Bill Gerard at the bottom, uh, Bert Frick, Leo Kahan, Peter Sloan, me, and Jaume Garcia. The second time that uh, he traveled to, to Gijón, uh, he stayed at that time uh, at the University of Michigan that continue today, was the, the 10th conference uh, of uh, International Association of Sport Economics that was celebrated in 2008. And uh, he presented it with Jason Winfrey that was the, the previous speaker in this, in this memorial uh, with the Title Thailand Supply the Contest Success Function and Revenue Sharing in Revenue Sharing in Professional Sport. And the third and the last time that I stay in Gijón, not uh, but we contact uh, with other times in, in, in other conference, was the, the conference that was the title Sport and Econometrics, that was the sixth Gijón Conference on Sport Economics in 2011. And he presented the paper, Major League Baseball Attendance Time Series, Lessons for Leagues for Policy. And finally, uh, in the book we edited of this conference with the title, The Econometrics of Sport, uh, he presented with John Hong Lee the, the, paper, the, the same paper, but with another different title, uh, a small different title, Major League Baseball Attendance Time Series, League Policy Lesson. Uh, he um, <coughs> let me let me put you one at this one. This is the the first the first uh, that's right. This is the third edition of, of this book, uh, Sport Eco <coughs> Economics. 
and he wrote me these words that I tried to work, but because it was impossible for me to include it in this presentation. That say, did Placido, congratulations on Congress, uh, since Gijón, I learned much more than I guess. Best to you, my friend, Rodney Ford, uh, signed uh, <coughs> in uh, August 5, uh, 2011. And I want to say you for finished this presentation with my own words. You were wrong, Rod. You have given to the economy of sport far more than you could have received. This is why I am proud to participate in this well-deserved tribute for your retirement. Be happy and good luck for the future. Many thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Placido. Um, it's a real shame you can't join us for lunch. <laughs> okay, have a, good, have, a good have a good lunch. Okay. We will reschedule and we will replay this retirement <laughs> in Hikon <laughs> at some point in the future. I, I hope you, I hope you win my arms open. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's right. Pass a good time. <laughs> Bye. All right, guys. <laughs> Only no was <laughs> re refused to follow. I was you. I was saying Roger for the end. <laughs>
I just said, uh, exactly, exactly, right. exactly, right. exactly right. I may invite you back soon. Right? Oh, no. no. <laughs> I definitely you know. Know. Yeah. So I did like four yeah. case studies, like uh, sage business cases. They're like six really good cases. Try to pretend like this is like Use like those two Okay, sorry, that all was the same I was just waiting. My, I looked up the cost of the business school, which which kind of. Yeah, oh, yeah, it was like it was a big career. All right, everybody. Time to kick off the afternoon session. I remember like is Thomas Pete. 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 So I'm going to talk a little bit about the way um, I guess Rod influenced my own research, and of course I do a lot of revenue sharing, so that's where we're going to talk about. But first, I wanted to do a little bit um, of economic impact study. So I'm going to do uh, Rod Ford's an economist's impact study, and as these things go, I'll talk about Rod and then his impact on why I am vacationing, as they call that, in Michigan in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to draw some dubious causal links between these two. And that's what you do in an economic impact study, right? So, <laughs> so how this all started is, and I'm glad that I'm that blessed to actually confirmed uh, this, this uh, previous presentation. Uh, I met Rod the first time in Chicago um, in 2008. Uh, I wasn't a PhD student at the time, but Stefan Kessin already took me along. I guess he wanted to just test whether I was an avid enough traveler to be his PhD student. Uh, you might not remember that I was there because I spent two days in bed with a food poisoning in that conference. So um, anyway. A couple months later, I actually started as a PhD student and I went to one of these rooms where Stefan Kessin's office was and he, took, he gave me one book and three papers. The book was Pay Dirt, the paper was Fort and Quirk, Szymanski and Kessin, and this paper by Falconieri on the TV, TV deals in the Journal of European Geographic Association. And he told me, there is some discussion in the literature going on between this Szymanski and this Ford guy. Okay, fair enough. So um, what happened then is, of course, I joined uh, Michigan here. Rod actually sent me the invitation letter that I needed for my visa. So, and he picked me up from the airport. And then I noticed that actually there's some discussion between these two every day on all sorts of topics. It's just that, when they discussed revenue sharing, it ended up in academic journals, right? The other discussions stayed in the brown so, <laughs> um, so what happened then? <laughs> we, uh, we shared a room at OBL and I got to go to nicer places like Steve's uh, swimming pool with this table inside, which was amazing. Uh, we went, you know, all over, we became good friends. So I think, um, at a personal level, I can't say enough how this changed me. Um, and in that sense, I'm very, very grateful for that opportunity. And when I think about the intellectual way uh, in which um, Rod influenced me, I think two things stand out. And that is the first one is Rod was actually a champion of open science before it became a thing, right? You had already all of this great data resources online for free. You could just go there and take it. Uh, that is what people try to, I mean, 
I'm in the, an open science ambassador at my university because they try everybody to make it, to make them do that, right? So you did it before it was, I would say, before it was cool, right? So um, that's one thing that I, that I really take uh, as, as a lesson, sort of. And the second thing is, of course, uh, to think about revenue sharing uh, in theory and in practice. So that's what I'm going to try and combine in this presentation. So because we're in America, I thought, well, let's go through the, the motions of revenue sharing in, in EU leaks. Uh, because, of course, uh, we do things a little different. Um, so in theory, of course, you know, revenues depend in some way on wins. And then there's a percentage of those revenues you share. Uh, and we take it from there. In reality, there's, of course, different kinds of revenues. In Europe, uh, because we're not uh, as communist as the US is, we actually don't share uh, that many revenues, right? We don't share gate revenues, commercial revenues, absolutely not. Media revenues, that's the only one where I can put a question mark. So that's what we're going to try and explore. Through. So what are the systems in Europe? There's been two systems that people have used. First one is individual sales, where each team sells their own home games, which are also, uh, of which they are also the legal owners. And then you can have some ad hoc coalitions between teams to share together. That's what happened in Spain quite a lot. The big ones went solo, the small ones. Uh, and then you keep the proceeds of your sales, or there is some <laughs> limited amount of sharing going on. Second system, as you would know, um, in the US standard, you have collective sales and a sharing rule. Uh, in Europe, the sharing rule, I mean, it would be too easy to make it equal, right? And give everybody the same. So there's actually criteria attached to these rules. Some percentage get shared equal, some percentage based on some performance metrics typically, and then an appearance fee or uh, it has different names, but favors large market teams, typically. Um, so what is the effect of this revenue sharing in the data? Can we see any effect of this uh, going from one to the next? So where can we go look for this? And this is gonna be the comparison I'm trying to draw here. Um, so there's two countries with 20 teams, uh, England and France, and they state through to the collective system throughout this period. So they had collective sales from 2000. So I'm going to look 2007 to 2019. They've done it all the way through. And their sharing rules are also pretty comparable. So in England, it's 50% equal, 25% performance, 25% TV appearance. The sad, well, the, the thing that they didn't count on in the beginning is that they share their international deals 100% equal. They never, I, I don't think the big clubs had expected this to be such a big deal. Um, and when it became a big deal, they also became uncomfortable with 100% equal share. So that's gonna change at some point, I think. Uh, in France, they do 50, 30, 20, which is, you know, it's very similar, uh, you might say. But then the two that are of interest to this uh, presentation, so this is going to be the control group, uh, is Italy and Spain, which both switch their system from an individual system to a um, <coughs> collective system, where they went with a, in Italy with a similar sharing rule. And in Spain, I mean, my Spanish is maybe not good enough, but I'm going to say that they do some. That they do some equals. That there is some distribution, which is the result, I haven't been able to figure out uh, what percentages are behind. Um, so how big are these deals? Well, the Premier League has com a combined three plus something billion euros. That's about double what La Liga has. And then Spain, uh, and then Italy has about a billion. France uh, had a deal that was worth a billion. <laughs> Their operator went bankrupt last year. Uh, they now have to have a new deal. Uh, it's uh, reportedly to be a little bit small. All right, so what is then the other aspect? So what is the open data? Um, so what I'm gonna use here is the EK's financial accounts database. Uh, what we've done in Rotterdam is basically we bought, um, so we, we 
took all our students and postdocs from all different countries and we went out and tried to locate the official archives in every <laughs> significant football country. And we went in and bought the accounts of the clubs. Um, so that means that on my computer, there's thousands of PDFs, uh, which is a great thing, has Stefan. So this now needs to become uh, a database and that's what we're uh, trying to organize. So we're, so for, this is Europe. Countries in red are the countries that we have in the state. So um, do we have the same information on all of them? No, because for example, <laughs> the standard account in format in Portugal and Belgium is very sober, you might say. There's not a lot of detail. Um, companies house, uh, PNCG, Italy. Well, actually Italy is the most open country. So that's the, the richest information comes from Italy. All right, so what do we do? Um, we've, the first thing we've done is we've made the transfer markets data set out of that, basically trying to make revenues comparable between all these countries, which was in itself surprisingly hard. Uh, but you can order, so we put that data set online in the Erasmus data repository. So that's where you can find it. And you can also find the do files and all the code that we created. Okay. Um, but if you're, if you're interested, or if you say my students should be interested, that's also fine. You can send us an email uh, and we give you, so we can't put all of the PDFs online because as I said, it's a couple thousand, but we're very happy for you to, uh, to join the work uh, and use it for your own purposes. So you can get access to our Dropbox, uh, extend the data set in any way you like, uh, the only thing we ask for is that you keep our identifiers in there so we can later, when you're done with your data and you publish your results, we can grow our hands. So this is the handy format. This is not handy to work with at all. We want this to then be reintegrated in the, in the original files, let's say. And the hope is that we grow something which is, you know, a financial database that's actually useful uh, and we don't have to beg you UEFA for it. Uh, so that's probably a good idea. Um, so to give you an example of what it looks like, so this is an Italian account. And as I said, the most detailed country in Europe, believe it or not. Um, what you see here is the split out of revenues. So this is revenues for Inter uh, in this year. And this is all the different revenues that they have. So you get the income from stadium from the first team. So abonamenti is season ticket holders. So this together is stadium income. Then you get all these uh, commercial income. You get um, the TV rights, the TV rights that they get from UEFA. So that's actually the Champions League prize money. You get um, the rent income. So the players in Europe, they can both be bought and sold, but also rented out. So that's what you see here. You get the transfer income, so the plus valenze da sessioni diretti plurinali, that's transfer income. So for Inter, that's 61 million in this year. So you get all this detail, <coughs> it somehow only needs to end up in a hand form. So that's what we've been doing in, uh, in the past. So my idea was, I take this database, we've already looked at this, so it's gonna be an easy paper to do. Of course, that wasn't true, because then I started looking, and I called Francesco to ask him what this was. As it turns out, the Italians were actually doing revenue sharing with their media reviews. So, but on a on a game-to-game -game basis. So this is so this is the current situation with the collective deal: 76 million from the collective deal in Italy, 7 million from UEFA. This is uh, what it was before. So here what they sold their own rights for individually, what they got from the hospitanti, so the teams that they play at, UEFA again, what they gave away to the hospitante, so the, the ones that they, that came to them. So they gave 3 million away. Uh, no, this is the gate sharing. They gave 17 million away. 
So you need to take this number is the individual income. This is what they got. This is what they got from the Champions League and this is what they have to give away. So that was a situation before 2011. I didn't know this. I don't know, did you know that Stefan? So this is new to us, but it also means that I have to go back and correct all our old numbers because obviously we had just taken this, this number right here, right? So that's a problem. Okay, so having done that, we can go to the question, what has been the impact of revenue share? So here's a standard deviation of points in these four countries. And I'm gonna put lines at where they went collective. So you can see that it had absolutely no effect on Italy. Uh, maybe in Spain, this is the rank correlation between your position today and last season, uh, sort of a well, interseasonal competitive balance measure. Again, I don't see any effect of this. Um, I also don't see, well, anyway, you don't see a lot happening in the competitive balance space. Not it, because the question, if you believe the model that Rod and Stefan and others have been using, talent investment leads to results, right? So has talent investment moved at all in these countries? So on the left average with club wage spending, and um, if you're ever wondering um, why uh, the Premier League clubs are not that afraid of staying in the current system, but clubs in Spain and Italy desperately want the Super League, that's your answer. Uh, the Premier League is the yellow line, so they dominate uh, quite strongly. Uh, everybody sees their revenues increase. Uh, again, this is where the collective deal comes in. I don't see a lot happening in either country. Um, then the standard deviation, so the co coefficient of variation of club wage spending, so the standard deviation divided by the mean. What do we see there? Um, Italy, maybe some decrease. Um, Spain, <clears throat> nothing much. But look at green, that's France. I don't know if you know what happens here. That's when Paris Saint-Germain gets taken over. And what they do is they make a competitive league, if you want, where the standard deviation was at EPL levels, and they jack it up to the level, the level of Spain. So basically, one owner coming in, changing the game, has a way, way bigger effect than any of these collective form of collective deals. That then brings us to if it's so the balance didn't change, the payroll hardly changed maybe the revenues at least changed, right? So this is uh, the coefficient of variation of revenues in England, France, and Italy. And again, what happened at Paris Saint-Germain is way more important than anything that has happened in Italy with this collective deal. On the right, same goes for Spain. This movement here in France is way more important than whatever's happening uh, to uh, to, to the Spanish um, revenues. But clearly, Spain is far more, more un unequal than any of the other countries, right? So as a base level. Um, so that begs the question, why? And so you have these, you go collective, you implement a sharing rule. Actually, your top clubs don't earn less, right? So you, in, you actually make a revenue sharing system that's not sharing any revenues, right? It's actually copying the situation you had, but then with higher revenues because you earn more from monopolizing the right? So as an example, I put Juventus, Lazio and Inter, which are the Italian top clubs, and that's them. Um, so what you see is when the deal comes in, uh, Juventus has, well, Juventus has a bad year here, but then actually they go up again and they are higher than they used to be. Uh, Inter and Lazio, they sort of, Lazio clearly increases and Inter sort of stays at the same level. If you compare that to France, which had a collective deal all along, uh, you see actually the same kind of movements. So it doesn't seem to be that, at least my reading is, it's not like these clubs here have been, extremely worried about going collective. 
they've just seen the same kind of revenue trends that that clubs and always collected uh, deals have seen. So the conclusion is thanks, Rod. Uh, and I didn't know how this would go down. So I thought I'd, we'd, we'd bring presents. I, I didn't know <laughs> this was a thing. Um, so I, I brought you some Belgian chocolate. I'm not taking it back to Belgium again. So, <laughs> so that's for you. My, my weak spot. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we had a cartel agreement not to have any gifts, right? Cheating on the cartel. <laughs> but so. you should, so there's punishments for cheating on the cartel. Well, I'm afraid of EU cartel uh, <laughs> authority, so that's okay. So next up is Robbie. Robbie joining us from Cork. Hey everybody. Hey Robbie. If you want to share your screen, you can. Uh, yeah, I, I'll go for there, okay? Yep. It's the floor is yours. Excellent. Can you see that okay? <coughs> First of all, thanks to Stefan for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. I, I'm honored uh, and congratulations to Rod. Um, and I, I'll start with a congratulation and hopefully end with one as well on such a, a remarkable career that I'm sure will continue to, to flourish even, uh, even in the years ahead. Um, also, thanks to um, um, Stefan for the last presentation. It was really, really interesting. So I, I hope I can build on that. Um, what I want to do today is, is talk to you about uh, Rod and his collaboration with, with Jim Quirk. Um, Jim is somebody I've, I never met in person. He, he passed away in the summer of 2020, but somebody that I've, I've, I've gotten to know quite well over the last number of months as I work on a special issue with Rod and other collaborators and Dennis uh, for the Journal of Sports Economics and I talked to you about that in, in, in the presentation as well. So I want to talk to you just about the relationship that the, the remarkable relationship they, they, uh, that they formed over, over the course of um, my lifetime effectively and uh, I try and explain that. So I've called it the dynamic duo. So, um, I, you know, when I was asked for this and what am I going to call it, I thought, well, you know, they are such a a formidable duo um, from 1983. Well, I date that from the, the kind of the first working paper. I'm sure Rod can correct me on that and say the relationship started earlier, um, but that's when I dated. So it, it effectively my almost my lifetime. I was born the year before that, um, but I have Batman and Robin because clearly the R is for Rod. Um, so uh, he was um, you know, he, he was he, Robin in this relationship to Jim, who was who was the overstudy. But like I said, this is something that spanned about five decades and uh, eleven U.S. presidential administrations. And it was when I started to think about it in that context, because sometimes you think from nineteen eighty three forward, you have to kind of you know think of it in a context like that. And I said that goes from Ronald Reagan to, to Joe Biden. So um, I, I use them as an example as well. Two two proud Ireland as well. Um, so. You know, I, I like to think of it in that context, uh, and I think it shows the, the longevity and the, the remarkable impact that both of them had uh, on, on the, the field of sports economics. Before I talk to you about the collaboration, just a little bit on Jim, I'm, I'm sure many people are much more familiar with the Jim than I was. Um, may, maybe some people are not, but I guess Jim was one of the, the forefathers of, of sports economics. Um, he was born in 1926, and I said died only recently. Uh, he had a, an amazing career, which brought him from um, teaching to the military and then on into university education. He moved around a bit. I suppose he's, he's best known for his time in Kansas, which spanned uh, five years from 1966 to 1971, and then later in Caltech, where he's, he's really fondly remembered. And Caltech actually have a very nice um, piece on their website uh, about, his, uh, about his impact in economics and particularly in sports economics. So he retired from Caltech in, in 1987. Um, but I suppose he had a he had left a, an amazing legacy at that point. It was coincidental that when he arrived in Caltech in 1971, it was also the year that he first published his first paper in, in sports economics. It was co-authored with, with Muhammad. 
um, and it was an economic model of the professional sports league. I'm sure it's a paper that many of you are familiar with, but I guess what's important about this paper is it was effectively the, the third paper in the field because you had Rottenberg in 56 and Neil in 64, and, and this is essentially the, the next contribution. And the thing about Jim that made him different, though, is he stays in the field. So he, he's arguably the first American sports economist um, because the other two didn't publish again in, in the area. So, you know, he's somebody that's incredibly important to, to the work we do and, and, and the literature that is now there. Um, Peter Sloan was slightly earlier in, 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 in Aberdeen and Peter published in 1969, 1971. So it's kind of a toss up as to which of them was first, but I think we could say, you know, arguably he was definitely one of the first, if not one of the first American sports economists. And then he goes on and has a career that spans seven decades. And I guess, I think this is a really nice picture that I, I got from Caltech. It's from 1973 appearance on, on TV, where he's talking about the business of baseball. And I can only imagine what it was like. Baseball is not a sport I'm familiar with. It's before my time, the 1970s, but I can only imagine what it was like to have an academic speaking about issues that had never really been thought about before um, because baseball and European soccer, th things like this were, were just seen as sports at the time. But here was Jim bringing economic issues um, like, you know, the reserve clause, like revenue sharing, like competitive balance, like the monopsony power that um, Major League Baseball had, bringing these issues to the fore, making people think about them. And I guess everything that's followed had its origins in this. And, he, he went on to have a truly remarkable career. He, he over a dozen books, he'd 130 um, published papers or, or, or more. Um, so he, he really left an, an, an incredible impact uh, on our field. And like I said, the early hits, I mean, some of these things are cited hundreds of times. So his 1971 papers nearly been cited 800 times. And his 1970. <clears throat> and Harry and, and, uh, and Jim that really getting their teeth stuck into, into the field. Um, you know, this is when the, 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 the subject that we know today really starts to take off. But I guess I want to turn now and talk to you about this dynamic duo because this comes slightly later. So like I said, we, we, can, we can date it from the early 1980s. Um, I have, Rod can correct me on that, but I found this beautiful working paper from uh, from Caltech. They make their working papers available, which is excellent. It's, it's been a great source uh, for me as well because it's where you can find some of the earliest work on boxing that, that Jim did as well with um, with Roger Nall and Joel Balbian. Um, so these workers are available, but you can see it there just blown up in case it's too small. Um, this is the first time that we see the combination come together and we have, um, we have Fort and Quirk together. Uh, so, I think I, the reason that the name the dynamic duo is appropriate is because uh, this has nothing to do with sport. So it's a paper about um, commodity prices and uh, normal um, backward. Uh, I believe a version of the the paper was published later in, in 1988 and, and none other than the Journal of Political Economy. So it's the first time that we see the, you know, the, the publication of this collaboration between Rod um, and James. Um, and like I said, it can be it's, it, it can be dated to the 1980s, so it's 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 almost you know pushing in on 35 years old. So I guess from Great Oaks, little um, sorry, Great Oaks and Little Acorns come, and I guess if, if you want to to, to 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 say you know this was a, a relationship that started like that in the early 1980s, it really starts to explode into the 1990s. Um, and And talking to Rod, um, baseball was often the topic of conversation. As I said, baseball is something I know very little about, um, but it's uh, it's something that Rod has has taught me about from our uh, from our, our time together. Um, sorry, no. I... This is a bad connection. I'm muted your video because the bandwidth is low. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, 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 I can't see you guys anymore, but if you can hear me, that's fine. I can keep going. Um, so there was three standout contributions. Um, I... Yes. 
in incentives and outcome uh, in professional uh, team sports. losing time so it's a really fascinating theoretical exploration of many of the issues that were starting to emerge in professional sports leagues um and you know i think this is one of the fundamental papers in our field now so when you read about new literature that you know addresses things like incentives and outcome not just in sport um, this is a paper that's often cited um it, it goes to the very origin of of, of the subject and I, I think you know and They've had many, many contributions together, but I think for me, this is probably the, the standout paper. The other two big standout contributions were, 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 were the books that were published in 1997. You have Peter, I think it was cited in the last presentation. So, you know, it's essentially like one of the popular economics textbooks that you, you would read now, you would buy on the shelf in an airport or something like that. So it brings the, the business of professional sports teams to life. And we start to think about things like competitive balance, like revenue sharing, like the issues that were presented in the last presentation for the first time. And um, you know, it's the perspective of baseball and why do foreign investors want to, to buy baseball teams in the US? Why are teams in the US prepared to uproot and drag a team somewhere else? Something that we're so, or is so unused, um, not normal in Europe. Um, and I guess not just for American audience, but for European audience, these things were really, really fascinating to read about. And then we have Hardball in 1999, which has been cited over 200 times. And again, I think there's a, a great uh, public choice element to this. So we start to look and consider about stadium subsidization and uh, you know, the use of taxpayer money to fund different events. And I think this is when that sort of angle of sports economics is really starting to take off post World Cup in America in 1994 and the other major sporting events that are starting to emerge. And you know, the idea that we're going to use public money to, 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 to fund certain teams and, and how teams abuse their power. And I think if you looked at what happened in the European Super League not so long ago, many of the issues were emerging from that can be traced to issues that were addressed by Cork and Fort as, you know, as early as the 1990s. And I think many of the messages and many of the stories in these books are as relevant today as they were um, 20 years ago. The Journal of Sports Economics emerges, as we know, in, in the early 2000s, and it's a natural home, and, and they published twice, 2004 and 2010, so two very important papers on competitive balance and revenue sharing. Um, and then there's later hits and things like the, the Scottish Journal of Political Economy in 2007, Economic Inquiry a little bit later, 2010. Um, and I guess these four papers alone would be enough for somebody to do a presentation and we'll talk about what a, a wonderful collaboration both of them had. But this is at the at the end of a journey that's now spanned almost three decades. So I think the, the impact that they've made, not just in, in popular books, but in academic journals is, you know, it's, it's, it's remarkable and it's refreshing and it's, it's wonderful for us to be able to now read um, what this is like. And I'm sure there was a wonderful friendship behind it as well. And I'm excited to read what Rod is going to say in our special issue when I talk to you about, about the friendship that he had with Jim, um, not just the, the success that they had. It's the last again, so I thought it was appropriate to, to, to look at the scorecard at this point, just to show you. So this is just a collaboration between the two um, and to show you like the remarkable citation count, the, 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 how prolific they were in terms of their output, which is, you know, it's 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 spanning three decades at this point. They have nearly over two thousand six hundred citations just together. That's you know, close in on forty percent of, of of Rod's work. Um, so you know the relationship that both of them had together is, is such an important part of of Jim's work and also such an important part of Rod's. And I think they're an example for so many of us to show how collaboration can be so successful when you get two people that. Um, are prepared to work together like that and are, are so um, effective and so proficient at, at, at producing stuff. And like I said, it's not just in the sports economic literature, it's in, it's in other literature as well. But the, the three standards, as I said, the, the two books and particularly Pay Dirt, which is closing in on a thousand citations. I'm sure we'll, we'll surpass that in the not too distant future. Um, 
I said at the at the outset that the collaboration was ongoing and it is and even though Jim passed away in the summer of 2020 it is ongoing because this is our special issue which Dennis has kindly uh, agreed to, to publish in the Journal of Sports Economics so um, you can see that you know with people like with Roger and Joel um, rehabilitating an early work with James so that paper should um, should should see the light of day in the not too distant future but we also have uh, Rod's uh, academic obituary, um, which, like I said, I'm really excited to read. He talks about Jim as a mentor and a friend, and no doubt he'll he'll give you a much better insight than I have. Um, but it's an insight on the sport of boxing because uh, Jim arguably wrote the first ever paper on boxing with Roger and Joel, and um, so it's something that uh, will continue. Not the collaboration of of Rod and 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 Jim, unfortunately, but it will certainly continue the academic relationship. Um, between the two of them. And I suppose just to finish up, so I'm fortunate, I'm unfortunate I can't be there with you. And I'm sorry I can't be there with you. There's, there's three people under six years of age in this house, which means that traveling any distance is difficult. Um, but we had the fortune of having Rod here in Cork in July 2017. And I think just to, to highlight how wonderful it was to have him because he did a keynote at our, our, our sports economics workshop but also like we call, cold called him we just emailed him out of the blue he didn't know us and how supportive he was to us and I think you know that's one of the, the best characteristics that I could say about him how supportive he is to young academics he didn't know us he was prepared to come to Ireland prepared to talk and we had a great time and now ever since then we've kept in touch and we've worked together and he's just been a, a brilliant influence on our career here many of us here in Cork and um, he didn't have to do that, uh, but he just did. He chose to do it. And just to thank him for that, he, he, in some ways, we're lucky he's here because when he did come to Cork, we had to save him crossing the road five or six times because he was looking the wrong way. Um, and he was almost knocked down five or six times. Uh, but we did manage to, uh, to get him back to you in the US in one piece. Um, and I just want to congratulate him on such a, a wonderful uh, career to date. Uh, I think one of the beauties about academia is that even though people retire, you don't necessarily have to stop doing what you do. And I'm sure, and I hope that he will continue researching long into the future. As a friend of mine in Cork says, it, academia is a little bit like Hotel California that you can check out anytime you want, but you can never leave. Um, and I hope that's the case for, for you, Rod. And I look forward to seeing you, hopefully in the not too distant future, either in Ireland at our ESEA next year, or if not, in the US. So once again, thanks to everybody for listening. Thank you to Stefan for the opportunity to talk. And thank you, Rod, for everything you've done in the field and how you've supported my career to date. <coughs> thank you very much, Robbie, and for, for that. That was uh, very interesting. So um, now we have, finally, for this session, Brian and Matt. I saw you only sent two <laughs> papers for this session, so I get to go way long. You got you, <laughs> and he was Robbie was a, a well under his twenty minutes, so you've got at least twenty five minutes. So <laughs> go for it. Um, if I can just get. Go on and on as long as you want. <laughs> All right, Stefan, again, thanks for organizing this. Uh, this has been great. Uh, Ann Arbor always feels like home to me every time I come back. I'm just going to shoot this real quick. Okay. A uh, big part of that is usually when I come back, I get to go visit Rod and we'll watch football and a couple of beers and things like that. But I started here in Michigan in 2007, serendipitously, the same time Rod got here. Uh, I had a small... Um, fellowship that required me to do some work uh, with a faculty member and Rod said he needed some data collected. Uh, baseball attendance data, this was fall 2017. Um, so I started collecting that as a master's student. Um, and that's when we started working together and we've continued that throughout to now. And that paper is now under review actually. Um, so 15 years later, it's almost there. Um, but this was an incredible place to be for graduate school, uh, particularly as Rod's uh, graduate student. Um, you know, we started here 
and with Steve Salaga and Matt Jurovich and a couple others here. Scott Tasty's not here uh, right now, but he was here before. And it was just such an amazing place to be to learn sports economics. Uh, Jason was here, Rod was here, uh, Mark came in, Stefan came in, and a bunch of us would go to lunch regularly. Um, and mostly at those lunches, I would just listen to Rod and Stefan and, and Jason argue with each other and just sit there and learn stuff uh, about uh, the field. Um, and, and I have to say, one of the most helpful things as a graduate student, uh, having uh, Rod as an advisor, was he told you exactly what he thought about things. Um, so basically, you have to convince him of everything uh, when you have an idea, which makes you think really, really hard about that idea. And so I really appreciated that, and thank you for doing that. Um, and I'm not the only one that has said that. Uh, we talked about your, your talk at University of Florida, um, where I went to work after I was here at uh, Michigan. And the first thing that Chair Mike Sagas to me said about the talk was, well, we had Rod Port down, and he just told us exactly what he thought. Um, and that was a revelation to, to some people in this organization. And so I uh, really appreciated that. And it was a really uh, helpful thing to, to think through those things, to uh, try to convince a skeptic all the time. So this is uh, some joint work with uh, Matt Jurovich, who is back there as well. Uh, this is something we've been working on for a while um, with some data that we got while we were here at, uh, at Michigan. And so I want to start this out by giving a reason for why, why we should care about the things I'm talking about today, because this is one of the big things that Rod always told me, was you need to have a reason and, and a convincing theory for why you would care about doing that thing or wasting your time on that thing, right? Um, and so I bring this out of Hardball uh, from 1999, Ford Park, um, where there's this quote, eliminate the monopoly power of leagues and you transfer power from the insiders owners and players alike to the outsiders, fans, and taxpayers. So a lot of what we all do here is thinking about the market power of sports and sports leagues. And so that's central to the, the things that we do is thinking about who has that power um, and what they can do with that to say exploit players or extract subsidies from the public sector or um, reduce player salaries and things like that. And so that's of course the basis of a lot of what we do. Um, and it's fun comic because baseball is the only sport Um, so I'm going to kind of couch this in the literature on substitution. Um, and so Rod had this paper in 2005, this golden anniversary of Rottenberg, um, where he notes that there was actually a pretty complete demand specification that included substitution in Rottenberg in 1956. And that included um, uh, this key determinant of market power, which is the substitutability between sports. And, and as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, maybe sports with other types of things. Um, so there was this early work on substitution from Jason and Rod and some others uh, looking at the distance between teams and how that impacted uh, market power of individual baseball teams, uh, looking at how fans behave when there's a lockout, do they replace hockey with some other lower level hockey, do they maybe go to basketball, anything like that. And then uh, we have a paper where we look at the breakpoints in the time series of attendance, and we see that rival leagues um, were able to do some substitution. Uh, for the NHL, for example, the WHA, um, a while back, right? Um, there's been a good bit of subsequent work, a lot of it. Um, I worked uh, with Jason on this. Um, and we find lots of weird quirks about why fans behave or how they behave and do the things they do. So uh, Emma Mongin and Jason found that TV fans and attending fans, uh, those markets don't fully overlap and they kind of act differently, right? And so there's some... Uh, multiple market segments here, and there's also just differences in behavior in the way that they react to different characteristics of the game and of sports. Um, and so this has invest, uh, this has implications for talent investments decisions, and depending on the way we want to think about this and the types of policies that are implemented, the, the, those incentives are sort of ambiguous, right? Uh, which means we need to learn more stuff about this substitution behavior and this cross-ownership behavior. Um, so I had some papers with Mark. Um, there where we actually see differences in substitution based on quality versus substituting based on price, uh, depending on if you're substituting within sport or across sport, using some fun cross-border data in Buffalo. Um, some work with Mike Mondell and Scott Tinsky. Um, we actually saw a positive spillover of shared market baseball teams. So if the Yankees are very, very good, the Mets tend to get some benefit from that, their TV ratings go up. Right? So there's some complementary there. 
But if their qualities are too far apart, uh, it actually turns into a substitution. So there's some weird quirks there as well. Um, and so Jason and I have this paper where we say, well, we need to just keep testing this stuff and try to understand this better to describe the quality uh, policy um, to ensure uh, market power is staying in check. All right, so the main point here is it's not always clear what competes within or across markets or how they're competing within and across these sports markets. And so there might be some useful models to think about this. And of course, there may be data out there we can use to try to understand. Um, so I'm going to just quickly run through the theory here. As you can see in the top, uh, it is an empiricist clumsily discusses some theory. Um, so this is not my theory. This is from a paper in Economic Acquiry in 2009 from De Jaeger. Um, but he knows that economists usually describe products as sort of symmetrically substitutable or complementary. Um, but that there was less work regarding these sort of asymmetric substitutes in the relation between products. So he provides actually a pretty simple model in this context for thinking about asymmetric relationships of consumers. Um, in particular, one good being a gross complement for a second, but the second good being a gross complement for the first good. And so he has these little, um, this nice little table in there where we have a strong symmetric substitution where uh, the cross price elasticity of product one with respect to product two is about the same for product two with respect to product one. All right, there's a weak version of that. There's also a weak version of asymmetric uh, substitutability. But then I want to focus on this strong asymmetric uh, substitutability. What you notice here is that the sign of the cross price elasticity of product one, that's X1, with respect to the price of P2, uh, is different from the sign of P2 or product two with respect to price one. All right, so effectively what's happening here is one is serving as a substitute for the other. Well, the other is serving as a complement for, for that one. Right. Um, and the example that he provides here is that there are these two products uh, providing two characteristics, okay? Um, so he uses a cake and icing example. So cake providing more sustenance, right? Uh, icing providing more taste. Some of us eat icing with a spoon out of the carton, um, but a lot of times, right, it's applied to cake. So you're more likely to buy more icing uh, when you buy some cake. Like that. All right, so each of these provide both of those. Both provide sustenance, both provide taste, uh, but they provide each one at different levels. And it's important to note that given goods might fall under this sort of characterization, uh, but he notes that uh, in this theory that divinity is not a necessary condition or, or characteristic of these goods. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to abstract two sport. Um, and we're going to think about C1 or characteristic one as say the absolute talent level or quality of the lead, okay? And then C2 as winning, all right? So two characteristics that we think fans care about, uh, but are slightly different in different ways. And so I've assigned NBA uh, as good one and WNBA <clears throat> as good two. And I'm saying NBA is providing more C1, WNBA is providing more C2. You can flip that around. I have no um, judgment on which of those that would be, right? Um, so both of these provide high quality basketball and winning, at least at some level, um, but they provide them maybe at different rates or, or, or different levels. All right, so that's the main theory part. I'm going to do some hand waving uh, empirically. I'm not going to get into how this determines these um, sort of cross price elasticity issues. Um, and we're going to abstract to the data that we have uh, for this paper. Uh, we don't have prices offered. We only have observed purchases in our data. Um, so we only see what people take as price, um, which kind of complicates the way that we think about prices out there. There's also lots of different prices and there's lots of different seats in the stadium. Um, so um, we also have many $0 purchases. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna oversimplify a bit and I'm gonna move to looking specifically at spending spillover um, and, or substitutions and team quality. Uh, between the NBA and the W. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, so our data, um, and, and Matt and I have been trying to munch through this for a very long time now, um, is this proprietary ticket sales database from a co-owned NBA and WNBA team in the Midwest that uh, needs to be unnamed at this point. Um, we have price and we have the quantity of seats purchased, um, and we have it at the account level. Right? So we know when individuals are buying uh, tickets to the NBA, 
team to the WNBA team, and we can track that across time. Uh, so it can be really useful data. Uh, this is the same data that was used in a previous paper in the Journal of Sport Management. Um, so we have these individual purchases tied to accounts from 2005 to 2009. Uh, we can identify those repeat purchasers from year to year and see how their spending levels change across these two products across time from year to year. Um, the spending is aggregated at the account year level. We have about 207,000 accounts. Um, we have lots of other products in this data. And so about 194,000 made at least one NBA or WNBA purchase during this time. Um, some caveats, we assume $0 purchases prior to the account being initiated in the database. So we have lots of zeros for a given individual. Uh, there's some strange purchases we have to remove from the data. Uh, people might use different accounts, so we may not be able to track everyone all the time. Um, and it contains lots of other events, which is great, uh, but unfortunately that data was not very useful. I had a grad student work for two years trying to do a demand systems model. Brad, you've done some of this stuff. And the data was just too much of a disaster to, to do anything with. Uh, but we have 10 years of lots of different products and we were hoping, had high hopes for that. But. Right. So we're gonna run an RNO over two-step linear dynamic panel estimation. Uh, it's actually just gonna be a really simple regression model with some uh, lag dependent variables used as increments, um, some robust standard errors. And then we have account level fixed effects. We do not have year level effects simply because we had to aggregate at the year level because of some complications. Um, so a very simple version of this, we start out with looking at spending for account I in year T uh, on the NBA team, um, as determined by previous spending habits, uh, plus spending habits on the WNBA team in the previous year. And then we do the same for the WNBA team, looking okay, at previous spending habits for the NBA team and the WNBA team. And then we add um, a very simple version of team quality, which is just lag win percentage. So it's important to note that these leagues don't overlap in their seasons. And so the win percentage for the other league is always lagging the current league in the current season. All right, so for the NBA, for account I and year T, we look at their prior spending habits in the previous year uh, on each of the two products. And then we look at um, the current year win percent for the NBA team and how well the WNBA team did in the previous year and vice versa. So the summer season lags the fall, the fall and winter season like summer, which if you work with data and trying to do time lags and data, this was a huge hassle to keep straight. All right, so very simple regression models. Um, these are the results. I'm actually gonna skip the tables themselves because I have a better visual of what's going on here. Uh, because the actual values of the coefficients are not very interesting, I'm more interested in the direction than statistical significance. So we have our variables here. We have NBA spending last year, win percentage current year, WNBA win percentage current year, spending last year, uh, and so on, right? So what we find is, of course, um, if you spent a lot on the NBA last year, you're likely to spend more than other people on the NBA this year. Nothing very interesting about that. Um, but if you spent a lot on the NBA last year, you're actually also likely to spend more this year. So spending more on the NBA this year, you then spend even more on the WNBA in the following year as well, right? So this is a sort of a spillover from NBA spending in these individual accounts. We also have our NBA win percent leads to NBA spending. Again, that's not anything very interesting, uh, but as the NBA team gets better, uh, we see increased spending on the WNBA team as well, right? So there's spillover effects uh, in a positive direction from the NBA team to this WNBA team, both in spending and in team quality, right? Then we fit this WNBA model, um, looking at these on the right-hand side. And we see that WNBA spending, similar to NBA spending, leads to uh, spending on that sport in the following, or that league in the following year. So not a huge surprise there. Same with win percent, they expect the directions that we see, right? What's interesting and what we're curious about is the crossover here. So I remember NBA spending and quality spilled over positively to WNBA, uh, but we actually find the opposite results for WNBA to NBA. All right, so we actually find that as a WNBA team gets better, spending on the NBA team goes down. Uh, although this is not a statistically significant result, significant at the 10% level, unfortunately. I shouldn't say unfortunately. Um, WA spent, WNBA spending in the previous year actually also 
reduces spending on the NBA in the following year. So what we effectively have here is a sort of asymmetric relationship between the way NBA spills over to WNBA spending versus the way WNBA spending and quality spills over to NBA spending. Right. And again, it's a very simple model, and, and we understand that. Um, this is the most, for the most part, that we can do with this data simply because of, of the structure. Right. And I, we actually fit these models with quantity as well instead of just spending uh, because we have lots of zero dollar prices. Uh, these teams give away a lot of tickets. Um, and we find almost identical results here just using quantities of tickets. Right. So here's all the, the relationships together. All right. So that's the, the main summary here. There seems to be some sort of asymmetric substitution or spillover going on between these two teams. Okay. So why do we care about that? Well, nothing necessarily precludes this sort of asymmetric substitution in sport, right? These are different products with different char characteristics, providing some of the same characteristics with one another. And I think this is the point um, that Stefan and Steve were talking about, arguing about for four hours at your house on Thursday night, about, well, do fans want their team to win in a lower level league or get beat in a higher level league. And so we could think about these two things um, being substitutable, but also complementary in various ways. Um, so this past work has found both substitution or complementarity in line with the Jaeger, and that's the same market TV viewership stuff. Um, we know that different leagues allow consumers to collect different characteristics contributing to their utility as fans. Um, it'd be great if we had better data on prices uh, that would provide more substantive information about cross price effects. And I'm actually talking to uh, a guy named Scott Kaplan, who has a whole bunch of um, stuff up, yeah, stuff up, uh, secondary market ticket prices that I think I'm going to try to talk him into trying to figure something out related to this. Um, so, implications for cross ownership and market power? Well, if some substitution happens, owners might reduce talent investment in one or the other, depending on where they're going to get the maximum profits from. Uh, if some complementarity happens, uh, owners may have some incentive to increase talent investment in one or the other, or both, if they're both complementary. Um, if there's this asymmetric substitution or complementarity, um, then investment might, might focus on a single product that increases profits for both. Right. So if NBA spills over to WNBA, but WNBA takes away from NBA, well, they're going to invest in NBA because that increases both. The WNBA decreases NBA. Right. Um, and then the other big question we have is this NBA, WNBA, and other entertainment options as well. Right. So we know that some sports compete with each other, but we don't have very good estimates of what they compete with in other sorts of products like concerts or um, Disney on ice and things like that. And so that was the original plan with, with this data. Um, but as things are changing, right, uh, we have the age of television and streaming. Um, there was a mention of this where I think Jason mentioned geography doesn't matter like it used to. And so is this a geographic type thing or can we think about this at the league level between say WNBA and NBA um, for fans of teams anywhere? Uh, there's also implications for the recent co-branding of women's and men's NCAA March Madness, right? So if there are these sorts of spillovers, um, then branding these together may or may not provide um, a better option for the women's March Madness than it did before, than just investing directly in its own um, sort of tournament and brand and things like that. Um, I don't know specifically what those implications are, but I think there's important things to think about and how these two viewership of these two tournaments uh, interact with one another, right? And I think this is all worth putting together in a full model of these sort of asymmetric growth substitutes in the sports context. And so Rod, I, I give you some work for retirement uh, in between fishing expeditions because um, that's not really my thing, right? So thank you to everyone here. And of course, thank you, Rod, uh, for everything you've done for the field and for me in particular. And um, hopefully we'll get pictures of you doing some of this in the near future. <laughs> and I kept it before 2000. You did. That and, and before we move on, uh, the 2007 to 2012 cohort of graduate students have a gift for you uh, as well. That's right. Um, and so this is for <coughs> after you catch the big one. Uh, uh, <laughs> 
are, sir. This is from all of us. Straight to my heart. <laughs> we have a 15 minute break now before we continue. So, just a quick break and then we carry on. So, I do like to go I don't know if you need to be located to do that. Are you Bobby? You're used to the song that says.
That's pretty presentations in an hour's section. You only had a very short break there, but since Sip is talking, you can really take another 15 minutes. Yeah, one hour attack, you can do that if you want. So, the great Vic Matson. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I, I'm just really honored to be here. Uh, I will say, let me see. So, I must have met uh, Rod Fort in 2001 at the Westerns. That was my first real conference ever. Uh, and uh, and I, was, I was super intimidated, I'm sure. And uh, and it was great to see like like real people do like real economists do sports econ. That was super cool. And then I actually I, I definitely remember uh, two years later I actually taught sports economics for the first time. I'm looking around for a book. And I'm like, oh, I know that guy. I'm going to use that book. I know that guy. Uh, so wow. I, Wow, I, I know the famous Rod Ford. Um, so uh, obviously the, the research I do, so I've been doing economic impact among other things, for, you know, mainly for the last uh, you know, 20 years. Uh, so not a lot of my research overlaps with Rod's, except uh, obviously, you know, we obviously have talked about sports econ and all these times. And over the last 20 years, uh, I have taken this phrase and, and totally, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've told a reporter uh, the phrase, you know, just take whatever economic impact number they have, move the decimal place one place to the left, and you probably get a pretty good uh, answer. Uh, I know that I didn't make that up. Uh, I don't know who came up with that, but it certainly sounds like something Rod could have originally, uh, originally uh, come up with. And I have wholly borrowed that. Uh, I have wholly borrowed that phrase for my own. Uh, so I'm going to just do a, a one here on the uh, on the economic impact of the All Star Game, just because it was so fun last summer when uh, when the uh, studies came around with uh, with the uh, uh, when the uh, All Star Game got moved. So in any case, we know the we know the All Star Game, right? Uh, used to be a pretty big event, uh, drew lots of TV viewers. Obviously, it's been waning over time, uh, along with a lot of other sports. Uh, you know, now that we have a lot of different viewing options, but it's been held every year since 1933. Um, historically, again, wildly popular, 35 million viewer TV viewers would have been a huge uh, TV event back in the day. Uh, rotates every year, so this is something you get to choose. Uh, often they feature, uh, feature cities with new stadiums, so this is one of those kind of carrots, right, that, uh, that people have. Um, and the game generally always sells out, so it's a, it's a fun event, obviously, and then it, it does receive some national tourism because, you know, we do have people come and say, hey, I want to go to the All-Star Game. So I want to see all my great stars all in one place at one time. And so uh, this is potentially a big, uh, a, a big potential economic, uh, economic impact uh, for the uh, local economy. So, uh, well, you know what I'm going to say eventually here, right? But potential. Okay. Major League Baseball in Atlanta, Turner Field opened up in 1996 as part of the Summer Olympic Games here. And by 2013, uh, the Atlanta Braves announced plans to move out of that stadium. Uh, ironically, they wanted to move out of Turner Field because the neighborhood that Turner Field uh, was in, uh, despite the stadium being there for 20 years, was a bad neighborhood, and they didn't like the neighborhood they were in, and they were and they convinced Cobb County to build a new stadium because if you build a new stadium, the entire area around the stadium will uh, will be and will be revived economically. Again, while wanting to move out of their old neighborhood because the, uh, the neighborhood around it is too bad economically. But uh, they do end up doing that. The, uh, they do move out. Uh, the joke doesn't work anymore because she's too old now. But when they moved out of this uh, here, uh, the stadium was younger than Miley Cyrus uh, when, uh, when they actually moved out. Uh, so they're going to have, they're now in Truist Field. Open in 2017. Again, big public subsidy in there. Um, and because it's a new stadium in 1919, uh, in 2019, Major League Baseball awards the All-Star Game to Truist Field, again, trying to feature all their new stadiums here. Uh, this is a short, uh, a short distance here. Uh, the fact that it takes 26 minutes, I think, uh, if we have like J.C. Bradbury here, who's 
a native of Atlanta said, there's no way that takes 26 minutes in most Atlanta traffic, but uh, maybe. Uh, so in any case, they spent about $600 million moving that stadium 15 miles. So what's the fun part of this, uh, this story, right? Is the all-star game con uh, controversy we all know the politics, right? Uh, we get a couple of Democratic senators being elected in, 19, in, in 2020. So reliably Republican Georgia moves uh, blue or purple and obviously gets control of the Senate <coughs> to the Democrats here. Uh, immediately after that happens, the Republican legislature then in Georgia enacts all sorts of uh, voting restrictions uh, designed to reduce the power of, uh, of Democratic constituencies in Georgia, in particularly uh, uh, has a, 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 a uh, pieces in there that is going to uh, that is designed to suppress uh, African American vote, and because of this, we have an outrage uh, from uh, folks nationally as well as the Major League Baseball players who uh, who say, "Look, this is bad policy that is discriminatory on the part of Georgia, and we should uh, move the All Star Game out of Georgia because of this." And and uh, subsequently on April uh, April second, so about a year ago today. They did, in fact, rescind the offer, move the game instead to Denver, and uh, and this sparks gigantic national uh, national headlines all over the place. So, what's interesting about this particular economic impact statement that we're going to talk about is not that it's any different than all the ones that we usually see, but what's different about it is it's featured on everyone. Your sanity. It's in this is CNN. Uh, the, this is uh, Fox News. This is uh, this is uh, uh, woke Major League Baseball. Here's Fox. And so I mean, this is again, you know, uh, gets this is a this is a bad economic impact statement that gets a huge amount of national publicity. Uh, one of the kind of really fun things here is that hundred million dollar economic impact statement that they came up with at their press conference on Friday night. They did not have an economic impact statement. The next press conference on Saturday the morning, they had an economic impact statement. So this tells you <laughs> the level of, of, of care uh, done in this. So again, let's see how big that economic uh, piece is. So we all know the problems here. So mythical economic impact statements are nothing new. Actually, the 100 million isn't wildly out of tune with uh, dozens of other stories from, uh, from past All-Star Games. Uh, and Colorado said, oh, yeah, 100 million, it's 190 million it's going to generate in Denver. And I, as economists, would say, oh, great, so moving it, we've just generated $90 million of benefit to the country. Uh, we should do this all the time, apparently. Uh, again, what's usual about the unusual about this is the level of national attention. Uh, so, of course, we know the issues with, uh, with economic impact. There's a substitution effect. So people who are locals who go to the game are just spending the money at the game rather than elsewhere. Uh, we have tons of examples of this. Uh, I'm not proud to uh, be a resident of a city that's just built the most expensive minor league baseball stadium in U.S. history with a huge amount of uh, local subsidy. But again, the uh, shops in the area close down when there's uh, when there is uh, uh, games in town, of course, uh, because of the substitution effect and the crowding out. Uh, congestion associated with major events. Again, fun one here. The Winter Olympics were really good for skier visits. In Colorado, as people avoided Utah and went to Colorado instead, uh, London shows closing down during the 2016 Olympics. Again, other examples of this. And of course, leakages, you know, money you spend on a Major League Baseball ticket doesn't stick in, in, uh, in Atlanta, it goes home to uh, Major League Baseball. Past studies, uh, body and math. So, so we looked at things, uh, this is annual data, uh, but uh, Rob Body and I looked at this. This is actually the paper I was presenting back in 2001, the first time I met, uh, I met Rod. Uh, and we found that, uh, that uh, all-star games are associated with lower than expected employment. We also looked at some, some taxable sales at the time. We found the same thing. Uh, Coates and Depkin uh, also uh, looked at uh, taxable sales and they found that taxable sales were actually lower uh, when, uh, when cities hosted the uh, all-star game. Uh, we're gonna use some daily hotel data. Uh, it's pretty rare. Uh, you know, those early economic impact study papers by, by myself and Brad and, and uh, Dennis uh, use some annual data. That's kind of looking for the needle in the haystack as we, if we can make the haystack smaller, right? Uh, better chance of finding that same needle. So we actually have some daily data. Uh, not very often you actually see that. So that's fun. Um, and all the previous examples uh, in, in the past literature of the, uh, the Austria game were statistically insignificant. But it also were, you know, there's a pretty big confidence interval around those estimates as well. So again, even a $100 million event, which I don't believe the All-Star Game is, still would only be 0.03% of Atlanta's economy. 
if you can find 0.03% in an econometric study, you're doing pretty well. Uh, so what can we find this? Uh, and the other good thing is, you know, if uh, we look at hotel data, we're specifically targeting hotel, uh, you know, visitor spending rather than hotels. So what do we got? We have two, uh, we have two cities. We have Cleveland and we have Minneapolis. There's some general things about how, what the uh, market looks like in uh, Cleveland. That's what the market looks like in Minneapolis, about 10 to 15,000 hotel rooms, uh, either within two miles or 10 miles. Why Cleveland and Minneapolis? Because we happen to have that data and no other reason, right? Uh, we were looking at these for totally other things when all of a sudden this exploded. And we said, hey, what do we got that we can take a look at quickly? And these are our two. Um, and again, uh, about 30,000 hotel rooms in Minneapolis, about 10,000 in Cleveland. And what happens? So we use it just a couple models of seeing, do we see any bump in, uh, in the number of people going to hotels, how much they're spending on hotels and the total amount of hotel revenue. Um, and we have, we can look in small ring around the city, big ring around the city. Um, I'll just point out this. Uh, so uh, 10 miles from Progressive Field, we do get some, we do get some clear hotel rooms uh, being sold. We have hotel room prices going up during the uh, All-Star game and total revenue going up. And this is a, this is a log revenue model. So you might even get, be getting double your regular hotel revenue. So this is a real economic impact from having the event. We see the same thing at Target Field here, um, you know, 60% <coughs> increase in total hotel revenue, bunch of new visitors. Say, wow, these really are big events for the local economies that host them. Uh, we do some other things too, because I'm, I'm writing this with Rob Bauman. He's a econometrician and he, he doesn't like to take the Civic out, right? He wants, or the Toyota Corolla, he wants to take the Ferrari out. So we've got nine different models because it would be boring just to do OLS with him. Uh, but they all tell us the, basically the same story. But how big are these numbers? <laughs> uh, total hotel revenue up by two to $4 million. Really hard to get to $100 million if you are spending an extra $4 million on hotels. How many increased hotel room days? About 10,000 in Minneapolis. So that's nice. Still really hard to get to $100 million uh, with any sort of things, unless everyone is spending about $10,000 a day when they're visiting the All Star team. Uh, back of the envelope. Uh, a couple of different ways. Hotel expenditures are about 45% of your local spending on a given at, on any given trip. Uh, or daily spending is about $121 a day. You do all those sort of things. Uh, by the hotel method, you get about nine million. So the biggest of all those, you get as much as uh, $10 million of total economic spending. And this is the end of it, right? Uh, if, the, if the, you're claiming $100 million, and your best guess is $10 million, what do you got? <laughs> Move the decimal place, so Matheson rule, but again, I, I only have a claim the Matheson rule name. It very well could be the Rod Ford rule. It could be the Brad Humphreys rule, the Dennis Coates rule. I'm not quite sure who, again, originally coined the term, but the Matheson rule strikes again. Uh, some caveats there, you know, we're not getting all the economic impact here. They're, you know, we're missing some day trippers. Uh, VRBO and Airbnb in some of these, but again, uh, again, it's really hard to get from 10 million to 100 million just because you miss a few pieces on the side. And did I make it in under my 15 minutes? You do. You've got two and a half minutes to rattle on about anything. You anything. Want to say. Okay, so let me tell you a few things about stuff. No. <laughs> again, uh, again, happy retirement, and uh, again, I'm, I'm just. I'm just honored to be part of this, and uh, I think I think it's great. Uh, I will tell you this one story. So, so uh, I tell my kids, uh, you're, I'm going to D Detroit, uh, going to Ann Arbor this weekend. I'm like, where are you going to Ann Arbor? And it's because the great Rod Ford is retiring. We're going to a, a celebration of for the retirement. I'm like, well, that's great. So, what does the retire? What does this celebration entail? An entire day of economics lectures. <laughs> oh man, I just hope I never become an economist. Is what they said. So uh, yeah, leave it to the economist to celebrate by by doing a whole day of uh, economics lectures. But uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of it. So thank you. Well, economic sectors and your talk. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Semi economic sectors. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, Stefan, for your retirement, I'm just putting picture after picture of English soccer failures. And uh, <laughs> when was the Olympics in London? Uh, 2016, right? Did I miss it? 2012? 2012. 2012. Did I have the wrong one? <laughs> it's not in America, right? It's off by four years in the... Yeah, but at the, after the exchange rate, that turns out to be 2012. So, you yeah. <laughs> know. Statistically significant error. Insignificant error. Brad is the only person who's taken this seriously by dressing, and that is duly noted, which I thought were Michigan colors, but apparently he says it's something else. I'm not sure. Please enlighten. Old, old, old gold. Old gold. Not paint. <laughs> That's the key difference. Okay, so uh, as I've been sitting here today uh, for these presentations, a phrase has, has run through my mind that uh, many times that, that uh, Newton tells me is probably inappropriately attributed to Newton. The phrase is, I can see so far because I stand on the shoulders of giants. And I think that all of us in this room would agree that Rod is uh, foremost among the giants on, on whose shoulders that we stand now and do the work that we do. And I'm, uh, I'm just deeply honored to be able to come and, and participate in this celebration of Rod's group. And you know, as I look around also and I see many of Rod's students, colleagues, collaborators, uh, I'm also honored to be, have been invited because I'm none of those. And in fact, uh, in many, many cases, uh, Rod and I seem to wind up on the opposite side of issues. Uh, as recently as the St. Louis Rams versus the city and county of St. Louis uh, court case where we were dueling experts on probably working for the city and I was working for the team, that was last fall. We sort of come down on different sides of, uh, of how to think about in economic terms, uh, outcome uncertainty. and uh, and how to think about decisions made by uh, administrators in NCAA athletic departments. But still, Rod's work has been very influential in my thinking about these issues. So what I'm going to focus on here is Rod's recent work on uh, intercollegiate athletics. And he's certainly written extensively on the economics of intercollegiate athletics. And uh, it's really, it has informed my thinking about, uh, about this, this idea. So a couple of recent papers of Rod's formalizes this idea, which I think is, is powerful, that amateurism economics, in, in economic terms, in big time college sports, really represents an implicit subsidy from athletes to university administrators. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a really good way to think about decisions that get made in this context. I'll have a little bit more to say about that in a minute, but uh, I, to preview that, I do think that uh, Rod makes a, an implicit assumption in, in this, that if we're gonna try to measure the size of this subsidy, we need a counterfactual. And we would need the counterfactual of what compensation would go to college athletes absent any of these amateurism regulations. So I'm gonna think about that. Um, and Rod's recent work also emphasizes the role that, that's played by intercollegiate athletics and it needs to be placed in the context of sort of a public choice model and that these university administrators who are making important decisions face a lot of constraints that aren't necessarily related to factors like success of the programs or attendance at the stadium or things like that. They, they face uh, public economic uh, pressures from other groups. And I think that still deserves to be tested. Uh, hopefully by the time the best thrift chapters are done, I can have that done a little bit more basic analysis here. But so anyway, the idea is that Jane and I, and Jane and I have certainly done a lot of work on, uh, on intercollegiate athletics and, and, and how decisions get made there. This is an empirical analysis of, of two key concepts that are, I think, uh, well articulated in these recent papers by Rod. The one in the Journal of Intercollegiate Sport and this paper that's listing is forthcoming. Rod hasn't resubmitted it yet. And the Economics and Governance Special Issue that I'm currently <laughs> cast editing. <laughs> Yes, you know where I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't have said that before you uh, <laughs> submit your revision. So just a, a, a brief idea here about a sketch of, of, uh, of 
what's in uh, this budgetary model that Rod thinks about. Total copper cost of operating of an athletically athletic program. Uh, C is total cost, and it's just payment to athletes, and it's payment to A, and payment to mobile resources like coaches and athletic directors, which is M, and then just a sort of catch-all term for everything else uh, that is involved in operating a sports program. So amateurism, briefly, is it's just a simple idea that there's a transfer T, which is just some fraction of A, the compensation to, uh, to college athletes. And where I think the counterfactual comes in is, again, what we need to know is how big would A be if all of these uh, restrictions, amateurism restrictions, were removed. And so obviously, if one way to go with that is, well, athletes would be completely professionalized. Then. They would be compensated just like professional athletes are. And that's, I'm going to try to place some uh, bounds some information about what the size of this implicit transfer might be, because it is, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, um, it's budgetary funds that are freed up because university administrators don't have to compensate college athletes at the same level as pro athletes. And Rod also emphasizes, interestingly, and I think correctly, that the size of this alpha has certainly varied over the history of the NCAA as the, as the uh, enforce different amateurism restrictions. And then the other key concept that, that Rod develops in his model is this idea that there's institutional support from sports. That is, uh, in the case where um, the cost of operating <coughs> the intercollegiate athletic program exceeds the revenues generated by, by the sports programs, that central administration has to, has to pass money through to the, to the athletic department as a form of, of institutional subsidy. So, and I, I believe that in Rod's model, it also ultimately predicts that there should be some sort of trade-off between the size of this transfer and the institutional support that's, that's coming from central administration uh, to operate unprofitable, I hate to use that term, but uh, sports programs where uh, the total cost of operating the sports uh, is greater than, the, less than, sorry, greater than the revenues. Okay, so a lot of sources of, uh, of data on intercollegiate athletic programs. I'm just gonna use the, the total uh, athletic department level data from uh, the Equity and Athletics Dis Disclosure Act, EA, EA. And I'm just gonna focus on the power, what the so-called Power Five conferences plus Notre Dame and BYU over the period of 2010 to 2020. So in the EADA data, um, institutional support, support is just called unallocated revenues. Because again, as Roger points out, uh, athletic departments see that transfer coming from central administration is just another source of revenue, just like selling tickets, right? And there is, this is one nice feature of the EADA data, uh, they do identify at the total athletic department level uh, unallocated revenues. So this counterfactual, um, how are we gonna do that? To the EADA contains data on total revenues, you can back out and subtract off the unallocated revenues from that and come up with the revenues that are generated by sports teams. If you look at the CBAs for the NBA, the WNBA, the NFL, the rough, roughly 50% of generated revenues from sports leagues are going to athletes, you know, CBAs. 49%, 51%, something like that. But so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna assume, okay, well, I'm gonna make two heroic assumptions. One is that if we were able to create this uh, counterfactual where all amateurism rules were reduced or eliminated, that total revenues earned by sports, college sports teams would be unchanged. It, I don't know, probably not, but, but as, a, as a first approximation, uh, it's not a journal article. I'm gonna get. I'm gonna let myself get away with it. Um, <clears throat> so that means that the key, the, the counterfactual here, that is compensation to total compensation to athletes under no amateurism would just be half of, of total generated revenues from sports programs. Um, and then we can just figure out what the total transfer to the university is uh, from the university would just be sorry, the total transfer to the university administrators is just this gap that, that's basically alpha, but it's a difference between 
uh, spending under um, no amateurism and observe spending on student athletes. So those are the two things I want to develop some stylized facts about. First, what's the size of this estimated annual transfer uh, from athletes to university administrators? So here's the distribution, the kernel density distribution of that. The red line's there at the average. It averages about $25 million a year. Now remember, that's that slush that's going to university administrators that would have otherwise gone into the pockets of, uh, of athletes. And as we all know about the composition of uh, college athletics, there's some pretty striking um, inequalities that implies when uh, uh, we think about who college athletes are. So it works out okay. It's, it, it seems to be a decent assumption, the one that I've, that I've made, in that uh, there's just one program year cell where that value is zero, where all of the, uh, all of the um, compensation to athletes, there was no uh, transfer. And that's Wake Forest in one year of the sample. If you just look at what are the, what are the, the six smallest college, uh, smallest transfers in the, in the sample, Wake Forest, Boston College, Northwestern, Stanford, Maryland, Kansas. Private schools clearly have something to do with that because it, tuition is part of this compensation that's counted the EADA. And you know, Stanford's going to charge a lot more tuition than West Virginia. And if you look at the six largest uh, transfers, I'd say it's the who I expected, the usual subjects, Florida, Ohio State, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Texas. And those are the big uh, revenue generating football programs in there, but then extracting the biggest uh, transfers out there. This is the distribution of this institutional support variable. It's, it's, uh, it's again, a public choice, uh, choice variable for university administrators. It doesn't have that, that big right tail that um, a transfer variable does, averages about 27 million per year. The smallest transfer, Syracuse, Duke, Michigan State, TCU, Vanderbilt, Utah, the six largest, UCLA, Iowa, Kentucky, Stanford, Ohio State, Kansas. Don't know what to make of that. That's not sort of the, uh, not, not sort of the uh, route that I, I expected to see, but you know, that's what, so 27 million a year there. I'm, now I'm gonna finally just investigate the idea that there's a trade-off going on here between those two variables. And uh, I've got some summary stats out of each one. So I'm just going to estimate a two-way fixed effects model with some conference dummies in it, um, where the dependent variable is the institutional transfer at uh, school S in conference C in year T. We've got uh, school C's in conference fixed effects, and then the size of the transfer and some control variables uh, in, the, in the equation. So column one is just OLS. Uh, and I just put that up there. So that I show that this, I'm not estimating some sort of budgetary identity that I might've created by estimating revenues. And I, so in, in just the, the vanilla OLS estimates, there's no relationship between these teams. When we include the, the season team and conference fixed effects, there it is basically a one-to-one -one, uh, trade-off between the institutional support and, and the transfer that's coming out of student athletes. And then when I, also control some, add some controls that should help to explain uh, variation, school-specific variation in the size of that transfer and also in the, uh, in the, in the uh, institutional support, we still get this pretty clean relationship of, a, as the model predicts, a one-to-one -one trade-off between transfers from athletes to administrators and the, the uh, subsidy that comes from central administration. So those are pretty big estimates of those transfers. Uh, I don't think anybody else has come up with, with a, an estimate using this approach of how big those transfers are. Uh, that ought to give us some pause. Of course, some caveats need to apply here. The estimates look reasonable. I don't have any sort of causal inference uh, method that I'm using here. It's subject to the usual prop problem with two-way fixed effects of being able to deliver, deliver anything plausibly causal, but it's an association and it's a, it's a conditional association. Uh, the predictions of Rod's models that he's been working on recently in the last couple of years uh, are certainly con confirmed that there's this one-to-one -one trade off, which also provides us some additional uh, important insight, I think, into the, in the institutional context through which uh, intercollegiate athletic funding takes place. 
still to do. I'm going to try to, we're going to try to analyze the political economy aspects of that institutional subsidy. Thank you, Brad. Um, <coughs> our penultimate presentation today. Well, oh, prior to the main event, of course. Will be. Oh, that's the sweetest hat. Yes. Will be right here. Still on the ground. That's right. So I think you managed to understand this plan actually. Oh, I hear you. I just hope they're so first of all, for anyone that doesn't know me, uh, I'm a uh, soon to be graduate of uh, the PhD program in sport management here at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm really happy to be with you all here today to uh, celebrate Rod and his, uh, his contributions to their sport economics. Rod has, uh, the past five years, been a member of my administration committee. It's been really helpful to me along the process. Um, it's been great just getting advice, feedback. Um, you know, I've really been able to pick his brain while I'm um, doing my program at the so I'm definitely appreciative of that. Uh, so today I'm going to make use of uh, some of those contributions in this talk, which is sort of a quantile regression approach to all of us are created equal. So um, just now on what we'll be going through today, um, I'll start out by talking at a high level of some of the previous salary research that's been done in Major League Baseball. And I'll get into a couple of Rod's contributions, in which we'll um, kind of be building off of in this paper in the study here. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the previous Moneyball research that's been done as well. Um, so this study really revolves around the whole Moneyball story um, in baseball, so I'll talk about that at a high level. <coughs> and then I'll briefly discuss a paper that I've actually written with uh, Stephen Chmansky, my advisor, um, titled All, All Runs Are Created Equal, which we've helped to kind of build upon um, some of the previous Moneyball work that's been done in the past. I'll then get into the purpose and our approach and show how we're going to be integrating in some of uh, Rod's prior contributions into, into this study here. And then just wrap up with uh, some results and conclusions based on our findings. So, previous salary research in baseball, um, Scully in 1974, one of the more well known papers in all sport, Econ, identified the relationship between batting performance and wins and wins and team revenue in baseball. And then used, um, used this approach to estimate the marginal revenue product for players and measure the extent of monopsonist exploitation um, for players under a reserve clause. Now, there have been several game performance studies in, in baseball since this. Um, I've listed a few of them here, but I want to want to highlight a couple of thoughts uh, contributions to, to this area of game performance and salary determination. Um, so first of all, in 1992, um, uh, Ford integrates several other variables into the salary determination process in addition to performance measures. But many of these variables had not really been accounted for in, uh, in the previous research at the time. Um, these include age and age squared terms for old and young players, experience residuals when they progress on age, dummy variables for rookies, hopefuls, no last season, future and bargaining status. And then uh, more recently, uh, Fort Leonardo has three marginal revenue products and uh, monopsony exploitation rates for players using a uh, quantile estimation approach uh, to allow marginal revenue products to vary by team revenue. So previous work on um, some you know, related work on this has Primarily used OLS models, which don't really allow for this variation in team revenue, which uh, this paper by Ford you know, allows for using the quantile estimation. So, um, a subset, a subset of this um, game performance work in, in baseball revolves around the Moneyball story in baseball. So, um, in 2003, the book Moneyball, Michael Lewis claimed that certain skills and stats, I and mean, maybe walks on base percentage being underbound in the baseball labor market based on what these contribute to team success of uh, particular years prior to Moneyball's publication. And uh, the Moneyball story then gener generated several economics papers that tested two primary questions. First, was on base percentage being undervalued prior to the publication of the book? And secondly, if it was being undervalued, its valuation increased um, after the publication of the book. 
Now, Hicks and Sauer were really the first ones to look at this empirically and provide evidence that the answer to those both questions was yes. Um, however, there have been some subsequent follow-up studies that provide some mixed evidence, some which I've never listed here. Now, in these, in these previous studies, there have been two primary metrics that have been used um, for player productivity measures um, in, the, in the previous research, or metrics that are very closely related to these measures. First one is on base percentage, and the second one is slugging percentage. Now, on base percentage is thought to be a measure of players' ability to get on base via hit walk or hit by pitch. A sudden percentage is thought to be a measure for players' ability to hit for power because we see the more valuable outcomes are weighted more in sudden percentage, whereas they're not in on base percentage. However, one, one kind of issue with, with both, both of these is that both metrics are ad hoc in nature and that they don't explicitly relate to team output in the form of runs. So, for example, just by looking at on base percentage or sudden percentage, uh, that doesn't tell us really anything about the number of runs a player helps to generate for his team over the course of a season or over, over the course of a given time period. And uh, given that the, the, the goal of batters in baseball is to contribute to the run scoring process of their teams, it's a pretty important component of performance evaluation and player productivity that's not really accounted for uh, correctly in either of these metrics. So this is where this paper that Steph and I have written comes in. And what we do is we utilize a run expectancy run value approach to measure a player's contributions to the run scoring process of this team. Now, this approach is really popular in the baseball analytics community, but had yet to really be integrated into the, the sport and kind of academic uh, literature of um, sport or to this point. Um, this approach allows us to allocate the number of runs a player helped to generate for his team during the season to each of his batting events. And then um, using an F test for coefficient equality within our salary regression, we don't find significant differences in the returns to run values for walks, singles, and home runs uh, for the seasons. Uh, 1997 to 2016. And it's a true when looking at the pre and post party ball years separately. So the implication here is that teams were actually paying players appropriately for their run values, and they weren't paying them any differently based on how those runs were generated, which kind of contradicts the, the underlying narrative of money ball that there was this uh, inefficient market for walks um, prior to the publication of money ball, or, or um, that there was some sort of big market correction that took place afterwards. Um, our, our, pre, our results from our, our first paper kind of contradict those, uh, those ideas. So the purpose for, for this study here, um, despite this previous work on the money ball hypothesis, analysis hasn't really been completed for different levels of the salary distribution. So um, what, what I want to do here is I want to fill this gap and follow the approach of what you know. Um, and the objective is, is to test whether all runs are created for results continue to hold for different quantiles of the salary distribution. So a little bit of background here on, on uh, run expectancy and run value before I get into it. Um, so in any given season, there's around 200,000 events that occur in baseball. And from this, we can calculate the average number of runs scored from every, any given state to the end of the half inning, where the states are defined by the number of runners on base and the number of outs in the ring. And you can see from the table, run expectancy is going to be higher when there's more runners on base and fewer outs in the unit. So, um, for example, the table on the right, uh, the, the rows represent our base states. So, zero, zero, zero means there's no runners on base. One, zero, zero means there's a run at first base, nobody at second and third base, and so on until we covered all possible base state combinations. And on the columns, we have the outs, zero, one, or two outs in the unit. What we do is we populate each one of these cells um, with the average number of runs scored. Um, from each, from each given state to the other half inning, um, aggregate over all, all teams across the season. And that's what we essentially call our run expectancy for, for specific events or specific states in baseball. Now, ultimately, ultimately with run expectancies, what we calculate, what we, what we use to calculate is run values, um, which is equal to the number of runs scored during the event plus run expectancy after the event minus the run expectancy before the event. And um, intuitively, the way you can think about it is every single time a player comes up to the plate in baseball, there's a certain run expectancy associated with that situation based on whatever state the game is in. What we want to measure with run value is we want to measure um, what does a player contribute to his team above or below that expectancy. And that difference is essentially what we credit to the batter in the form of run value. So we can use it to, to measure the contributions of individual players to the run scoring process on the first team. We can also use it to, to measure, um, to get an idea of uh, how valuable specific outcomes or events are in baseball. 
Um, so what we've done here in 1996 to 2016, we've taken the average run value by event um, by for six from six million batting outcomes in baseball um, across the season. And we can see the bottom thing, look at the mean, we can uh, get a sense of exactly on average um, what each of these contributes to the run scoring process over the time frame. And we see the standard deviation is quite low for each of these as well, um, below 0.03 runs in every single case. So the average contributions of each of these to the run scoring process has remained very stable over this time frame as well. So getting into the, the approach of our original paper, um, so we, we start out by proposing the follow, following OLS model to conduct our test for efficiency. Where dependent variable is a natural log of their salary indexed to the average by season. Independent variables include the run values for the season aggregated by outcome. And then also the following independent variables, uh, coefficient of variation for the players' play appearances over the last three seasons, age and age squared, and then fixed effects for team and player position. Um, we regress salary on players' previous season's batting stats, so we have a causal link from um, performance and compensation. But well, since we do have repeat observations in our data, we, we also cluster standards by player. Um, now, we focus primarily on free agent players because um, we know that private free agency uh, players tend to be exploited by, by teams um, in the market. So we focus on free agent players where um, we really have a more of a competitive market to, to focus on. Um, we run salary regression for all player seasons with at least 130 plate appearances over the time frame 1997 to 2016. We exclude salaries in the year 2004, though, because this is the year that uh, confounds pre money ball stats with post money ball salary. And then we run separate regressions for the pre and post money ball eras to determine if any changes in labor market efficiency occur after the money is published. Now, all regressions are run separately, um, or all regressions are going to be run using two approaches to calculate run value separately. First one is the season weights approach, where we calculate the average value of an event across all events. And then multiply the batter's season totals in each category by the average event value. Or secondly, what we call player weights approach, where we calculate some of the values of the batter's events in each category across the season. And then we run F tests for coefficient equality for the run values of walks, singles, and home runs um, with age regression and their tests for market efficiency. So that's the approach we use in our original paper. And we're going to follow um, here basically the same approach, but rather than using our OLS model um, to, to test for efficiency. We're going to replace that with a quantile regression model. Um, we're, going to, we're going to be connect our tests for efficiency um, using a quantile regression at 0.25, 0.5, and 0.75 quantiles player salary in our data. And uh, we'll see if our, our test for efficiency continues to hold for these different levels of the salary distribution. So I just selected the, the run value coefficients to display here. But um, the, the first two columns are for the 0.25 quantile, the middle two are the 0.5, last two are the 0.75. Um, this is for all seasons in our, in our data. Um, and we see at the bottom, our F test for coefficient equality is insignificant at 5% level in every single case. So what this tells us is that, again, teams are paying players according to what their run values are, and they aren't paying them any differently based on how those runs are generated. Consistent with what we observed in our initial paper, um, but now we find this to be true across the different levels of the, of the salary distribution here. Looking at the pre-money ball era now, um, we take a look at our F test as well, and we see once again our F test is insignificant in every single case here. Um, so the, the main implication here is that we don't really find evidence of walks really being unbound in the labor market compared to singles and home runs. Um, it appears that uh, the market actually operated very efficiently um, in the pre-money ball period in regards to compensating players for their run values. Um, again, consistent with what we observed in our initial paper, um, and we find this not to be true across different levels of the salary distribution. And in the post money ball era, once again, we find that our F test is insignificant in every single case here in our quantile regression approach. So we find uh, an insignificant F test in every single case here, all seasons in the pre and post money ball eras. Um, over this entire time frame, it does appear that teams were paying players appropriately according to what the run values were, um, and they weren't paying them differently based on how those runs were generated. Consistent with what we expect to see in the efficient market. And, um, and now we see this to be true across different levels of the salary distribution. So, this approach allows us to really conduct this test for efficiency at these different levels of the salary distribution, which is something that hasn't really been done yet in the previous Moneyball research. And we find that the original results of our, our study are robust in this quantile regression approach. 
Um, teams continue to pay players appropriately for their run values based on the 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.75 quantiles of the salary distribution. And this is true once again for the pre and post money ball arrows. So this really confirms our, our initial conclusions for our paper that efficient market, market um, largely exists in both before and after the publication of Moneyball, as teams are paying a compensating players appropriately um, for their run value contributions and aren't paying them any differently based on how those runs are generated. So um, we do definitely contradict um, a lot of the narratives um, underlying Moneyball with studies and this, this follow-up study just further uh, confirms that um, when we look taking into account the different, different quantities of the salary distribution. So um, that's about all I have today. Um, once again, I uh, just want to say, say congratulations to you, Rod, uh, on, a, on, a, on a great career. Thanks for all your, your help over the past five years and uh, wish you a, a really long, happy, and healthy retirement. So that's uh, Brian, so it's our last speaker before the main event. Before the main event. That's the the most recently minted PhD <laughs> student <laughs> committee. <laughs> well, I don't want to, you know, I'm just saying he's the most recent. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. That's you, right? This one, I said it's so much. Very glad to be here to, to celebrate Rod's retirement. Uh, I've actually known Rod since before he was famous, so I'm probably <laughs> a minority in this room. Uh, first met Rod in 1988. That's when I started my PhD at, at Washington State. I think Rod had probably only been there a year, a couple of years before that. So he was a very uh, new young faculty member, and I was a, a young PhD student, so, so time has passed. But uh, I actually, uh, I think like many people back in that, I did not do uh, a sport dissertation. I well, was my chair, but it was actually a public choice uh, dissertation, uh, legislator shirking, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I knew that Rod had uh, started doing quite a bit of stuff in sport. Uh, I, have a, I have a recollection. I was, uh, uh, it was 1989, actually, and I know the year because it was the year that the NHLPA first publicly released its salary data. I was in an econometrics class, it wasn't raw, but it was in an, an econometrics class at WSU. I had this new data set, said, oh, this is great. Something I really love, let's see what we can do. Wrote the paper for the class. Uh, and they showed up to Rod after and said, you know, I know you're doing some sports stuff. Uh, appreciate any comments. So I don't know, a week or two passed, um, went back to his office, Got to be everything was uh, on paper those days, kind of flipped to the back. And in red at the bottom of the page was, uh, this is much ado about nothing. <laughs> this, is, this speaks to Brian's comments about Rod being very direct. <laughs> wow. there, there, was, there was a glimmer of hope. This is much ado about nothing, dot, 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 so far. So I said, okay, well, at least he likes something. So, but I, I've always appreciated Rod's direction, clarity, and I think it, it, it really made it much easier for me to know where things were at. And, and again, a lot of what I learned from Rod in those early years has stuck with me my full career. Uh, I'll try to keep the presentation part short. I know we went a little bit of a break but before the main event, uh, but this gets back, my presentation gets back to uh, Pater. And Pater come out, uh, actually, I guess a year or two after I was at WSU. And uh, you can see the title of my presentation, The Great Football Wars, The Forgotten Combatant. So this is kind of a takeoff on uh, chapter nine of that book, which is the last chapter, Rival Leagues, The Great Football Wars. Okay? 
So, um, there's a couple of quotes. Uh, kind of generic right now, but I just want to get to think about this. So, uh, New York Giants owner, I won't say who, because that's going to kind of give away the story here off the top. New York Giants owner, uh, I'm losing three of his star players to the rival league. You can see the quote there. I'll read it anyway. Uh, we have to do something about it. We have to teach them a lesson. I think I know how to do it. Let's go after the best they have. Let's turn the tide on them. Okay? You're thinking, I don't know, USFL, World Football League. And uh, another quote here by the NFL commissioner on the rating of NFL players by the rival league who said, the war is on. So the question is, what are we talking about? And surprise, surprise, <laughs> it's the uh, Canadian Football League. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the era was the mid to late 1950s. So that was a Wellington mayor, the Giants owner, Burt Bell, the NFL commissioner at the time. And this really, uh, I guess in my mind, sort of, sort of the forgotten combatant, it was very brief. Um, but it was very significant. Let's go to this slide first, the rival league timeline. So, you know, and I, as someone that kind of grew up, what I saw is it, when I was young, kind of the golden era of rival leagues in the 70s and the WHA, and the ABA and uh, World Football League, uh, Pater kind of spoke to me in that sense, like this, this is great stuff. Finally, there's a context, an economic context to put this uh, that makes some sense. And I, I guess throughout my career, you know, I always kind of thought later, the rival leagues dried up, you know, and I think we probably know the reasons for that. But for me, this, this was as a, as a fan growing up, this was a fun era, but it also for me as an economist sort of raised questions as to why. So you can, if, if you're not as familiar with the eras here, uh, usually we, we look at the late 40s, the immediate post where the AAFC, uh, gained a partial merger for clubs with uh, the NFL. And then we usually kind of skip to 1960, formation of uh, what was the latest American Football League. There have been several versions of the American Football League. And that's kind of where we start to think about this modern era of rival leagues. But that, that middle 50s in particular, uh, some other things were happening there, where this league, for, for a relatively brief moment was a major rival to the NFL. And in fact, in some sense, you know, I think we could argue really set up the AFL. I mean, kind of, kind of that, 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 and we're going to see that a lot of players actually left the CFL to go to the AFL. So what role did the, what role did the CFL play in that sort of development? And that's, that's kind of the focus here. I just started working on this here fairly recently. Let's go back up a slide. If you're not as familiar with the CFL, um, very quick background, still exists. Nine current franchises, same cities as the mid fifties. Now there's been some comings and goings, but they're all back in the same place as to where they started. As many North American leagues go, roots go back to the uh, early 20th century. The league started using American players in the mid 1930s. Yeah. And for the longest period, they were actually called imports. Yeah. So import players were the American players. And then there was kind of the Canadian homegrown players. But generally the Americans were much better football players than the Canadians. Okay. So there was a strong incentive here to hire Americans. Um, again, for those of you who may not be familiar, the game is essentially the same as uh, American football with some rule changes, three downs instead of four, wider field, longer field do things like that, uh, 12 players on the field, but fundamentally the same game. So the shift for American players going up to Canada uh, was relatively easy. So here, here's, here's some examples here that, you know, this was quite, I just picked a few uh, obvious ones. One strategy, and again, this looks like the uh, US-based rival leagues, Signing established NFLers. Hey, Eddie LeBaron, quarterback, NFL Rookie of the Year in 52, left for the CFL two years later. 
Uh, you can see the NFL actually moved the timing of their college draft to late November, early December, because the CFL was picking off all these players coming out of college uh, before uh, they were drafted in the NFL. Uh, and to give one example here, I know I probably shouldn't mention Ohio State in this room, but one example, Don Clark running back of Ohio State, seventh overall NFL pick at 59, uh, did not sign um, with, with the club, went to the CFL. So, you know, I, I guess trying to get a sense as to where this, how important was this league in the overall scheme of things? And I guess one of my views, I think it was probably really important for a very brief period of time. Uh, and, and, and maybe it's, if we're looking at this as an economic, a sport economic history piece, maybe it's been a bit understudy. Yeah. It's really hard to get a lot of clear data back from that era, uh, particularly on the Canadian side, as opposed to the NFL side. Um, <coughs> how do they do it, right? Because you say today, if you follow the two leagues today, I mean, the average salary in the CFL is probably about 10% of the average NFL salary. And that's not an exaggeration. Okay? It's very small. A um, couple of things here, I think, particularly rapidly growing popularity in Canada during that era, and uh, no competition in the output market for uh, or from college football or from baseball, really, for that matter. It was mm -hmm. long before the era of cable television and that kind of stuff, and it was literally a diversion outside of hockey season. There was hockey season, and then there was like not hockey season. <laughs> And this sort of filled the gap. <laughs> and the other thing, and I came across this fairly recently, did not know this. Um, the CFL actually had a TV contract with NBC in 1954. It's for one year. They were, they were what we would call today a simulcast of the broadcast in Canada. Um, and apparently provided more coverage uh, of NFL games than the uh, Dumont Television Network, which uh, had the NFL contract from 51 to 55. So there's actually, you know, in, in the today's era, we say, so what's driving salaries? What about TV money? Okay. Well, back then, that was in many ways what was driving, particularly in that mid 50s era, the ability for the Canadian Football League to outbid in many cases the NFL. The NFL wanted to get a truce in the mid 50s, Burt Bell, the CFL, they probably should have come to some of these. CFL said, no, go away. We're fine. We're going to keep this up. Um, it all collapsed. It was a very brief era. And by 1960, the NFL come on board. A lot of their players they took from the CFL um, and coaches as well. CFL survived, but what we know today, you know, it's, it's, it's limped along. It's limped along for many years. Um, the league's popularity began to decline even in Canada as other sports entered the market. Blue Jays came to Toronto and, and all those kinds of things. Um, there were what I'll call a few final skirmishes long past the heyday, but again, trying to think about in, in, in a, historical sense, whether at least in certain parts of the labor market at the high end, what impact the CFL may have had. Um, 1979, first overall pick in the, uh, in the NFL draft, Tom Cousineau was a linebacker of Ohio State, uh, did not sign uh, with the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills uh, traded, I think it was five draft choices to the 49ers to get the first pick. And who would have thought that that first pick would not sign with the Bills? <clears throat> Went to the Montreal Alouettes. Vince Ferragamo, those of you who are of that era, remember he was the uh, LA Rams quarterback. 1980 Super Bowl was the last Super Bowl of the uh, Steelers era. Terry Bradshaw. Um, he left the Rams, was signed by the Montreal Alouettes uh, for the largest contract in the history of either league. Thing, which is kind of weird. Um, Reggie Ishmael, Rocket Ishmael, same thing about 10 years later, rejected as the first overall pick. I thought he was on another game. The 91 draft signed with the Toronto Argonauts. The similarities, the last two here, 
were really celebrity owners. And the, you know, I think the 50s was the period where there was actually uh, potentially a profit maximizing reason. Uh, these last two celebrity owners, uh, Vince Ferragamo, uh, by the name of Nelson Scalvania, had just bought the Montreal Alouettes. He'd actually uh, was active in the WHA and it actually brought Wayne Gretzky to the WHA when he was 17 years old with the Indianapolis Racers. So um, the sad story for the Alouettes is they ran into some real tough times. Scalvania basically abandoned the team a year or two later. They change names. They're eventually back to the Alouettes. It's only, only Rocket Ishmael, who owned the Toronto Argonauts then, was the uh, consortium, Gretzky, uh, John Candy, the late actor, and Bruce McNaught. And they got a lot of fanfare. They went out, paid a lot of money for Ishmael. Um, unfortunately, John Candy passed away a couple of years later. Bruce McNall ended up in jail. He was the owner of the LA Kings. He brought Gretzky to Los Angeles and Edmonton. Uh, he ended up spending most of the next, I don't know, decade, decade and a half in jail, or maybe it was rare coin collection fraud. Um, so that, that didn't end well either. Just a side note on the Ferragamo thing. He spent one year in the CFL, uh, threw seven touchdown passes, had 25 interceptions. <laughs> He couldn't adjust to the fact there was an extra defensive player, right? There was a, there was a fifth defensive back on the field. Uh, so that did not work. He came back to the NFL after that, had a reasonably okay career uh, post CFL. Um, so I guess just to, 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 to end the story here, I think my time's almost up. Uh, for me, I guess a kind of a passion here is again this, this whole this whole how did we get to where we're at? Why did certain rival leagues seem to thrive and succeed, at least in a, in a limited way? How did others fall by the wayside? But I think in this case, and we're not, we may be much more used to this in, let's say, a, a European soccer setting where there's external competition. Okay? We generally, in the history of major North American leagues, have not seen that okay? throughout the last century. And this is probably one of the few exceptions. So something I'm, I'm hoping I can get can, can dig deeper on as I, as I move forward as a final more of some of, some of those those numbers but thanks rod uh, got me off to a great start here so i uh, appreciate that and everything you've done since all right so we have just over 10 minutes break before Great man speaks. <laughs> Can we get a round of applause? I know I've been forgetting yeah. everything. Yeah. Hey, Paid me a lot of money to do this. Okay. Um, I had but you still had to. There's still a principal agent problem. And that even counts Roger. Roger. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Generated revenue versus non-generated, but they don't disaggregate that by school. Yeah. So someone has something. Okay, I like to call it speaking in order. <laughs> so, uh, I want to say a few words before we discuss. Um, we've had a wonderful day today, presentation with um, so many um, distinguished scholars in the field, former PhD students, um, and for many of them, I think what they know abroad is perhaps different from what they know. Of, what they, they would they are known as a faculty, fellow faculty member, as I do. So I want to say something about that for them, so they understand it. So broad as a as a um, as a faculty member um, embodies what I would say are the finest aspects of a human being, with all of the worst aspects of an economist. <laughs> <laughs> which is if you've ever been in a faculty meeting with Rod, you know how faculty meetings go it's an endless tortuous discussion about something which everybody's desperate to reach some agreement and after about half an hour you think you've reached an agreement on something and then Rod pipes up and Rod's issue is he is utterly committed to Ben. That is a driving motivation. And he is absolutely eagle-eyed to make sure that whatever we're going to do is going to be fair. And he will look at that from every possible way. And this is where the worst aspect of the economist comes in, because he's a complete skeptic when it comes to other people's ideas. He, he, he's completely suspicious that there's some injustice being perpetrated here. And so you have to keep the meeting going until finally you persuade Rod that it's a fair outcome. So, which is, and I think uh, many of you will recognize that in his, in his research career. Many people said today how, um, how, uh, how uh, demanding Rod is in terms of getting to the truth. And I think that's you know, part, of, part, of the, part of his genius is that he does that in every aspect of his life. And, but I want to say a couple of things about his research, really, and, and about the reason for having an event like this. There aren't many people, to be honest, who at the end of their careers get to say that they molded the field in which they work. And that's one thing we can say about is that when he started, to the extent that there was a field of sports economics, it was fundamentally different and leaves it a completely different area and with his imprint all over it. And if you just think, and people have mentioned it today on several occasions, if you think about um, his, uh, the Ford and Quirk JEL paper, as many people said, that's for most people, that's your starting point. That's where you begin researching sports economics. That's where, you're, that's where you start. And uh, if you think for many people, it, they learn sports economics through Rod's textbook. That is the leading textbook in the field. So in that sense, he structured the whole argument. And I think the other really great thing about Rod to say is that it's not, he's published his thousands of citations, his research papers have influenced fields of development in the theoretical level and empirical level. But Rod has also always had a focus, not just on conducting fundamental research, but also conveying the meaning of that research to the wider world. And his books, Painter, Hardball, have again, reached out far beyond the academic community to have an influence and to help all of us reach out to a wider audience because the wider audience, the wider world understands something about what we're talking about, largely thanks to the work uh, of Rod and his co -work. So we all owe really Rod a great debt of gratitude. Um, I should say that I would say uh, we were, um, when in organizing this, one issue is the real problem is what do we call this? And calling it a farewell lecture 
few people said, what, you know, seriously, are we going to have a coffin here in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> so, and the important point is, it's the academic administration and the teaching that he's leaving behind. But Rod's already said, told many of us that the research will continue. Um, and I think that will continue to be uh, a benefit to all of us for the foreseeable future. So with that, I'd like to hand over the Hey, new thing on technology. I'm going to touch something on the bridge. I'm sure it's my phone. There we go. <laughs> Oh, that was going to start up with this. Sorry about that. Thank you. Um, I, I've said this to quite a few of you over the course of the last few days that uh, I, I really am uh, humbled by this. I'm embarrassed, is the best word I can think of, because. Uh, it's a room full of people with really high opportunity costs here and that you would take the time to come all the way here and, and hear my thing, right? Uh, it, uh, it's a day I'll never forget. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go around the room quick because I, I just feel this need, okay? Um, at first, Brad and, and Jane are here and I wouldn't have it any other way. I insisted that you be here, right? The, the, I mean, you brought up that, well, we never work together. We see each other. It's much more than that than, than you think, right? I mean, the challenges that you present to the most of the things that I've done, I just revel in that. I love it, right? So I'm glad you're here. And even though, you know, you you invented a nice name for something I wrote and, and found some empirical support, I, I know that later it won't be there and I'll have just as much fun reading that. As, 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 uh, if you're, thank you. I mean, I, I, I would add, to that I, I will never take credit for the move to decimal place and, and do so. I, I don't know who did that first, but but I will take credit for this, right? And that's it. I tell my students, if if you can write five pages that sound like you know what you're doing and put 300 million at the end of it, you have a consulting business in um, <laughs> it, 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 kind of the same thing. Kind of the same thing. Uh, it, Steve Ross, um, we, we, we have a, a love-love relationship. And, and I think so because exactly what you said. I know nothing about the law, but we all think we do, right? We're all smart thinking people. We've all run into lawyers. We all read law in one way or another, right? Uh, in, in consulting or something. But I never know the law until after I've talked to you, right? So I thanks for that. It, it goes both ways. Uh, who else is here? Uh, Dennis, I think you should talk to the editor of the Journal of Sports Economics and make sure that he publishes your paper pretty quickly. Okay. I, I think that diagram is fabulous. I, I will absolutely write, uh, maybe you didn't see me, but I took a picture of it. I, I, I will absolutely write, think about that a lot more in the future because it's it's just so straightforward and moving you know, moving surfaces and areas is, is always fascinating. Um, Thomas, thanks for being here. Hey, you, you've come the farthest uh, and the, the idea that, you know, that it's open source was actually selfish, right? It's because, you know, I have these data, people kept badgering me about it, right? Oh, can I have this? Can I have that? Do you, do you mind doing this? And I finally said, yeah, I mind doing all of that stuff. <laughs> and so instead, I just put it up right on an easy access cloud place, right? And everybody can have it. But I'm admiring, you know, that you're doing the same thing with other data, uh, especially now that you know, I'm moving forward. Right, I would have to be looking for people to pick those things up. Who's going to take the Rod Ford Sports Business page? Ain't going to be me, right? And you know things like that. So it it, it gives me pause to think uh, you know about those things. Um, Joel, uh, I'm glad you're here. We go, Joel and I'll do you know Joel and Neil at the same time. This is my you know my first generation pair, right? Back when I was uh, in my previous incarnation as a, a real economist, not a sports economist. And, uh, and, and the, it, you, you won't believe how far back we go. I mean, Neil brought up, right, 1988, right? Uh, 
I took the job at the in 1984. I had just made graduate faculty, and that's, you know, that's <laughs> uh, aside from the fact that, you know, I love rival leagues. I love the whole story, the idea uh, about rival leagues. And, and Joel, um, uh, you and Steve together, right, put together exactly what's, you know, uh, not, not Steve, excuse me, but you put together exactly what I've been telling everybody who calls me now about, well, what about the, the strike and the ghost runner and then I just, you just go like this and I go, no, no, no. The players have a unique opportunity because the competitive balance tax sun you know, uh, sunset in, the, in that recent negotiation, it was gone. They had the unique opportunity to get rid of revenue sharing. If the owners want to play hardball, then let's, let's get it out and do it, right? So to get rid of revenue sharing and to get rid of competitive balance tax and what the hell, let's get rid of the draft too while we're at it, right? All of the things that have made that wedge look exactly the way it is. You can track it right back to competitive balance tax and revenue sharing and watch the difference between league revenues, right, and player pay, and watch that gap get bigger and bigger over time. And I, I'm convinced that you're exactly right. That that's that's why I have it. Uh, Jason, I, I, it's, it's funny, right, because I don't, I don't know the, the work that you're doing. And my son can attest to it. My son Kyle is here, by the way, everybody. This thing. And uh, I told them last night that if I had it to do over again, because I thought somebody would ask me that question, right? is was it worth it what you do it again? And I don't think so. Uh, I think I would study, instead, I think I would study um, fan behavior of exactly the kind you're pointing at, right? The kind that goes, I'm watching the, the you know, the women's final four. Uh, well, let's take the men's final four. I'm watching the men's final four, and it's, 10 black athletes, right, running up and down the court. And every screenshot is of, you know, of some 55 to 60 year old white person, male or female, with blood vessels popping out of their heads or screaming and hollering and we're number one. And we're like, why? Why do fans feel like that, right? It, it, is it a loyalty thing? Is it a tribe thing? Is it, you know, what, whatever it is. And it, which goes right, you know, into what, you know, the work I've done with Brian which is you know, sort of, you know, there's a core of fans. And then there's fans that show up as winning increases. Because we know that you know, teams that, that play worse than minor league teams still have positive right, attendance. And they can still sell TV contracts. What's going on there, right? And, and I know that it happened with, with Jason thinking about that because we both sat at any number of miserable Washington State University football games <laughs> where there wasn't a chance in the world that they were going to win this football game, right? And yet, there's that cold cadre, right, just sitting there, go Cougs, right? <laughs> and when they got successful, we, we did resent the people around us who weren't there the whole time. I mean, I resented it partly because they just, you know, they crowded us. We used to be able to, like, you know, stretch out in the seats and take my kids and all that, right? And then they started to show up, got crowded, really crowded. And I resented that because they didn't have earned it. That, that's exactly the way I felt about it. So I, I don't know how you're going to take that modeling and take that empirical work, but you should talk to Brian because we, we also have, you know, this work about home fans and that cadre. And what, there's been a lot of empirical work in attendance, you know, thinking about the quality of the visiting team, but not a lot of home, a lot of out of attendance work about the quality of the home team across the quality of, I said visiting team, across the quality of the home team, right? Do fans who show up to watch a bad team week after week after week after week come because they're really loyal and tight, or are they coming to watch the visitor? You know, that, that kind of thing. Somewhere in there, you know, one tile. Uh, but I, I think I, if I did it again, I would go back and, and I don't know if I'd be a psychologist, but, right, there's nothing wrong with it. But, it, you know, I, I, that thing fascinates me more and more. Why, why do fans feel that way? Because it spills over into the sense of ownership about what the actual owners do with the team, right? Well, why didn't you call me? <laughs> right? You're supposed to call me about trading my favorite player, right? That, that kind of thing. Uh, then do it again. Uh, Steve and, and, and Matt, and you, you know uh, how I appreciate your work and the way that you continue on with the things we did. So that's my little, well, and back to Steph, right? So, first of all, thank you. Your time here at, at, at Michigan. Uh, with you know, the departure of, of other favorites, right? Um, actually made it uh, useful, fun, and enjoyable. 
Yeah, absolutely. We, we a few of our uh, of our younger colleagues talked about well lunch with Stefan Rod. Yeah. And yeah, we, we love to have lunch. We love to get together. We talk about all kinds of things, right? That have to do with uh, uh, what we do and don't believe. And uh, and so Steph did a, a, a retro look and a retro piece, you know, that I had done and, and talked about only one portion of it. But I, I, in the end, originally I wrote this paper about um, uh, what's the difference between European and, uh, and North American sports fans, right? And, that kind of sports, and, and part of it was about fans. And I just looked at them and said, fans are fan. However, they all come together, they, they're just fans, right? And, and they, they got to be the, if I took a fan out of New York City and dropped them in London, they'd change to a soccer fan, but they'd be a fan and they'd try to behave the same. Our lunch talks just disabuse me of that idea completely. It's just, it's just not true. It's just not true, right? And I, you, you drove it home with me on the issue of, uh, well, just look how they see tournaments, right? We see tournaments, what? Identify 16, one place 16, two place 15, so down the line, so you know, nine and 10. And Seth says, no, no, in Europe, we put them in a jug and shake them up, pull them out, right? Uh, American sports fans, heads would blow off if you did that. Right? You gotta earn it. You gotta know that you really climbed a tough ladder to get there. And Europeans, according to Steph, this is me, by the way, you know, by a long shot, but they, they just feel a, a much more, a, a deeper sense of luck. Right? You're good because you just happen to be in a place that has a big population and lots of rich people. That doesn't mean you have some, you know, some ability to have a preference, right, when it comes to seating postseason or whatever. Uh, so I, we, we have had, I think, just a, a terrific time together. And I wouldn't trade it for the world. Okay. I think I got everybody. And I know Matt's hiding back there, but he, he was co op with, with Brian, so just stuff. Okay, so uh, some things I think I don't want to pass along with it. Uh, here we go. I I've never done a farewell lecture before, so. <laughs> <laughs> Come fire, Builder. This is, this is one of my favorites, either whether, whether you like John Wayne or, or you watch, uh, I got it from uh, uh, Jeremiah Johnson. So it was a movie that was big when I was a high school kid. And, uh, he goes off into the wilderness to become a mountain man. And, it ends up to be, you know, this sort of uh, iconic mountain man. Right? So I was born in Seattle in 1956. Rottenberg, 1956. <laughs> <laughs> Coincidence? I moved to, uh, from San Diego to the third grade. Uh, sorry, San Diego to the third grade and then to Spokane, Washington. I started high school in 1971. Oh, did you read quirk? And it's, no, sorry, I, I don't mean to. It, it's, it's my own, you know, cynical mission. But uh, yeah, oh, did you read I graduated high school. I graduated high school in 1974. <laughs> Scully. Oh yeah. <laughs> no, uh, no, Scully was in '76, but Noel's '74 book comes out, right? It's getting a little spooky now for for me, right? Just looking at these things. Uh, I was a pretty good high school quarterback. I got as a three sport guy, right? Because that's what you did in my day. There wasn't this, you know, you turn 13 and you got to declare, right? Whether you're out soccer, football, basketball, hockey player. You just, so I, I, I played them all. It's an okay high school quarterback. Uh, I had some JC offers and a D1A FBS walk on invite. And we all know what that means, right? Yeah, so I go down, they put me in crappy equipment to use me for pack to go to the air, unless I really show up super quick. So. Uh, fortunately, I was pretty good in the classroom. So instead, uh, off to college. I did a year at Gonzaga in engineering. Boy, I'm glad I didn't do that. I mean, engineering's cool, but I'm glad I didn't. Uh, I got my BS in environmental studies at Utah State University. And most people don't know that. You know, I was, uh, I was gonna, well, I was gonna say every single tree in the world. <laughs> but along the way, I took an econ course and learned about trade-offs and, and that was that. Uh, I wasn't an econ undergrad, so I had the good fortune to go to a, a pretty decent uh, applied econ school at Montana State to beef up for the big push in economics, right, uh, at PhD level. Uh, every single economics program that I applied to, including the University of Michigan, turned me down. Everyone, okay. 
I was holding out that maybe the University of Washington, because I was in state, might, might do something. When, believe it or not, James Quirk is visiting at Montana State University, walks down the hall and says, you should apply to Caltech. And, and I, I mean, I knew the, the, the general Caltech reputation, right? And it wasn't me, that by, not by a long shot. So I, uh, uh, I, I took that with a grain of salt. Uh, and then went, I entered Caltech in 8081. Two funny stories, okay, I think. The, the, the first one uh, is a thing I think I know, okay? I, I'm trying to flash these along the way as best I can remember. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Quirk invited me to apply because my wife's great confidence is a technical person. I, I'm almost certain this is true. So, so Jim is a, a, my, my co-author that I'll talk more about, right? Let's say uh, uh, very technically oriented economist. He worked in the mathematics and economics and you know, in theory at that level. He could invert matrices in his head. He told me once, by the way, that uh, if you look at his profile, he was in the Navy for a while. He, he told me that part of, part of his job in the Navy at that time was to convert a portion of the Navy's Leontia input output matrix by hand with an adding machine. Right? That's, I mean, remember, the, you know, Brainiac was, you know, was sort of on the drawing board. So he, and then he had a hard time getting you know, anybody to be able to put his stuff in, you know, in typeset. So my wife is a wizard at it, really good at it, right? So I'm pretty sure this was a, uh, this was a, a time. Uh, second funny story. Uh, I never said anything about sports at Caltech, okay? People are surprised by this. Lance Davis, an old economic historian whose chapter in Roger's 1974 book is completely ignored, but it's a gem. You should just go read it sometime. Essentially, he uh, he's Ted Turner, right? He looks at Major League Baseball and says, you've, you've got a legal monopoly. How bad can you be at it, right? And he just goes right down the list of, they, they could do this, they could do this, they could do the economic historian. They, they could do all these things, right? And uh, so last day, this was there, Roger's there, Jim Quirk's there. Uh, there was not even a classroom exam in sports until I took my prelim exam. And then there was a question, right, about wind maximizing leaks. So it starts with, what would the owner of a wind maximizing leak do, lay out the model and the first order conditions and all that? Jazz? I'm just pouring over this, trying to make sure I got it right. And, and it's a trick question. You know, Quirk wrote it, it was a trick question. And what he expected as an answer was, why in the world would you ever model anything as a wind maximizing leak? Uh, that was his punchline, right? Which, if you know where I'm headed and, and we're here for the day, you, you would know that that's a funny thing, right? Because I spent a lot of time trying to figure out objective functions and what, you know, what, what leaks and teams were up to. And, and so to see that early on like that, I, I think it's a funny story. My journey begins and stalls. Remember, no sports study at Caltech. In 1982, Roger Noel walked down the hall and said, you know how to do all the, uh, because we're working on a, Vax system, I think at the time, something like that, right? Uh, do you know how to go get all the subroutines to run regression models, right? In, in whatever it is we're doing, right? Tabletop computing was getting, was brand new, it was just getting started. Uh, and so I was his research assistant on Sealy versus the US and, and uh, it started in 92 and was finally decided in 84. That's the first I saw, right? Of, of somebody who had social science training thinking about sports, right? First, I thought it never even occurred to me you could do such a thing. That produced a working paper that Roger encouraged me to run with, which should have been my you know, first. He, he didn't want it, he just gave it to me. Go, go, go see what you can do with this. Um, I came up well short of for a first down. I mean, I, I tried to submit it a few places. Nobody's buying sports, right? Nobody's buying sports unless it's some kind of really Rothbard type large issue thing that might be interesting, literally, to the to general economic terms. And it began again. Uh, I count this as my point of entry into what would become sports economics. And the Jim Quirk calls me and says, Let's, uh, I'm writing a book. And you know a lot because I've you know, written this salary paper. You know a lot about salaries in the player market. Roger promises to do the revenue side, and Jim would do all the rest, right? Um, well, Roger you know, decided not to, and so Jim and I wrote the book. Uh, and it's, I, it's still, you know, it's either my first or second uh, insights, even today. So people are still reading it. I still get a check, 1992, right? That very big. Uh, 
Then Paul Sommer's Millbury Conference happens in 1991. His conference volume resurrected this working paper that I'd written, you know, the only thing I'd actually written in sports. Uh, and so it, you know, it goes in there. Uh, it still remains, uh, as, as Ryan pointed out, oh, I miss Ryan. That's who I miss. <laughs> it, it still remains, by the way, as the, um, the only baseball salary right regression that's out there. There are other salary models, but they're almost, uh, they're all about soccer. You know, or basketball or something like that, right? Uh, and and this is this is a place where I learned the difference between what's a player worth to an owner and what does the owner have to pay them, which are two different things. Right? So we did, you know, pay dirt in 1992, and I, I think that's formally, even though I had this, you know, did this working paper that the made it someplace else as a chapter in a book, uh, as almost everything did in those days. Um, the book, uh, you know, the book sent me uh, sent me on. Uh, Set me on a path, okay? You, you all know the Yogi Bear is right about the fork in the road ticket. And I got counsel from all of the faculty at my previous institution that I should not be uh, calling myself a sports economist because there was no such thing. As Steph pointed out, I mean, it, it evolved over time. And, and so I, I'm thinking, well, I love to do sports. No, no, no. You are a labor economist who uses sports as your applied area. You are a IO economist who uses sports as your applied area. Um, well, I took Yogi's advice, so I, I took the fork in the road. Um, my thinking was, there's no reason you can't make a reasonable journal attack of sports. I mean, after all, right? It should be a quiz. You, know, you guys can all think about the quiz. Uh, go ahead, JBE 56. Rodberg, QJE64. Neil. Neil. That's JPE71. Sloan. JPE71. Elvader and Quirk. Brooking 74. Sloan. Rogers Big Book. JPE74. Not many know this one. Courtney and Howard did the labor market, right, in 1974. AER76. Scully. Pater92. Some guys I know. Um, <laughs> I looked at that and I said, well, what's the problem here? Sports is all over the place in really good journals. And if you can do that, then certainly, right, the usual more general regional with described as regional at the time, right? Southern journal, Eastern journal, Western economic, which turned into economic inquiry, right? Certainly you can do those as well. Uh, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with industry studies. Lots of people in economics choose an industry and you know, they spend a lot of time with it. And it got made it really fun, right? I mean, you know, what, what's more fun than sports? And bam, okay. Pen Cabell calls uh, uh, in 1994 and says, "I want to. I'd like to have you and Jim put a review piece together about sports economics." So I'm getting a lot of you know questions about it after the book. Where you know what does the literature look like? Where is it going? What's it doing? And, and so Jim had the longer history, and, and then we had the book together. Uh, and so it wasn't a, you know, it was a requested piece. And he hated the first one. He sent it back to us. He said, if that's the best you can do, I'm not going to put it in the And we did better. So it, it did make it in there. Uh, and out of the, this, this 95 piece, I think, comes almost everything I think I know about sports. Okay. It's, it's been fine tuned and honed over time, but almost all of it's there, right? Uh, this one, I don't think you can read that, but baseball is like church. Many attend if you understand. Okay. <laughs> this is uh, you know, variously attributed to DeRocher or Wes Westrom, who was a catcher of the same era. Right? Uh, Bill Wrigley said, baseball is too much of a sport to be called a business and too much of a business to be called a sport. Yep, yeah, this is exactly true. And so this, this part of it got me to think about the relationship between sports and people and, and why people like sports and why they're willing to spend money on it. And then why it is that it's important to have analytic rigor applied to this industry because of the hard to understand part. All fans are great fans and all fans know how to win. And so do all the owners. But when owners don't win on purpose, fans think that, well, they're just stupid. They break out the stupid owner explanation, right? Rather than the idea that, hey, I mean, there's a whole spectrum of quality out there and everything you buy, right? Low quality to high quality. You, you don't get upset about that, but well, you know, if, if the St. Louis uh, Browns aren't trying to win the pennant, then they're tanking. They're, they're, somehow they're doing something wrong, right, on purpose in the eyes of fans. 
So that that was what that was about for me. Uh, and the you know the sport business thing is actually the most important thing about sports to me. Right, it's the only reason I study it. Um, sports and league behavior, right, requires cooperation. Nowhere, I mean, markets and, you know, the theory of the firm and external and internal contracting and things like that, right, make economics go around, but members of the same industry do not sit down in the off season and decide how they're going to run that industry for the next year or 10 years, okay? Well, in fact, we have a whole series of laws that are designed to make sure they can't do that because it doesn't have to be anti-competitive, but it can be, and we need to be you know, careful about that. Right. So, so that's what we got me to think about baseball from the perspective of market power and the usual tools, the tools of the industrial organization economy. Uh, I knew that, oops, I knew that there were, um, you know, that revenue sharing had always been always been around a bit. It was always approximately 80, 20. It started out a nickel a ticket, if I remember right, right? So everybody, uh, all the tickets came in, the visitor got a nickel a ticket, okay? Then they went to roughly 80-20. It was like 85-15 in one of the leagues and 80-20 in the other league. Roughly 80-20. Uh, and that's what, you know, that's what this guy's all about. Visiting, here's your bleacher ticket and how come it costs 75 cents? And there's this little breakdown, right, for uh, uh, for the Brooklyn uh, the Dodgers. <coughs> I don't know, what do I spend? Maybe 20 years? Understand and explaining the impact of revenue sharing on big you know, member behavior, right? Off of some little picture like this. Right? So I think I know that revenue sharing doesn't change competitive balance one iota. What one iota? Okay, it can. And, and Steph and I, for example, have had long theoretical interactions that, that uh, Dennis referred to as you know sort of in baseball, you know, kind of thing. Right? But yeah, okay. I mean, but but it, it matters. Uh, and they're arguing about, well, wait a minute, in this kind of league, certainly we can move that way. And I became a believer, you know, the, the mathematics that Jim and I put together originally was uh, primitive and, and got better over time working with, uh, with Jason, for example. And I learned that, yeah, okay, there's kinds of leagues where that can happen, but it doesn't. And as, a, as a matter of uh, just simple fact, you, you look at the imposition of all these kinds of rules and activities, and the only thing that happens is they take money away from players and give it to owners. That's what happens, right, with all of these things. So from, from then on, after 19, the, the paper in 95, I just began to look at sports a different way and to look at collective bargaining a different way because, well, because it's not about competitive balance. If competitive balance improves, it's simply an artifact of the pursuit of league profit, okay? Something changed and the league has to adjust and they adjust in a way that creates more balance because their profits go up, okay? If their profits aren't going up, they're not gonna adjust it you know, to improve competitive balance. They've already taken that into account in their relationship to revenue and their relationship to each other, okay? By maximizing league profit instead of you know, something else. Uh, and after that, it looks to me like it's all uh, pretty much just reallocation from players to owners. So that's a lot to know. I, I think you know, quite a bit to know from from an early, uh, an early part. The plan begins to form. Uh, you know, somebody brought up that, uh, Steph, as he introduced me, brought up that uh, uh, it's almost like you had a plan. I did. I absolutely had a plan. Uh, I was in, the plan begins to form. I'm invited to what I believe was the first ever meeting where sports economists were actually a group of people. Okay. I was in Neuchâtel, Switzerland in 1997. I recall Jerry uh, Scully and Roger and both the Steffs and Bert Moore. I forgot Andy. Yeah, Andy was there. And I, I had completely forgotten that Steve was there. But as we talk, you know, it's good to refresh the memory. And, and so we were all brought together, right, into a room uh, and, and treated you know, royally uh, in Switzerland. Um, and and I, I began to wonder why we were there. So we're doing our thing, right? And I think I was nominated chair of the session. I just was making sure everybody got the time, right? And, and then I'm like, is everybody talking? I'm just looking, I look at the audience, right? Uh, this is a really well-dressed audience, okay? I, I didn't know, as my naivete at the time, right? This was a conference put together by FIFA to figure out what to do about the Bossman decision, the, the, the sort of, you know, free agency issue, right, in, in European sports. They were running terrified about what to do now that players, when they run out their contract, can just 
go be a free agent, which was what most of us want to see. Uh, and then, and then it struck home, right? It struck home that here there, there was some FIFA big wig and three Tonys around him, and the phone would ring, and they'd go like this, go, and they'd run out in the hall, and it it was just a business meeting for them, right? And with some pretty you know good American talent and British talent, and uh, for for Scott, no, no uh, he's a, he's an Englishman in in, in Scotland. Yeah, well, anyway, it, it was a, a, a nice, tight international group. Oh, Steph Kazan was there, right? So it, it, it's more European than, than I thought. And uh, and we were really there to tell them, uh, give them insight about how American sports leagues, for example, the, the team owners had managed to subdue the players, right? How, how they've done it. What could, what could they learn, right, from the American experience about how to get talent back under their thumb, right? Um, this is where I sort of went, hey, there are sports economists, right? It's not just me and a couple of other guys, you know, every once in a while, they're, they're, they're really out there. So I intended to be part of that sports economics, which didn't exist at the time, still, again, right? We, there was no such thing. Uh, plan, I committed to meetings and associations, uh, the WAI, the Western meetings, the international, the first association, right, of sports economists. And you missed him, unfortunately, but my very dear friend, Plato, uh, you know, we, I committed to those things. Western meetings. I don't have a photo of the meetings, but I did correspond with Joel because we we may have gone to the first one. Right? I I don't remember for sure, but we were had to be pretty close. Right? Anyway, so the earliest meetings were organized by tireless organizers and you know, people who just did this because they were dedicated to the proposition. I guess uh, Elizabeth Gustafson and, and rest his uh, rest his soul, Larry Hadley. And it started in 1995 at the Western meetings. And they have been ongoing ever since. And not only ongoing, but grown. And now they're under the auspices of you know, the, the North American Association of Sports Economists at the Western meetings, right? Which is, it is that's all well and good. But, but that's sort of how that part started. I committed myself to that to be sure that I went to horrible places like, uh, you know, like, like Placid or like, uh, like Tahoe and, San Francisco and San Diego and Denver. You know, it, but it, 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 you commit to these things, right? Because I thought this was a good thing to do and a way to build, uh, you know, what was going on. Then they've occurred ever since. Uh, that's uh, Elizabeth and Larry. Uh, I forget when Larry died. It's been a few years now, but, but he passed away. So Elizabeth and Larry, uh, what patron saints of, uh, of sports organizing. I went to the, uh, sorry, the International Association of Sports Economists, which Joel is, your president still, yeah? Joel's the president still. Um, started in 1999. I didn't get to the first meeting because it was in Europe. And I was at Washington State University with no travel budget. If I went there, I, I couldn't go present a paper, right? You know, two papers domestically or something like that. So 1999, uh, first presidents uh, in this, they designated themselves to be back and forth between Europe and North America. Right, both in terms of where their meetings would be and who would lead the organization. That's the way it was originally set up. Uh, and I recall that the first two presidents, I don't remember which one was first, right? But Paul Stoudemire and, uh, and Vladimir Andrev, right? For the, uh, I was a VP for a little while. And then, and so were you. I think we were kind of like VPs at the same time. And then the association, it didn't lose its ground. It just sort of lost you know, member interest because it was expensive, I, I think, more than anything else. Uh, so I, I think you, did you take over as Prez? I never did. Okay. Rob, Rob so, I mean, we were sort of mixed in line and then it just didn't happen. Rob Bonnie. Oh, that's right. We, we exceeded uh, to, the, to the French level of Rob Bonnie. Right? And, <laughs> and so he, oh no, they, they, the French took people and adored them. And if you, and I, and I love them, right? And, and Fugay and Primo are kind of my favorite. Hilarious all the time. But the, um, yeah, and that, that just sort of came apart. We, we, I, I know I know about Steph. I never, I sort of ascended to the presidency after that. It just sort of faded away. Um, but I committed to it, right? So I, I did go to the meeting, every meeting that I could possibly get to. Uh, I do have a photo, right? <laughs> to play another game, right? Who are all these people, right? Yeah. Uh, well, we don't have to. I mean, you can look, right? Like, um, pretty sure I know who. <laughs> That is, and that is. <laughs> that's Rob and his wife. Well, we don't have to play that game because because I relied on a, a bunch of people to help me you know, figure out who they all are. 
So you can, you know, if you want, I'd be happy to send this to you. you can, oh yeah, look who was there and, and who wasn't, right? Um, so I, I committed to, you know, to the IASD and bless, you know, uh, this is a two gentleman, best friend of sports economists everywhere. Uh, there's nobody like Placido, nobody like Placido, uh, and the best host uh, in the whole wide world. Um, so I, uh, you know, I committed to the meetings in Gijon. Uh, who wouldn't? <laughs> right, this, uh, <laughs> if you've never been, go. Uh, if you ever have a chance to do anything in Gijon, go. Right, it's, a, it's just a fabulous place, right? And and. It's very close to uh, the University at Oviedo, and so it's the host town, right, for, for what became known as the meetings in Gijon. So uh, there's the first one. Plastic already showed this picture, right? But there's the first one. And there's a, it's all kind of people we know here. There's me, there's Steph, right? And, it, and the rest of them were luminaries at the time. Sports econ is kind of starting to be a thing. We're talking about each other, right? As sports economists. Um, so, Bert, Frick, and Leo, and Peter Sloan, and Latigo, and uh, Yala, uh, me, and Roger, and Rob Body, Steph Kassan, Steph Samansky, and the fabulous Bill Girard. Uh, I talked about uh, Rottenberg, player labor markets, you know, some about some things that I thought would be fun to analyze, and then they never did a single one. But I believe that one of them, uh, Joel, Pursue to a great extent, right? The, the idea of how, how these markets work and what they actually do. Um, I didn't have anything to do with these. Uh, oh, there. <laughs> the modern associations, uh, and the NASI and ESEA, um, North American Associated Sports Econ, European Sports Econ Association, Sports, yeah, Sports Economic Association. I didn't have anything to do with organizing these. The, the critical mass have been reached, right? I, 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 I did. I committed to them and I went. Did whatever I could, especially Nazi, because they just became like this with the Western hands. And almost everybody went to the Western hands. Um, so I, I think this was inevitable because it's just a bunch of fun, right? It's really difficult for Americans to get travel budgets that'll cover the expense of going to Europe, right? Even, even for one trip, right? And, and that, I mean, it's, it's not unfortunate, it just is, right? And so markets adjusted and gave us two societies. Well, three, because the ISE continues on. Which, and I understand under Joel's leadership, it's fairly robust and it's, you know, it's actually having some fun and going fun places and people are showing up, right? So that's that's interesting. Um, I committed to undergraduate material. Um, like I invented the sports economics class at FSU. I invented the first American textbook in sports econ because uh, Downward and Dawson were doing the same thing in Europe. I, I think we came out almost about the same time, right? So, Another sort of thing ringing in my ears about, or in my brain, probably about sports econ is a thing, right? We've got textbooks, we've got associations, we got, you know, it, it's getting there. Uh, so, yeah, I know, that's me. Uh, <laughs> that, literally, that's me when I wrote. Uh, and, uh, yeah, that's my book. Oh, you got to put that one in there. <laughs> So the textbook came out, I think the first one in like 2003 or four or something like that. That's a new thing. Um, I committed to professional outlets. Associations, of textbooks, and oh, we need some journals and we can actually sort of say, hey, well, you know, we're, we're a thing, you know, we can, we can get that done. So I helped start with the, uh, the journal sports econ. Uh, Leo, Leo Kahano was the, uh, and Todd Idson invented it. Todd faded quickly and Leo took it over and, and now it's in great, well, great other hands. Um, I, I was the second article, right, in the first in volume one, number one, because some guy named Rottenberg decided to write about golf balls or something like that. <laughs> That's okay. I'll, I'll always not like to thank him anyway. <laughs> um, oh, and then, uh, you know, the Inter uh, International Journal of Sports. Finance, that should be an F. That's, that should be an F, sorry about that. Uh, Denny Howard, who you know, many of you know in sports management, right? And Denny was a, a sports management guy in marketing. Um, at his request, uh, he, he needed to start this journal. And so I, I gave him a little paper and, and he decided it would be the first paper uh, in that journal. Um, not really bragging because when you start a journal, you're pretty thin. 
but it is a paper that stood time and helped me out in some court cases about the value, you know, how the value of sports ranch designs. Any other questions? I intended to be a part of sports economics, and Jim and I sat down and did the FAQ series. Okay. It wasn't sort of like I wrote one and he wrote back to me and said, Hey, let's let's do another one. What do you got in mind? Right? No, no, no. We we had the, the path right for that JSE, excuse me, the JEL piece of 95, and what the rest of the theory part of sports economy looked like. Right? The JEL was a good start. Uh, we wrangled over early limitations pointed out by Stefan Steph, the pesky European was telling us that, you know, hey, well, leagues aren't always like that. They're not always like the league that you're used to dealing with. Well, yeah, so what? I mean, we, so we'll just talk about North America. No, we, 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 I think out of that came the really important idea that the distinguishing feature between many leagues is how elastic the talent supply is, right? Where can you get more talent without having to do it literally just with the other people in the league? Can you get it someplace else? So that, that kind of thing. So we, we wrestled over that and then we you know, went our very way. Uh, it laid the groundwork anyway. So uh, theory of leagues and JEL, uh, the learning limitations from Steph and Steph, and then we did a proof of equilibrium paper, right? Like, oh, God, I don't know this. I'm not a theorist, right? I just do some, some middle brow theory, but this this deal about you know the existence of equilibrium, whether this kind of model really can pass muster with the real theory guys, you know. So that 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 paper had to be kind of with the help of Muhammad El Hadiri, not so much by me, right? But a previous uh, you know mathematics uh, wizard friend of Jim's. Um, that you know that paper got written to proof of rational expectations that we're in, which I, I don't think is that big a deal, but it's just that thing you got to do to you know, take care of the legitimacy. And then we did welfare theory because that was Jim's bag, right? Uh, and these are the papers in economic theory. optimal competitive balance from the perspective of you know, particular choices of how what optimal means, right? Which is what it and that was that's sort of it, right? I mean, from league behavior theory to some you know math to make the real theory guys happy to uh, you know to uh, exploring the welfare implications of this kind of operation. Right? It's pretty much sort of how you write the theory that surrounds a particular topic in some sort of or in, in economics. It was a very intentional plan. Uh, and there you go. So that's that's why that went that way. I'm going to talk about uh, James P. Quirk. Um, I'm writing a, as Robbie pointed out, when we talk, I'm writing a, a, an academic obituary for Jim. Um, Jim, Jim, Jim thought in matrices, right? He thought in differential equations and he thought in matrices and it was second nature to him, right? So, so I tell him he needed to say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And he'd write the model down real quick and hand it to me, yellow pads, He's infamous yellow pad guy. And, and I get the yellow pad and I look at it and I go, I draw myself a two by two example and try to get the logic out of it. And uh, uh, so Jim was a, an amazing intellect and just a hell of a nice guy. Just a terrific guy. I, I couldn't have wished for more as a mentor. Um, and we you know, lost him you know, during COVID. He, he did not go from COVID, but we lost him during that period. So I didn't get to really, really get to say goodbye. So the plan continued. Uh, I would share the wealth. Yeah, I was sure of the wealth. And so I have cherished co-authors. These are cherished co-authors by volume. All of my co-authors are, of course, cherished, right? But this is by volume. So Young Hoon and Joel and, and, and Jason uh, win, win the count, right? Uh, although others, you know, like Brian and I have, have written extensively together. I have paper with Steve and anybody else in here. I'm, I'm pretty, I, I don't want to call myself that, but I enjoy working with co-authors. So. Anyway, um, so you know, I, I intentionally set out to make sure that <laughs> it's propagated. Okay, you know, it's propagated with co-authors, and I, I think this is kind of cute. I think I have a one, two, three, four, five generation um, sports economics uh, involved with this symposium. Okay, so uh, Jim was my technical thesis advisor, but Roger paid for my dissertation. So he had a big grant. He thought Jim was doing cool stuff in information theory and public finance, right? And, uh, and markets over time, market allocation over time. Uh, so he paid for me and Jim trained me. Um, so, th so that's the first generation. 
and they go way back. I mean, you, you know, if you go way back in sports econ, you don't get too much farther back than, than you know, Quirk and, uh, and, and Roger. You, you, I think the last is like, well, Neil and, and Peter Sloan, and, uh, you know, and then even then you jump and you bump into Jim, right? So Rottenberg, I guess, you know, they have to go back. So this is uh, uh, that lineage. So they trained me. I had a first generation. It's amazing that they're both here. They make me very happy to be here. Uh, my second generation, which is after I got here, right? So I turned out econ, right, PhDs, and then I turned out sport management PhDs, and that's one, two, three, four, and soon, right, who's, uh, who's my student now, right? So five generations that actually kind of span most of, right, the development of sports econ. Uh, people are asking, well, what are you going to do now? What, what you do? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm going to cut back. I'm retiring. If I was going to cut back, why in the world would I retire, right? And so, yeah, I, I, but I will re remain dedicated to the proposition. I mean, I'll go where I'm asked, like always. I suspect it's much less frequently, right? Because I'm old and there's lots of really fun young people to talk to instead, right? So good. Good, that, that should be what happens. Uh, I'll keep after my undergraduate material. Um, I've, I've gotten into this digital education activity, right? Working close to the course or rather than campus, right? That working with the different course management programs. And it, it looks like lots of fun because it's open. So I write a book, but I sign away my rights to uh, let anybody else take that book and use it and change it how they choose. So I make you know the, I make my hay out of it, just you know revising and keeping it updated where others might not, and then they can take it and do what they want with it, right? Which I find fascinating and fun, right? That, that sounds like a whole lot of fun to me. Um, you know, rather than making a, you know another three hundred dollar royalty check off of my third edition, which is nine years old or something like that, right? So this is way more fun, and and it, because it's digital, you can upgrade it every day. There's none of this sort of publisher calling you and says, hey. We need to put out a new edition of your textbook. When can you have it done, right? Well, I'm done. I, I just keep updating, updating, updating. I look at it and I go, eh, that's version two, right? Publish it as version two. And it's just so easy and, and keeps you current reading. So instead of a big folder of, you know, article snippets or the equivalent digitally, right? I, I just add it to the book and then rename it, right? And it's, it's volume two, it's volume three. Version, excuse me, version two, version three, because it's software now, right? So, um, so I, I'll, I'll keep doing that, and I'm going to split the college stuff off in the pro. I, 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 I never, I promised myself I would never work on college books. No, I did. I, 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 it was a conscious thing not to work on college sports because I, you know it's only a couple of defining features, right? That makes it different and interesting, and most of it's the labor market, which we say, oh yeah, they will take cap uh, players. Know what, right? So, I, but I, I came to discover that the misunderstand. Well, sorry, uh, this is a growing area. The, the models that I create to try to figure out what's going on in college sports for me to get some analytical leverage over that I believe, okay, are not common. And it, it goes to show the difference in the two philosophies that people have about college sports. Whether college sports is a tail that wags the dog, you know, kind of model, or whether it's just another unit on campus. And the university administrators treated the same and invested it how they will, right? Um, I, I'm getting way more uh, interesting you know, results for me and what I think to be analytical leverage over the issues in college sports, thinking about it the second way, right? So I'm going to pull off the college stuff and make a, you know, you said this is a big giant chapter on college sports at the end, but it's, there's more to it. So I'll pull that up. Uh, I, I still have a few ideas, believe it or not, uh, to put to paper. Uh, I've got a few working papers hanging around that. Uh, one I think is revolutionary, and most are just you know, cleaning up loose ends. Uh, and I look, you know, the process of why, why baseball looks the way it does. Steve uh, presented uh, chapter three, right, roughly, of the way I'm thinking about this book, right? The, the, the idea of, I mean, it's a real simple notion. Why does baseball look the way it does? Because that's how baseball may, owners made it look. Why do they do that? Because they can. Because we've never stopped them. Because we've never really intervened in any meaningful way to change the course of the way that baseball looks, okay? Yeah, so I, I, I'm, if a book looks like this, I'm in here somewhere, right? But I'll, 
I'll finish that. And I'll keep sharing the wealth as best I can. Right? Uh, go out there, think if there's something I can use when Brian wants to dump some modeling thing on me over. If there is uh, you know, something I can use, well, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. But just not as much. Right? Yeah, just not as much. It's got other things to do. Uh, I have some farewell sport management observations. Um, this is the part where uh, I was kidded through the whole discussion about you know, I'm a fairly blunt guy. Um, it, it ends up, I think, uh, not being that. I, I'm on the spectrum. And so I, I, I'm being diagnosed as you know blunt because I, I don't have great receptors all the time. Right. And so uh, I, I hope you'll take this as it's intended. Okay? It's, it's never, a, a, never a criticism. It's just it's a, it's a nudging thing. Right? Uh, 2011, I was invited down to Florida to give the, the Stanley lecture. And I, my, my idea was, well, I'm an oldish, new sport management prof, which is what I was at the time I've been. You know, it, look, I became a sport man, professor of sport management by driving to Ann Arbor. Okay? That, that's how it happened. Right? I mean, I'm a sports economist. I'm an economist for 23 years in a real, real department of economics. You know, it, and then I take a cross-country drive with my wife, and I'm a professor of, of sport management. My, my, my colleagues, right, will, and especially my movement science colleagues, will laugh. But I actually had to ask Bev, who, who was the dean at the time, I said, I, how do I describe myself? Am I a professor of kinesiology? And she went, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which was okay. I mean, I, I was genuinely curious, right? And, and she said, professor of sport management is an appropriate time. So, but that's all. Literally, I'm, I'm the same guy I was. But I became professor of so at that time, I was an oldish, new sport management prop, right? And so I tried to give some insights into what I'd seen in four years. And it was about as successful as my original paper on how come, you know, how come sports are different. Well, now I'm a 15-year-old uh, uh, sport management prof. And for 15 years, I know. Can't be 15, but it is. Uh, and so rather than an oldish, new prof, I'm, I'm an old right, sports management prof. Um, my journey to sport management, remember, I, uh, I've been a new uh, oldish prof of sport management since 2007, uh, 15 years at the end of my appointment in, uh, in May. And where is SM going? Uh, which is what I you know, talked about years ago, but I, I'm going to change my mind a little bit about it. Uh, crystal ball case. The, the amazing rod. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think it's sort of useful to organize our discussion around how you know, categories live. I, I look out into the sport management world and I see strictly vocational programs. So there's a model of that. It's fine, right? It's, I'm just describing things, not passing through. There's the SM model, which I always think of as the traditional sport management program, which is usually focused heavily on sport and society. Okay. And then there's what we do, right? There's a mixed sport management model. Um, and, I, and I'll go through them quick for you. Uh, the strictly vocational model is characterized by light to no, P, no PhD research faculty. It's a heavy teaching involvement by a practicing professional, and there's no, no graduate training going on. And it appears to me that these turnout students that go primarily to low level management and sales in narrowly defined you know, local sports market areas. Right? What, perfect. It's, it's just a wonderful thing, right, to be done when you need the you know, best. University training talent. The SM model, right, the traditional model, I think, is characterized by PhD research, faculty with sport management degrees, typically. Um, there's limited involvement in teaching by non faculty, but they are there and they are an important presence. There's limited graduate training and almost always at the master's level. It appears to me the students go primarily to a step up. Right from the previous vocational exit, there are mid-level managers, and the really good ones can be you know whatever they want to be because that's what education does. It doesn't matter where you are; if you're fabulous and terrific, you will be identified one way or another, and you'll, you'll move on. But here it appears that students go uh, primarily to mid-level management and sales, but in more broadly defined areas. Right? Uh, the mixed sport management model is characterized by PhD research faculty with sport management degrees and degrees of parent disciplines. To me, that's the defining difference. Um, we have extremely limited visiting in the executive resident, uh, residence seminars. We cherish those people, and they're very important as a clientele. We won't let them get carried away right, in our program. 
Um, and there's extensive graduate training with masters and PhD programs. Uh, I have more knowledge of this approach, but I think it's the one we do. Students go primary to lower and mid-level management and sales, but at top firms and in very broadly defined areas. And many of them are legacies. They're when they get here, they're destined to go into high-level management because because that's their you know their family tradition. In my opinion, all three of these models will continue on because they all you know, serve a need. Top students, though, increasingly find the highest return from the next four management model, the one we do. I am convinced this is true. Uh, and here's why SM is becoming big sport, right? Business sponsorship. I, I, I joke with my students what are you going to be when you get done? Well, I'm going to do, I'm going to be an agent. I'm going to, I said, well, what if you went to work for United Airlines? Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, United Airlines handles some you know, of the largest sports media contracts in the world. United, McDonald's, take your pick, right? That's sport management, right? So sponsorship things, marketing, IMG, you know, giant firms, right? Management, AEG, you know, they, if you go look at what the people in these gigantic mega firms are doing, it's a broad, right, a very broad palette of things that they do. I think most students don't get until they actually go out in the job market and see it. Right? Um, increasingly, then I think cross discipline uh, abilities are going to be valuable in SM. And we've already got the leg up on them. We've already got the jump, don't we? We're already doing that. Yeah? Uh, ties with the parent discipline departments across the university are becoming more valuable, not less valuable to sport management programs. I think of urban planning and sports, I think of law and sports. We have the right people who teach sports law, but I don't think that's enough. I, I think we need top-notch sports law people in sport management. Uh, urban planning is a good example. Billion to $2 billion real estate development deals, including crossover between traditional business areas, planning, public finance and taxation, and benefit cost and portfolio analysis, project analysis. Yeah. That's a big bundle of skills, right? And many uh, programs don't teach any of them. I think that's where the action is. I guess that's a hot place to be, right? Uh, all about sports uh, and sport management. And so, gee, what a surprise. We have urban and regional development in our, right, in our no bail the week here at the initiative. Um, so we can handle these things, right? <coughs> so another example, dueling entertainment owners and state and local politics. I think of PSNE uh, versus Olympia Sports. When they were battling over the arena situation in Detroit, right? That's that's a, a fairly complex issue about large-scale venue right providers going after each other and advising them on either side, or if you're on the public side, worried about, yeah, well, they finally get all done with that, they're going to ask us for four hundred million dollars, right? I, I find that to be a, a really interesting and exciting sport management program. I don't have it here in the media because I it's just it's changing so fast. But media you know, uh, analysis of sports and the sport management, especially, is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. There's, uh, brand new ways of doing stuff are being invented. There's no, there's almost no law around. It. It's, it's going to have to all be tried and retried again, and the law is going to have to evolve. It'd be nice if our sport managers knew how that law was starting out. Say, you right? It's going to have to do with urban planning. If they, like Joel and I were talking, esports is you know, it's big, and they're they're thinking about an esports development in Philly, right? Well. They, that's this kind of thing. That versus what? That and how much is it worth? You know, exactly those kinds of things. So I think about that when I think about my, my recent activity in the NFL versus St. Louis, which resulted in an $850 million goodbye kiss from right, an NFL owner to St. Louis, right? When I thought it should have been 1.2 billion. But, but, but nonetheless, right? $850 million, uh, you're like getting close to talking real money. Right, and so uh, those kinds of things are happening in policy and politic environments. They're happening in strategy environments. They're happening in, in all kinds of environments that I do my best to try to expose my students to. But it needs to be an area, right, in, in, in sport management. I think. Uh, and now we got the fun brewing in Buffalo. I'm, I'm watching that one really close. Uh, in addition to anything mentioned under urban planning, you can have state and local politics, you can have law. You're going to have political strategy. You know, they, they, just take your pick. All of those things are going to be important. And sport management programs, I think, should be thinking about expanding to do that. 
with a mix like we've been doing with sport management professionals and right parent discipline professionals. Strategic partnerships uh, and increased coverage uh, under the SM mix model seems to me to be the way that the things about half of SM in the core disciplines, SM in urban planning, SM in the science, SM in the law, all of those things, right, should begin, I think, to evolve and become commonplace. If we're going to arm our students and find out why they should come to Michigan instead of the University of Central Florida, nothing wrong with the University of Central Florida. Please never take that, right? But they're doing a different mission. And the mission we want to accomplish is different than theirs. And if we want to get the best students to show up, we better get, be giving them what they need in order to do it. I won't do any good. Uh, it won't do any good to produce a, a separate and distinct SM brand name. Okay, I don't think that's counterproductive. Uh, it doesn't serve our clients. So at UM, our external client tell board tells us year after year what they want more literate, they want them impeccably well trained in the core, they want more analytical, uh, uh, more analytical ability in their thinking processes, and they want them ready for the breadth of issues they will face when they get out, which are completely unknown today and could change inside of two years. Okay, so they're, they're tall orders, but we get the idea about what they want. Uh, these demands require closer ties. Expanding the set of parent disciplines inside SM in the mixed model, and especially economics and finance, public finance, urban planning, policy, political strategy, law. I keep going right down that same path just to emphasize it because we're already doing a variety of interesting, right, sport business activities that we, you know, like urban planning. Yeah, we all thought that would be happening. Go back to the traditional SM model, there's no economists there. When Brian and Steve came out, I was peddling them to one of these programs. And the, the director of the program was nice enough to say, look, we, we're just not going to be doing it. We don't, we don't do that. We're not going to do that. Oh, uh, thanks, right? Hang up and, and move on because they're, I think they're antiquating themselves on purpose. Good plus starting place for faculty. Continue to plug away at the parent disciplines and parent interests. Inform the at-large community. Okay, I'm hearing a lot of shoot the, yeah. oh, sorry. So shoot for the top parent discipline, general interest, Field journals. I mean, the usual approach you should be making. Uh, the higher, the better. Uh, lately, I hear that if it doesn't say sport in it, then sport management people shouldn't be publishing there. I, I, I refuse to believe that. I just, I just refuse to believe that. That people working in sport, say you're working in management, that you can't discover something completely interesting about a management problem that's interesting to the management profession at large because you're working in sport. And if you don't do that, I think it's a tragic loss. It is, it's a tragic loss. You should almost be penalized for that because you're wasting social value. This seems to be bad advice to me, given everything I've just said. I've seen this tension between sport management and the JSE. Why, why should somebody studying management publish in JSE? Why should somebody in JSE ever publish in JSM? If we're sport econ, and publish in JSM. It's all counterproductive to me. If, if, if there's room, you know, allow us to inform each other. Otherwise, we stay in our silos, right? And, and we're not as cross-fertile, I think, as we could otherwise be. There's not, you know, not everything is, is, is cross-fertility, by the way. There are things that economists do. There are things that management people do. And economists and, and management people will not necessarily see eye to eye on those different things. There's a lot of things we do where we can inform each other. I, I think again of Brad and Jane working on you know, behavioral economics things, right? So that, I mean, well, I, that's how it was before Thaler wins the Sparages Prize, right? So, well, where's the empirical tell? How is that? You nudge, nudge, nudge. I, I, it, no, of course you want to go explore all of those ways that people are thinking, especially when they cross pollinate between psychology and economics. I think so, right? Yeah, of course you do. So, I, I the, the being driven into silos. So that you can publish, uh, you know, your aliquot share to get, you know, tenure or whatever, uh, and talk to, you know, nine other people in your area. Yeah, I know we need to do that, but let's let's look larger. Uh, seems to me to earn another title, the 1948 Edsel model. <laughs> yeah, I mean, excuse me. Beautiful sleep. There was nothing wrong with this automobile if you've ever seen one or been in one. They're, they're gorgeous. They're fabulous. They had all the chrome of the era. They had it, they had things in this car that they weren't commonplace and standard in cars for 15 years. Right? One problem was nobody wanted one. <laughs> right? Nobody wanted one. And, and so no buyers. It's 
it, it's one of the, you know, it goes down in history as a, as a, as a gigantic dip. And I hope that, you know, ignoring my advice doesn't actually lead people that way. But I worry about that. I, I worry. The last thing, uh, SM exists in a, a potentially diverse atmosphere, externally and internally. It, it must carve its brand or flounder, but I don't think the brand is SM. I, I think the brand is probably sports business or something like that. And we should never be afraid to just say, uh, we do sports business. Roscoe goes, wait a minute, we do it. Yeah, but you don't do sports business. You told us you don't want to do sports business. So take on that battle and, you know, and earn, earn your title. Um, it, we don't want to get reduced. It, it, this isn't a, a, a slam on my lab coat colleagues, please, right? This is just a thing that goes on right in joint programs. And many of you, especially the younger people that I'm aiming this at, are in programs that have this tension, okay? Um, you don't want to be reduced to funding battles with our lab coat colleagues, right? You can't win it. You can't win that battle. I watched it for 15 years. Before that, in an econ program, I watched it econ versus finance. I, you, there are some battles you can't win because of the implicit value that administrators put on the different things that different faculty do. And you can't do a thing about that, okay? Yeah, can't do a thing about it. So uh, I, I looked up members of the academy, for example. There's, there are some sport and society giants in there. Right, people like Wiggins and Mary Jo Kane and Jay Copley, my dear friend and wonderful thinker Scott Kretschmeyer. Right, we know these names, and we know that they're sport and society. What I would refer to as right SM model types. Right, um, the only sport management person I saw for years after I got here was Chella, and I never can pronounce his last name, but everybody knows who Chella is. Okay, only one in the American Academy. Okay. We should be telling you something, okay? We should be telling you something. Yeah. Don't compete, right? Where you, you can't compete, compete where you can. Grant funding generates discretionary funds for administrators. In some cases, you know, buyouts and faculty lines and teaching generates program money, but not discretionary funds for administrators, not the same way. That's the crux. That's the crux of the issue that, I, that I'm gonna leave you with, right? You wanna keep fighting that battle, then you're going to have to uh, convince your administrators how come a dollar you generate is the same thing as, um, uh, as, as overhead that comes from a grant. You're going to have to convince them of that because they already don't believe it. Okay. Yeah. SM won't be viewed intrinsically as, uh, as valuable as, uh, as grant generators because it's, it, it's a dollar and a dollar. I know they're all spendable, but they have different connotations and different meanings for administration. And that's where the thing is. That's where the thing is. So we'll get to ask through large classes if we're going to make our discretionary spending distribution. And that gives us the clue, doesn't it? What do we do that's unique for sport management programs? We generate external funds, right? Generate benevolence. And we teach like crazy. And that's what we can do to compete. That's, that's I'm firmly convinced. That's what we can do. And another last thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sport management programs face a, a curiously schizophrenic market. I, I think vocational undergrads and masters, research PhDs and faculty, remaining strong with undergrads and external clientele is simply essential, right? To obtain that non-grant path to funding. Whether you're lucky enough to run into some contracts that are worth doing and large enough to, to take up your time, or whether you run into people who are thinking, well, why should I endow a sport management professorship? Okay, I've never been asked that question, but, but it might happen sometime, okay? Um, uh, and then, and, and, you know, the thing that we really do, which is you know, teach, okay. Takes me right back to clientele satisfaction. So really the last thing, sports, sports really isn't a discipline. I want to remind me, this is Steph and I have, have pinched this together over in the last, like, oh, like, like six weeks or so, right? Sport is not a discipline, it's an application, okay? The, the last thing I think I know, right? Sorry, wait, my clicker is backwards. Uh, sports is not a discipline, uh, it's an application. So to me, sport management means business disciplines that study sports, okay? That's what we do, that's who we are. Look around, that, that's who's in the room of the sport management folks, right? The, I think of the public policy school analogy, analogy, analogy and how that came to be, right? It's a bunch of disciplines studying public policy. 
they're moving knowledge forward because they all have this common thing that fascinates them. And they're having a great intellectual time doing it, okay? Which is ultimately the thing that's gonna make or break sport management is that we really enjoy what we're doing and we enjoy what we're doing with our colleagues, okay? And I think if you don't strive in that direction, then the next you know, rock board that stands up, we'll talk about yet another model and then they'll talk about the SM mixed model, the same way that we're talking about the SM classic model, right? It'll just be a thing that some pretty good programs still do, but they're, you know, they're not on the forefront. I have literal farewells, right? As that step brought this out, it's not, farewell, as I recall, is a European thing, fair to be well, and it's not a goodbye. It's a, it's a literal well-meaning as we part, right? And yeah, we expect to run into each other again. And, and I, I think we'll do this well, right? But some of it we won't run into again, okay? And so I wanna, you know, just in passing, remember Jim Quirk and a, a person who was, was really hard for me to get to know. But once you did, he was a wonderful person to be around with, Stefan Cassette. Uh, who was at, uh, at Newman in Belgium. And another guy who, I always thought there was an animosity right, between Fort and Quirk and Berlin, right? Because I didn't know John at all. We never talked. You know, he published in a different journal and, and, and did some other, you know, some things on soccer. Um, but John Berlin ended up to be a, a kind and warm and wonderful man. Uh, he was, uh, he did do, right, what, what Steve pointed out, whenever you talk to him, right? If you had a question, he just told you the arithmetic and the math answer. Right. But he was a nice guy, nice to be around and a good guy. We had you know, wonderful conversations over fabulous fish meals and you know, uh, and, and I, I will miss Joe. And he's, he, he died way too early, as did Stefan. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I, I do feel like I've come far, right? And, and I hope, especially for the younger folks in the audience, I hope, I hope that you know, when you stand up here in my place, you can reminisce about everything that happened in you know, sports econ and whatever it turns into, right? Um, when it's your turn, right? I've had a fabulous, uh, a fabulous voyage. It's not over. It's just on smoother water now. <laughs> uh, see you out there, because that's what I'm going to be doing. Thanks. He didn't use up all his time, so I think we should take a few questions. If anybody's <laughs> Come on. It's, uh, no, it's a chance to answer a question or two. The things you always wondered about. Uh, yes, I did actually write to, to Professor Coase <laughs> and got a reply about what was the provenance of the Coase theorem versus Rottenberg's invariance principle. And he was a little terse, but he's old. I remember this is like he was over 80 when I, when I talked to him. So yeah, I, I did verify right the, the things that are uh, coming out. Well, they're, they're coming out. I think mostly in the, the JSE thing. Uh, yeah, he he was cordial but terse, right? And it ends up that their paths never crossed. I, I didn't realize this. I knew they were both in Chicago, and I had this ideas in the air thing, like maybe they didn't even really talk to me, but but, but it was such a a vibrant thing to be talking about in terms of property rights and how they work in those days, right? And maybe there was just some crossover. Apparently, absolutely. See? I loved your uh, talk and I'll ask you to send me the PowerPoint just on your thoughts about the whole sports discipline. Yeah. Um, as a consumer of all this, as a lawyer, um, I was talking about several other people. One of the disciplines that was not on your slide and I struggle with is strategy. And I wonder if you would just muse a bit about it. I know it's covered in some sports management classes and stuff, but uh, the, the use of strategic thinking uh, in sports and often the lack of strategic thinking in sports and where uh, uh, people in this room and people in sports management can contribute to improving strategic thinking in the sports business. Yeah, I, I think this is on the economics and finance bunch. I, I think that management people who study strategy, which is all, you know, 
I'm always stepping out of school because it's not my area, right? But uh, you know, management and marketing people are talking about marketing strategy, right? Management strategy. And economists, it's just game theory. And it's all written together that way. So I actually teach strategy in my sports econ course. And I tell the kids, right, okay, here, here you go, right? Here's you study this kind of strategy in, in your other right discipline classes. And, and here's the way economists think about strategy. And the you know, the, the sort of first one being um the uh you know like uh, uh bidding wars right very simple very straightforward non-cooperative thing right and we can do more i teach them about uh strategy in the most basic sense that everybody first learns strategy say in a philosophy class write down your decision tree and then go to the end and work your way back and tell me what's the best thing for you to do today this is the essence right of some strategic interaction, because if you, you know, do a non-cooperative game, then you've, you know, you've got the other person acting and you take your act, you think you're going this way, but you go this way and you gotta rethink it, right? So that kind of, uh, of strategic uh, thinking, I think is, uh, is really important. Uh, and, and finally, um, you know, I, I, Nash won the award for making us think strategically about exactly the kinds of things that happen in sports. So even taking his notions of, of equilibrium forward in the simplest sense, I, I think really um, increases a student's ability to recognize, to recognize, oh, this is a strategic problem. I really should stop and think about what everybody else is going to do here. Not, okay, I've got to decide how much to spend on uh, this kind of advertising, 25%. Uh, right? No, no, no. Stop and think, well, if I spend some amount, what will the rest of the players do? And does that feed back to me in a way that says, oh, I, maybe I don't want to do that after all, the, the usual Nash way of thinking. Right? I, I think that's where the strategy stick is. And then it, it plays over easily into, I mean, usually, right, uh, when we think about economic models over time, it's an intertemporal decision problem. But that's just another decision right? with, with discount rates on it, right? And that becomes strategic. So I, I think that's the way that it's going to happen. I, I, I can't speak for, for the other disciplines in sport management. Right? I, I'm sure they teach, you know, strategic elements of, uh, of marketing and, and management choices, right? But it's not the same thing as uh, taking, you know, the, the applications of game theory. Not all of them, right? I don't want to teach them about Brower's fixed point theorem. I mean, that, nobody cares about that except game theory, right? Uh, theorists, right? We want to know how we can think our way through problems in a more disciplined and complex way. And I, I think that's where the, where the value of this strategy is. I'd like to know what you think about um, the future of the NCAA. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can do it with the NCAA, like me, right? You, you have this fundamental and abiding belief that no matter what happens, when I turn around tomorrow, the NCAA will be doing what it's always been doing. Okay. So, so I start from, from that kind of biased position, right? I know there are others, right, who are watching the NCAA. Like, this is the end. They're done. NILs were the, the end of the NCAA. Look, they can't even uh, police their own requirement that these seemingly illegal, right, uh, booster groups form an LLC and hide behind it and then just put together all the NIL contracts they can and wave at everybody at recruiting time and go, you know, look at my giant pot. You can have a big piece of this. Just you know, come to University X. Um, I I think they're cagey like a fox because they have been always. I believe that they've run out their string on the amateur thing. Of course, they'll believe it anyway. Of course, in fact, you know, uh, uh, nine zero. Yeah, I, they've simply recognized that. Oh well, amateurism is just a concept, and it's whatever the NCAA says it is at the point in time. That's it. You know, amateurism is, is not a thing the courts are going to buy anymore. But the, the, the issues that I think are going to help the NCAA, right, are I think Congress really likes to control things. And if they can control college sports, they'll probably put the NCAA in charge of doing it. And then they'll just monitor the NCAA. And even if they don't, even if they create a separate regulatory agency for sports, like some, some of you know, my colleagues are in our favor, are fond of, it'll be populated by the same people who run it now because they're the ones who know what's going on, right? They're not going to come to 
me and Steve and you know and, and Steve Salaga and Joel and say, why, why don't you guys come and run college sports for us? Because you know a lot about college sports. No, it's, it's going to be the same group. They'll probably just on mass move the Drake group up. Or, or, or what's the other one? Oh, the Night League Commission on Intercollegiate. They just move them up and put them in charge, right? But they rely extensively and only on you know, the existing NCAA hierarchy. Right? So, so I, I see that part of it. And uh, I also think more deeply about the antitrust situation we find ourselves in. I'm not much of an antitrust philosopher, but I do recognize that. The original idea of antitrust is monopoly and, uh, and, and monopsony are bad. And you shouldn't be able to do that. And then, it, you know, I, I think out of some Chicago arguments, and it'll work out, right? Like them for everything. It, it, it came this thing about, you know, the consumer welfare criteria. And so now what do we got? Now we've got, as long as it's not uh, um, a per se violation, and we get into rule of reason land, where we have to have a reasonable discussion about this market power, right? That all it takes for the NCAA to win almost always, and this is still the case, I believe, even if, as we come out of Halston, I, I think they, as long as somebody can find a consumer surplus offset, that it's gonna be impossible to beat the NCAA. Because the NCAA will always be able to say, well, yeah, but if you change the model, this was their original, right? They failed on the amateur thing, but they'll win on some, on other things that they invented. Right? They'll, if you change the amateur model, that's what sports fans like. And if it's not amateur anymore, then you destroy all that consumer surplus, right? And I think courts buy this and under the, the current way that I see antitrust. And I, I, Steve would be the one to ask, but I'm just watching this debate as I'm able about what antitrust was, what it's become, and what does that mean for running college sports, right? And, and I think the NCAA will just reform, re, uh, regroup, and figure out the best way to keep doing what they've always been doing. And um, I, I wouldn't put it past them to actually get an antitrust uh, exemption, which would be the, the end of being able to run their college sports. Yeah. That would be absolute end. But that's it. If they get their antitrust exemption, just find another thing to antitrust. This is not even fun to do. So that's that's what I think about college sports. Ex well, except athletes are making some money now. Yeah. But I'm watching real close for this. It, it won't be just the NCAA. It will be the undoing of these, what we most of us think of as sort of illegal co-ops to centralize NIL contracts and then go, you know, 27 million, I'll give you four, you know, that kind of thing when recruits are going. But I, I think it will be state law. The, the Cal, as I understand the California state law says that's illegal. That, that's my understanding of the statute, is that you can't do that. You can, and, and you certainly can't, right, uh, at like Adidas has done, go individual on an athlete, even at an Adidas school, right, let alone a Nike school. You can't go individual on an athlete in a, in a sponsorship agreement because it's against the law. It's specifically in the California law. You can't make a contract that conflicts with any existing contract with the athletic department, which means another shoe brand or the same shoe brand, right? You're, if you, it's the same shoe brand, then you're siphoning off value of the, you know, of the athletic department's contract. And if it's another one, you're in direct conflict with that contract, you know, the exclusivity rights of that contract. And I think California, and I, I, got, I got lost after a while. I, I followed the laws as they evolved for like four states, and then it's just overwhelming. But I do know in the California case, right? It's just illegal. So it won't just be the NCAA that has to figure out how to curtail the NILs. States are going to be on it too. The fun part, you know, for those of you who are political thinkers, public choice thinkers, um, will be the interstate competition that starts to go on there, right? So if my state law means I didn't get, you know, a five-star recruiting class, they're going to change that state law. We already saw Alabama do it, right? Alabama had a law in place that seemed to be interfering with their ability to generate five-star you know, recruiting classes. <laughs> no, 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 we will not have that. California, I don't know. Other states, I don't know, right? But there is this, always this competition, right, between states for, you know, for, for things that generate tax revenue and political support. So. All right. I think everybody's ready for drinks. So. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so where are you?
the, the reception actually starts at six and we have to walk to the Michigan Union to get there, which is like five minutes walk away. I'm not sure how this works. It, it's probably set up. So I suggest we wander over. Well, it's, yeah, without rushing too much. So don't dive straight for it. And anyway, all the business around the town, you need to follow somebody who knows where they're going. So, you know, or else you're completely lost. Yeah. Which Joel and I already did this morning. So stay close. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's 